Tanto Audio, a division of recorded books, presents The Perfect Rake by Anne Gracie, narrated by Heather Wilds. Chapter One It is not in the stars to hold our destiny, but in ourselves. William Shakespeare Prue, Prue, come quickly. He is beating Grace in the attic. Seventeen-year-old Hope burst furiously into the room. Her twin, Faith, followed, her eyes huge with distress. Prudence Meridue leaped up from the household accounts, her dropped pen scattering blobs of ink unheeded across the page. She dashed from the room, her sisters at her heels. What set him off this time? Prudence flung over her shoulder. I don't know. Charity said he found her in the attic, making a gift for your birthday. Hope panted. Charity tried to stop him, Faith interjected, but he hit her. Her twin added, I wanted to go up and try too, but I could not get this undone in time. She gestured to her left wrist. It still bore rope marks. Besides, he's locked the door. Charity said to fetch you and the keys. Yes, I have them. James, James! Prudence called for their stalwart young footman. She raced upstairs, taking the steps two at a time, knowing he would follow. By the second flight he caught up with the two girls. Lord Derham is beating Grace in the attic. Hurry! Prudence urged. They reached the third landing and turned to the narrow flight that led to the servants' quarters and, beyond that, the attic. Nineteen-year-old Charity sat on the stairs, sobbing, one hand cupped against her cheek. Oh, Prue, I tried. Prudence gently lifted her sister's hand. Two livid red wheels marred the purity of Charity's pale complexion. Prudence bit her lip. Charity was the gentlest creature. It was very brave of you to try, love. She glanced at Faith, the timid sister. She was shaking like a leaf, but she'd still come prepared to brave Grandpapa in a rage. Faith, take Charity to my bedchamber. Get salve and liniment from Mrs. Burton. Charity, off you go and get that cheek seen to, and make things ready for Grace. The two girls crept back down the stairs. Prudence called after them. As soon as Grace and Hope arrive, lock the door. Don't open it to anyone except me. Prudence resumed the race up the stairs. As they reached the last landing, she paused. We shall enter silently. Then I will rush at him. At the same time, James will snatch Miss Grace and take her to safety. You can count on me, Miss Prue. The tall young footman responded grimly. Prue nodded. I know. I do not know what will come of this day's work, but I'll see you right, James. I promise. But Prue, he's mad with rage, Hope exclaimed. He'll beat you too. I miss Prue. Better I tackle him. James had a militant light in his eye. I'm bigger than you. No. He'd have you transported or hanged. If he hits me, I'll hit him back, Prue fiercely responded. I've had enough of his vile rages and his bullying ways. I am almost one and twenty, and when I come of age... She broke off. They had reached the attic door. She lowered her voice to a whisper. Hope. You must go with Grace to Faith's room and stay there. No, I want to help. I hate him, Prue. I know, love, but you can help me more by taking Grace to safety and comforting her. Hope opened her mouth to argue, but Prudence held up her hand for silence. She inserted the key, turned it, and opened the narrow cupboard-like door to the attic. There was no need for stealth. Her grandfather was roaring, beyond any distraction of creaking hinges and the like. He was bent over a small huddled shape. You filthy little heathen! Thwack! Rank obscenity! Thwack! Idolatrous blasphemy! Thwack! With each epithet, his sinewy old arm brought down his riding crop with as much force as he could muster. The crop whistled with each downward slice. Ten-year-old Grace was coiled into a tight ball on the floor. Her hands clasped protectively over her head, making herself as small as possible. Prudence shot across the room like a small, furious cannonball. Leave my sister alone, you great filthy bully! She hurled herself against him, shoving with all her might, for she was not a large person. 
Her grandfather might be well past sixty, but he was six feet tall, his body strong and lean from hunting, shooting, and fishing, and from beating little girls. He staggered, caught off balance. Prudence took advantage of his momentary unsteadiness and pushed him again, hard. He tripped over a trunk, from which old clothes spilled. Grace and the twins dress up clothes, and lay for a moment gasping, sprawled among faded brocade and moth-eaten lace. Obedient to his orders, James scooped Grace up and strode from the room. Hope hesitated. Go! Prudence hissed at her. Quickly! She went. In a surge of old gowns, her grandfather staggered to his feet. His face was purple with rage. Veins stood out at his neck and temple. Spittle foamed at his mouth. Brazen-faced little bitch! I'll teach you! Grasping his riding crop, he strode toward Prudence. She flung him a contemptuous look. How dare you use that disgusting weapon on a child! She spat. That little hellcat was engaged in filthy, idolatrous evil! And I'll scourge her of it, if it's the last thing I do! Filthy, idolatrous evil? Prudence glanced at the three-legged table, where Grace had been working in secret. On it lay a pasteboard reticule, and several of the old magazines passed on in secret to the girls by their neighbour, Mrs. Otterbury. At the time they had all exclaimed over the Egyptian designs in one of the magazines. Strange and fanciful creatures, like the Sphinx and others, half animal and half human. A shard of guilt pierced Prudence as she recalled how she'd admired the Egyptian designs. Grace had used them to decorate the pasteboard reticule, these idolatrous and evil pictures. Her little sister had been beaten for making Prudence a gift for her birthday. It is not filthy idolatry. It is merely a whimsy of fashion. Grace is just a child. Those designs are simply attractive curiosities to her. They are blasphemous, and that, that thing she created bears the taint of the devil. It must be burned and she must be cleansed. I'll thrash the evil out of her if it's the last thing I do." He knocked the magazines and reticule to the floor. Prudence darted in and snatched the battered reticule to her breast. There is not a shred of evil in Grace. She is a dear sweet child and she bears the stamp of Jezebel, as do you. Prudence dashed her fiery curls from her eyes. It is not the stamp of Jezebel. It is simply hair, Grandpapa. Grace and I cannot help its colour. Our mother had red hair. The old man let out a growl of rage and sliced at Prudence with his whip. I forbade you to mention that harlot under my roof. She was a shameless Jezebel who enticed my son away from me, and you and that other she-cub bear her mark. I may not have beaten the evil out of you yet, but I'll make sure. Prudence interrupted. If you so much as lay a finger on Grace, or Hope, or any of my sisters ever again, I'll... I'll kill you. Hope cannot help being left-handed, and Grace's and my hair is just an excuse. You are nothing but a despicable bully, and I'll have no more of it. Do you hear? Insolent baggage, roared the old man. I am your legal guardian, and I'll have respect and obedience from you, the way your sisters respect me. If I have to thrash you within an inch of your life, ha! Prudence's voice was filled with scorn. Respect does not come from beatings, Grandpapa. It must be earned. You see my sister's meek obedience as respect, but you command only fear and hatred in them. In me, you command nothing. He lunged and caught her a vicious blow across the face. Prudence reeled back, clutching her cheek. Blood stained her fingers. He eyed the blood with satisfaction. We'll see if you sing the same tune when I've finished with you. A disobedient bitch always cowers after a good thrashing. I'm not a setter or a beagle, Grandpapa. You can't make me cower the way you did when I was a child. And I'll tell you to your face, the thrashings have come to an end. In eight weeks' time, I shall turn one and twenty, and then I shall have the legal guardianship of my sisters. You cannot prevent it. Papa's will made it so. He leaned briefly against a broken table, huffing and puffing from his recent exertion. The purple colour faded slowly from his face. Oh, can I not? he said. 
You may have the legal guardianship, girlie, but I still control the purse strings until you marry. He chuckled, a dry, rasping wheeze. You'll none of you get a penny unless you wed, and I'll ensure you will not wed. His thin lips curled in a sneer. You may cherish your sisters to your heart's content, Missy, but you'll starve without a penny to your name. Maybe I don't have a penny at the moment, but I have resources you know nothing about. Once I am of age, we will leave this place, and you will not be able to stop us. Prudence felt a small surge of satisfaction. He'd taken most of her mother's jewellery years ago, when they'd first come to Durham Court. But the eleven-year-old newly orphaned Prudence had been too sentimental to hand her mamma's favourite pieces over to the grim old man who demanded them. She'd held a few precious pieces back, and kept them hidden all these years. The jewels would be the saving of them now. Harlot! Sell your body, would you? It does not surprise me. But you will not escape to shame this family so! He came storming forward in a fresh surge of rage. Prudence ran for the door and hurried down the steep, narrow stairs as fast as she could. Behind her came Grandpapa, crashing and cursing her, swiping at her with every step. The whip lashed her more than once, and as she reached the narrow landing, she tripped on her skirt and fell to her knees. He came roaring down the last steps in triumph, but in his haste he stumbled, lurching forward in an avalanche of curses, his whip flailing. Prudence ducked aside as, carried forward by the momentum of his rush, her grandfather careered down the steps past her, tripping and rolling and crashing. His fall was broken eventually by the curve of the rails where the stairs turned. The house was suddenly, shockingly silent. Prudence hurried upstairs to her bedchamber. It's me, Hope. Open the door. The door creaked open. Hope peered out. Prudence, your face. Did he do that? Prudence touched a tentative finger to her face. In all the drama, she'd forgotten the cut on her cheek. Don't worry. It probably looks worse than it is. How is Grace? Hope gestured to the bed, where Charity and Faith were sitting, their arms around Grace, who was huddled in a hard little knot, hugging her knees, her face quite hidden. The arms wrapped around her knees were covered in ugly red welts. Sob shook her thin body. Prudence slipped onto the bed and put an arm around the tense, hunched body. Graciella? It was their mother's pet name for her. Grace looked up, and her pale, tear-streaked face crumpled anew as she saw her older sister's injured face and worried eyes. She hurled herself into Prudence's arms. Oh, Prue! Prue! He hurt you too! I'm sorry! I'm sorry! Prudence felt a surge of anger at the man who had saturated a young girl's life with such guilt that Grace would blame herself for Prudence's injury. She forced herself to speak lightly. Don't be sorry, love. It doesn't hurt a bit. I promise you. Grandpapa got the worst of it. He's in no state to hurt any of us now. That caused them all to sit up. What do you mean? asked Faith. He tripped and fell down the stairs. She shivered. Her mind still held the sound of flesh and bone crashing down the stairs, against the wall, and that sudden silence. Hope was the first to speak. Is he dead? No, though I thought, we all thought for a moment that he was. He lay there, not moving for the longest time. Everyone just stared, for all the servants had come running. She took a deep, shaky breath. But he was not, of course. You know what a hard head Grandpapa has. Pity, Hope muttered. He's been carried to his bedchamber, and Dr. Gibson is with him now. He won't touch any of us again, I promise. There was a long silence in the room. None of her sisters believed Prudence could keep such a promise. They knew empty comfort when they heard it. Grace's face crumpled afresh, and she turned back to her big sister's arms. Oh, Prue! Why does he hate me so? She sobbed. Prudence hugged her little sister to her. Oh, darling, he confuses you and me with our mother, because we have the same red hair that she did. Was Mamma so very bad then? No. 
She wasn't bad at all. It's just that when Papa fell in love with her, he left the court and never came back. So Grandpapa never forgave her. Tell us about Mama and Papa again, Prue, Grace said, leaning into her. Their parents had died when Grace was just a baby. The twins, too, had been very small. Charity had been nine when Mama had died. Prudence, eleven. The young ones had few memories of their parents, and it comforted them to hear the tales over and over. Mama was very beautiful. You all take after her. Charity is her image, except for the golden hair, and you twins and Grace look so much like her too. You all take after Mama's side of the family. The beautiful Ainsleys, she pulled a wry face. I was the poor unfortunate to be saddled with the horrid Miraju nose and the horrid Miraju eyes. I just wish I had the Miraju height and thinness too. Your nose isn't horrid, exactly. It's just a little long, Faith said. It's a very nice nose, Grace defended her hotly. And your eyes are lovely, and grey, and kind, and... Oh, hush, Prudence said, laughing a little. She gathered her sisters around her on the bed. I don't care about my silly old nose. We were speaking of Mama anyway. Her voice adopted the sing-song quality of a beloved tale, oft repeated. Mama was a great beauty, though her family was in trade, and Papa took one look at her and fell instantly in love. And although she had hundreds of admirers, and he was by no means the handsomest, nor the richest, nor the one with the grandest title, Mama fell instantly in love with him too. All five girls sighed blissfully. But both the Ainsleys and the Merridews opposed the match, prompted Grace. And that is why Mama and Papa ran away to Italy and got married and had us. Keep going, Prue. Tell us about Mama's hair. Prue wriggled back against the pillows. Her sisters drew closer. Grace snuggled like a kitten at her side. Mama was golden, all golden, she said. Her hair was red, but it was like it had just come out of a smithy's furnace, all red and gold and full of life, like yours, Grace. And Papa loved Mama's hair. I want you to remember that, Grace whenever you think your hair is bad or ugly. Papa was always playing with Mama's hair, stroking it, loving the way it would curl around his fingers. He used to joke that Mama wound him round her little finger, just the same way. And one day, you will find a man who loves you and your hair, the same way Papa loved Mama. Grace sighed. The way Philip loves you. Prudence smiled and smoothed back her little sister's curls. Maybe, she continued. It wasn't only Mama's looks that were golden. She had the most wonderful soft voice, like honey, like Faith's voice. She would sing to us all for hours, and when she laughed, it was like the music of sunlight. I remember her laugh, said Charity suddenly. So happy, it made me want to laugh with her. You did too, agreed Prudence. We all did. Mama and Papa adored each other. They were always touching each other, holding hands, kissing, hugging, laughing. All the sisters sighed. It was a far cry from the cold and loveless regime they'd grown up under. And they loved us all, too, so very much. Papa was always picking us up for a cuddle and a kiss, and he never cared about sticky fingers or grubby faces. Mama always carried the baby. That was you, Grace, with us when we went walking along the beach or through the village. Even though Conchetta, she was your nursemaid, said it was bad for a baby to be outside. Mama said she wanted all her little sunbeams with her. She looked at her sisters squeezed together on the big old bed. They didn't look much like sunbeams in the chill grey light. Their faces pinched and pale, and their beautiful eyes still red-rimmed from weeping. Love was their birthright. Mama had promised. Prudence had to make them believe it. She just had to. Never, ever forget that we do not belong in Grandpapa's grim and loveless world, she said. We were all born in Italy, 
in a house filled with sunshine and laughter and love and happiness. And I promise you, no matter how bad it seems, one day we shall all live like that again, with sunshine and laughter and love and happiness. I promise. Outside the bitter wind whistled around the eaves, as if mocking her words. Prudence ignored it. She had a plan. Dr. Gibson placed his bag on the side table and sat down. Lord Derham has a severe concussion, and his ankle is broken in several places. Prudence poured him a cup of tea. But he will recover. She might despise her grandfather, but she didn't want to be the cause of his death. Dr. Gibson sipped the hot tea cautiously, then said, His injuries are quite severe, but I believe his faculties to be intact. I feel certain he will recover, though it may not be speedy. How long will it take? Prudence leaned forward and passed him a plate of buttered scones. She had a particular reason for asking. It was wild, it was audacious, it was risky, but it might work. It was the only solution she could think of to their problems. The doctor munched on a ginger nut. The head injury will take a few days, possibly a week. You will need to lie in a darkened room in absolute silence. He sipped at his tea and added. The ankle will take longer to heal, however. It is broken in several places. He will have to keep his leg immobilized for six or seven weeks at the very least. Six or seven weeks? Prudence hugged the knowledge to her breast. Six weeks or more would make all the difference in the world to her plan. But she would need the doctor's help. She set her cup aside, took a deep breath and said, Dr. Gibson, do you know how Grandpapa's accident came about? He sniffed and reached for another ginger nut. The groom who fetched me told me some wild tale, but you know how servants are apt to exaggerate. I doubt he exaggerated. Have you not heard how severe my grandfather's rage is? The doctor waved his hand. Bah! I hope I know better than to listen to village gossip. The tales are true, Prue said vehemently. And we cannot go on like this. Can you not see for yourself how very extreme Grandpapa has become? He has never been one to spare the rod, I grant you, but a man must be strict. Strict? It is more than that, I promise you. Poor Hope has spent most of her life with her left hand tied behind her back to prevent her using it. He says it is the devil's hand. Faith lives in fear of inadvertently humming under her breath, for that would merit a beating. And you should see how he regards my little sister Grace. He is convinced she bears the stamp of Jezebel, all because of the colour of her hair. The doctor's gaze strayed to Prudence's own fiery locks and she nodded. Yes, me too. He has tried to thrash the evil out of me since I was eleven. Prudence's voice shook with distress and anger. And I will not have it. Do you understand? He shall not thrash my little sister the way he thrashed me. The doctor shifted uneasily in his chair. Hope's left-handedness needs to be corrected, though I can see it distresses you. But Faith and Grace are such quiet, good little souls. Grace made this. She thrust the Egyptian-style reticule toward him. Bemused, the doctor took the decorated reticule. This Egyptian stuff was all the rage in London some years ago. I know, for my wife was mad for it too. Is your wife a filthy heathen? Asked Prudence bluntly. Given to idolatry, blasphemy, filth, rank obscenity. The doctor looked taken aback. What the? Because that's what Grandpapa called Grace for making this. A filthy little heathen. And he beat her unmercifully with his whip until I stopped him. That's how the accident happened. He was chasing me down the stairs with his whip. Luckily for me, he tripped. The doctor put the reticule down, his composure shaken. He beat her for making this. Severely. He seizes on any excuse. I want you to help us leave here. The doctor sighed heavily. Prudence, you know I cannot. He's not an easy man, I grant you, but 
I'm his doctor girl. Do you expect me to look him in the eye and lie to him? Deceive him? Little Grace's body is covered with red welts, simply because she made that reticule, Prudence said with quiet emphasis. She was determined to stir his conscience to action and force him to face the truth now. Grace had always been his favourite. It is not the first time Grace has been severely beaten for no good reason. He beats all of us. We have never been allowed to call you when he has injured one of us before. But I want you to come up to her bedchamber and see for yourself. With a heavy sigh, he put down his cup. Very well, I'll take a look. But I make you no promises. The doctor examined Grace in grim silence. He noted the wheels on Charity's face and those on Prudence's. Afterward, in the room downstairs, he sat heavily in his chair, clearly shaken. I'm sorry. I had no idea. And you say this is not the first time? Prudence nodded. There was no point in dwelling on the past. She had her eyes firmly fixed on the future. When I turn one and twenty in eight weeks' time, by my father's will I shall become my sister's legal guardian. Well then. However, we can only gain access to the money our mother left us when we marry. We have no money. Only enough for a few months. After that, unless Grandpapa gives us our inheritance, we will starve. She fixed the doctor with a look. He will not give us the money. He says he will never let any of us marry. On that point, he is adamant. We go nowhere, not even to church any more. We see no one, and no one sees us. How can any of us marry? Yet you know how beautiful my sisters are. What a crime it is to shut them away from society. Prudence scanned his face, trying to gauge whether his conscience was well and truly stirred. She took his hand and said, Dr. Gibson, we must escape. We have been given this small piece of time while he is confined to his bedchamber as if it is meant to be. But if Grandpapa is not to discover it immediately, you have to help us. The doctor sighed heavily. What do you want me to do? It was capitulation. Prue frowned over the words she had penned with a critical eye. The crabbed copperplate script looked just right, perhaps a shade less flamboyance in the loops, and a more precise dotting of the eye. Grandpapa always dotted each eye very precisely. Has the doctor gone? What did he say? Prudence's sisters entered the room. Charity peered over her shoulder. Who are you writing to? Philip again? No, not Phil. Oh, who cares about Philip? interrupted Hope. You're always writing to him. What did Dr. Gibson say about Grandpapa? The letter is not to Philip. Prudence dotted the ink carefully. It's to Great Uncle Oswald. Great Uncle Oswald? Hope exclaimed in amazement. Grandpapa's wicked brother? She frowned. Is Grandpapa going to die after all? No, he should recover in about six or seven weeks. Then why are you writing to Great Uncle Oswald? Charity asked. He won't want to comfort Grandpapa in his sickbed. There is no brotherly love between them at all. I am counting on it, said Prue. And as for why I am writing to him, I am not. This letter is from Grandpapa. What? came a chorus of voices. She read. My dear Oswald, I know we have not always seen eye to eye as brothers surely should. However, I am willing to let bygones be bygones for the sake of the girls. In the stunned silence that followed, she lifted the letter between two fingers, waving it in the air to dry the ink. In short, Grandpapa is asking his brother to give us a season in London and find us husbands. She laid the letter down carefully. We're escaping. We're never coming back to the court. Prudence, Charity exclaimed. That letter is worse than a fib. It's forgery, Prudence shrugged. Yes, but what choice do we have? I am resolved that Grandpapa shall never lay a finger on any of us again. It's wicked, Prue, Faith whispered. Prudence tossed her head. Well, 
Grandpapa has always said I'm wicked, so at last I shall prove him right. We are all going to London, and we are taking Lily and James with us. Lily because Great Uncle Oswald is a widower and may have no maid servants, and James because Grandpapa will never forgive him for his part in this day's work. Her sisters glanced at each other, stunned by the audacity of the plan. Prudence carefully scribed Great Uncle Oswald's London address in a crabbed looking copper plate. Grandpapa will never let us go, Hope said. He won't know. He'll think we've moved to the Dow House. That mouldy old place. Why would... Because by the time his headaches have subsided, Grace will have contracted scarlet fever, and we shall all be in quarantine. Dr. Gibson is going to aid in the deception. You know what a horror Grandpapa has of infection. He won't come near us. Mrs. Burton said as housekeeper she could vouch for the cooperation of the other servants, and she and the doctor will give regular, albeit false, reports to Grandpapa of our progress. Her sisters gaped. And in the meantime, we will stay with our great-uncle, see all the grand sights of the capital, go to parties, wear pretty dresses, and go to, I don't know, Venetian breakfasts and things, even attend the opera. And with any luck, by the time Grandpapa has recovered, one of us will have found a husband, and I shall have turned one and twenty, and you can all legally live with me. Parties and pretty dresses, whispered Charity. What is a Venetian breakfast? Grace asked. Who cares? Hope said, shrugging. It will not be a bowl of oatmeal, that's certain. Faith sighed rapturously. Oh, how I would love to hear an opera. But how can we? We have no money, Prue, Hope, ever the practical one, said. We have not even enough between us to get one of us to London. Mamma's jewellery, Prudence explained. Her garnet bracelet will fetch us enough to pay for tickets on the stage. She regarded her sisters a little guiltily. In fact, I sold it months ago for just such an eventuality. So we can go to London, breathed Charity. Yes, indeed, Prudence smiled. And if one of you can find herself a splendidly rich, handsome, kind and loving husband, she wouldn't mind handing over her inheritance from Mamma to support the rest of us. Would she? Oh, of course we would. It sounds heavenly, Prue. You might even find a handsome husband yourself, Hope added. Hope? Have you forgotten Philip? Charity looked shocked. Oh yes, Philip, Hope amended hastily. To be sure, Philip. How long is it since he last wrote, Prue? Six months, Prudence said with dignity. But you know how slow and unreliable the mails are from India. The voyage alone takes months, and if a ship should founder and sink, bearing Philip's letter. Yes, yes, the mails are slow and very unreliable, Charity agreed. And when he does reply, I am sure he will come, and then he and I shall be married, and we shall all be safe at last. There was a short silence. Well, I shall not depend on Philip. Hope announced. I'm going to do my best to find a husband for myself in London. I want to go to a grand ball and wear a pretty dress instead of these horrid homemade ones. And I'm going to dance the waltz in the arms of a handsome man. I'm going to fall madly in love, just like Mamma and Papa. There was a small silence as the sisters considered the enormity of her aspirations. Prudence was the first to recover. Dance the waltz, Hope. Since none of us even know how to dance at all, we cannot be worrying about waltzes. I don't care. I don't know how it will happen, but somehow, some way, I will dance the waltz, Hope declared mutinously. Perhaps you should put that in the letter, Prue. Ask Great Uncle Oswald to get us a dancing instructor, Faith suggested. Grace grimaced. Then, silly, he would really know that this letter is a forgery. Can you imagine Grandpapa suggesting any such thing? Prudence grinned. Grandpapa certainly won't ask Great Uncle Oswald to have us taught to dance, Faith. Listen to this. And brother, since music and dancing are abominations and the work of the devil, I must remind you to ensure the girls are not corrupted by exposure to such evils while in town. I have brought the girls up according to the most stringently correct principles, and since they are female and thus foolish, frivolous and easily led, 
you must watch them carefully and not allow them to stray. What? gasped Hope. Are you mad? Prudence winked and continued. Therefore, brother, as head of the family, I utterly forbid you to take my granddaughters to any form of ball, rout, musical evening, or similar wickedness. I merely wish you to ensure they find decent, sober husbands of an appropriate station in life, with solid principles and a good fortune. Older heads would be most suitable, no young gadabouts. But that is terrible, wailed Hope. I don't want a stuffy old husband with solid principles. A young gadabout sounds lovely, one that's handsome and nice and young. Me too, agreed Faith. If you send that letter, Prue, you might as well just leave us here to moulder and be miserable with Grandpapa. And be beaten and tied up, Grace added dolefully. Stop talking like that, Grace, Prudence ordered. I told you, no one will beat you again, and nobody is ever going to tie Hope's hand behind her back again. Now trust me, all of you, and consider these points. Firstly, she took the point off on her finger. Great Uncle Oswald has lived in London for years, so he must like it there, and he hasn't been to Durham Court since we've lived here, so obviously he doesn't like it here. Who does? Hope muttered. Prudence grinned and continued her list. Secondly, we know from Philip's mother that Great Uncle Oswald goes to the opera, is terribly fashionable, and goes to a great many parties. Thirdly, we also know that he had a great falling out with Grandpapa and that Grandpapa calls him an irreligious dog and a frivolous fop, and a great many other such insulting epithets. Old Cook says the young Master Oswald she remembers was kind and nice and good for a laugh, Charity objected. Exactly, Prudence said triumphantly. If Great Uncle Oswald is half the man I think he is, he'll be so incensed at Grandpapa's instructions that he will positively hurl us into a sea of balls and parties and all kinds of frivolous wickedness, and let us meet lots of delightful young men, just to spite Grandpapa. All five sisters contemplated the notion. If you are right, Prue, it would be wonderful, Charity whispered. It is bound to go wrong, Grace predicted gloomily. Everything always does. Nonsense, Prudence hugged her little sister. Try to be positive, my love. I am certain I have thought of everything. Chapter Two Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Sir Walter Scott you said when we came to London we would be able to go to parties, Prue, Hope said in an aggrieved voice. And to balls, and routs, and Venetian breakfasts. And the opera, added Faith plaintively. I know, Prudence winced, but... And you said I could dance the waltz with a handsome young man, Prudence winced again. At least we have all had the dancing lessons, Charity began. Who? Who cares for dancing lessons? Next you shall say Monsieur Lafarge is a handsome young man, Hope declared scornfully. All the sisters giggled, thinking of the fussy, mincing, middle-aged Frenchman whom Great Uncle Oswald had engaged to teach the Merridew girls their steps. But Hope was not to be distracted. In five or six weeks, Grandpapa's ankle would have healed enough for him to leave his bedchamber. And then how long after do you think it will take him to discover we have run away? One of us must find a husband before then, Prue. And so far the only person who has met a man, an eligible man, is you. And what good is an eligible man to you? You said nothing would go wrong, Grace said. But it has. She heaved a lugubrious sigh. I said it would. It always does. Silence fell in the back parlour that had been set aside for the young lady's use while in London. Prudence slumped in her chair. It had gone wrong, and it was all her fault. Great Uncle Oswald had lived up to every one of Prudence's hopeful expectations, and more. He had been everything that was kind and avuncular. 
far from expressing any reluctance to receive the five young females foisted on him with no warning, the elderly widower had welcomed his great nieces into his large, elegant London home, with every evidence of pleasure. In some ways he had exceeded their most optimistic expectations. A man who even the most countrified and ignorant young ladies could see at a glance was a veritable pink of the ton, though rather elderly. He had taken one comprehensive and horrified glance at their plain grey homemade gowns, and declared they must instantly have new wardrobes. For whilst I have not the slightest objection in the world to housing you and taking you about, I cannot and will not have my great nieces, and such dashed pretty creatures you are, going about dressed in such atrocious garments. He shook his head. Tomorrow I shall take you to visit mantua makers and milliners and glovers and haberdashers and the rest. The girls' mouths had opened in amazement, accustomed as they were to Grandpapa's nip farthing ways. He had examined each astounded girl with the eye of an experienced man of fashion. Such colouring, such exquisite complexions as you all have, and such bearing. Charity, my dear, you are a diamond, positively celestial, that golden hair, those eyes, and the twins, divine, the pair of you. I dare say I will learn which of you is which, but really it doesn't matter, so stunning as you are, and even little Grace, budding fair to outshine your sisters even yet, or it will be a pleasure to see you all dressed as your beauty demands. He'd rubbed his hands in satisfaction. There'll be no trouble finding husbands for you girls. I don't think it's exaggerating to expect some ducal interest. Yes, a duke at least, to be sure, with such visions as you are. He'd beamed around at them. I do not remember when four such lovely girls have ever come to London at the same time, and all in the same family. My family! He clapped his hands in excitement. It will be a sensation. The ton will not know what hit em. And then his eyes had come to rest on prudence, and his smile had slowly faded. He'd pursed his lips and frowned as he examined her thoughtfully, and the longer he looked her over with that troubled expression, the more prudence felt it. She didn't compare well. Her hair might be the same colour as Grace's, but it had an unfortunate tendency to frizz in damp weather. It didn't compare to shining, silky golden curls, like her other sisters. Her complexion might be smooth and soft, like theirs, but there were five or six tiny freckles that marred it, for she was often careless about wearing a hat in the sunshine, and her eyes were a dreary grey, when everyone else in the family had eyes of varying shades of glorious blue. She felt Great Uncle Oswald's bright blue eyes dwell on her meridew nose, and saw his mouth purse in an even tighter line. He had the same nose, she thought defiantly, and hers was a lot smaller than his, though it probably looked better on a man, she had to admit. There were very few looking-glasses at Derham Court, because vanity was a terrible sin, and since they almost never had visitors, and were not allowed out, and since Philip had been gone for some years, Prudence had never given much thought to her looks. To tell the truth, it was a bit of a shock to read in the eyes of her doting great-uncle that she was the plain one in a flock of beauties. But there were more important things to worry about, Prudence told herself firmly. If you truly believe one of my sisters could be happily married by the end of the season, oh, that would be so wonderful, great-uncle Oswald. It is, Prudence looked around at her sisters in relief, it is exactly what we had hoped for. So excited was she at the prospect of the success of her bold plan that she quite forgot herself, jumped out of her chair and hugged him. Oh, thank you, thank you, dear Uncle Oswald. You are so very kind, so very generous. Her voice choked a little. I cannot tell you how happy you have made us. She kissed his cheek. He'd blushed and beamed and pooh-poohed her nonsense about generosity and kindness and said they'd made a lonely old man very happy. What were uncles for, after all? Her sisters, having recovered from their astonishment at great Uncle Oswald, not only allowing Prudence to hug and kiss him without retaliation, but even seeming to welcome such shocking forwardness, also crowded forward to hug the old gentleman, 
and plant shy kisses on his cheek and balding dome. But when the girls resumed their seats and addressed themselves tentatively to the herbal tea and seed cakes Great Uncle Oswald had ordered for their refreshment, he regarded Prudence for a long moment, frowning. Prudence, foolish female that she was, hadn't realized that she was the fly in the ointment. It was the Mantua maker who put it most succinctly. Measuring her sisters for their new apparel, the elegant Frenchwoman had gushed. Such beautiful figures the mademoiselles have, so graceful, of an elegance like young gazelles, veritably. And then her eyes had fallen on Prudence, and her mouth got that familiar pursed look. She frowned for a moment, and then said with brutal Gallic frankness, You, mademoiselle, will be a little more difficile. You are no gazelle. You are more of the little pony. But I do not despair. I do not despair. Me? I can make anyone elegant. Prudence was inclined to be indignant. She ate as much as her sisters, in fact generally a lot less than the twins, so it really wasn't fair that they should be all slender and sylph-like, and she should be a round little pony. Vanity was a sin, Prudence told herself firmly at the end of the day, as she climbed into bed, feeling crushed and clumsy. It was shallow to think her looks mattered. What mattered was that one of her sisters would soon find a husband, and then they would all, especially Grace, be safe from Grandpapa. But her looks mattered more than she realized. The fourth morning at breakfast, Great Uncle Oswald made the fatal announcement. He brought Grandpapa's supposed letter to the breakfast table and read one part aloud. I have other plans for Prudence, the eldest, so there is no need for her to make her coming out. She can chaperone her sisters and take care of most matters so that the girl's female chatter will not bother you unduly. He had glanced at Prudence across the table and asked, You know what your grandpapa intends, don't you? Always was a selfish one, my brother. Just like him to keep you back to care for him in his old age. He snorted and put the letter aside. I've watched you with your sisters, Missy. You take excellent care of them, don't you? Prudence had blinked at the unexpected praise. She could not remember when anyone had said anything so kind to her. Great Uncle Oswald nodded emphatically. Yes, you're a good sweet girl, Prudence married you, and, dash it all, you shall have your chance. You may lack your sister's dazzling looks, but I'm confident we can fire you off well enough. There are plenty of sensible fellows who look for more than beauty in a wife. We'll find a husband for you yet, little missy, don't you fret. You'll not waste your life away, running around after other people, and looking after selfish old men. Oh, but she or uh, began Charity, and then stopped, flustered at Prudence's urgent look. It is all right, Great Uncle Oswald, Prudence assured him hastily. Please don't worry about me. I am very happy as it is. I very much look forward to being my sister's chaperone and going about with them. It will be such fun. Great Uncle Oswald smiled at her gently and with pity. Dear noble creature, you lack your sister's looks, but you have a truly beautiful soul. Prudence gritted her teeth and forced herself to smile. His next pronouncement wiped the smile off her face. I'll fire you off first without your sisters. Once the ton claps eyes on that bevy of beauties, you won't stand a chance. He nodded and beheaded a boiled egg with gusto. Then, once you're safely buckled, we can let loose these diamonds to dazzle the world. He beamed around the table at her sisters, and before Prudence could think of some way to change his mind, the carriage arrived to take them shopping. But now, after a week in London, it was very clear that Great Uncle Oswald meant exactly what he had said. He wasn't going to allow charity, hope, or faith to be presented to the ton until Prudence was married, and nothing Prudence could say or do would budge him from that position. I am sorry she explained to her sisters in a despairing voice one night in the upstairs parlour. But though Great Uncle Oswald is so very kind and generous, in his own way he is just as stubborn and impervious to reason as Grandpapa is. You have to tell him about Philip, Hope said. It is the only thing. Once he realises you are already betrothed, there is no reason to keep the rest of us in seclusion. I cannot tell him about Philip, 
explained Prudence wearily. I promised Philip I would not announce anything until he gave me permission, and you know I never break my promises. Could we not explain Philip to Great Uncle Oswald? asked Faith. Prudence bit her lip. I daren't risk it. He might defy Grandpapa in small matters, such as dancing and parties, but marriage is a different thing altogether. Besides, he would probably think Philip unsuitable too, a younger son of undistinguished family and no fortune. She sighed. And since the Otterburys live so close to Derham Court, he might contact Grandpapa about it. She shook her head. We would all be in the suds then. And for harbouring us, Grandpapa would probably cut Great Uncle Oswald off without a penny. You know how he complains incessantly of his extravagance. I love Great Uncle Oswald's extravagance, Hope declared, twirling around in her pretty new dress. Charity nodded. Yes, but let us hope he doesn't send Grandpapa the bills from the mantua maker. He would know then that something was amiss. But Prue, dearest, Great Uncle Oswald seems very romantical. Would he not rejoice that you have found a man to marry you? Prudence pulled a wry face. Perhaps. But he is also ambitious and something of a snob. Recall those dukes, you diamonds at a dazzle. In any case, even aside from my promise, have you forgotten that Philip works for Grandpapa's Oriental Trade Company, and that Great Uncle Oswald is also connected with it? Do you really think he'd be delighted by the news that an employee of his, a penniless younger son currently residing in India, contracted a secret betrothal more than four years ago to his eldest great-niece? I think not. The sisters sighed gloomily. Exactly. Philip would lose his position and be unable to afford a wife. I would be in disgrace, and we should all be sent back to live with Grandpapa again. Yes, but Great Uncle Oswald is not mean-spirited and nasty like Grandpapa. Surely he would... began Hope. No, Hope. Prudence shook her head. I'm sorry, but the risks are too great. Great Uncle Oswald is a dear, sweet man, but we cannot expect him to put our welfare before his own. You know what it took to convince even Dr. Gibson, and he's seen the bruises. But I promise you, I shall think of something, and soon. Hope sniffed. You always make these promises. And I keep them, responded Prudence quietly. Should you object if I try to talk the old gentleman around? Because I will die rather than be returned to the court, declared Hope passionately. Of course not, Hope, darling. As long as you respect my secret, I am more than happy for you to try. Prudence rolled her eyes comically. The more I argue in favour of letting you make your coming out, the more noble he tells me I am. No, I've said it once, and I don't intend to waste my breath on repetitions. Great Uncle Oswald glared at the exquisite matching female faces turned imploringly to him. But we are only allowed to stay in London for this one season, argued Hope. Grandpapa will surely not allow us to stay any longer. He has given us only a handful of weeks in which to find husbands, and Prudence is already almost on the shelf. She is almost one and twenty, you know, interpolated her twin and so is not likely to attract a husband at this late stage, even with her very beautiful soul, Hope added hastily, aware of the narrow look Prudence was casting her. If we are forced to wait much longer, we are all likely to remain on the shelf. Fustian, Great Uncle Oswald snapped from behind his paper. Beauties like you two will be snapped up the moment you make your bow to society. Don't be selfish. Give your sister her moment of glory. But if we all came out, no, not until your sister has found herself a husband. Our prudence is a dear good girl, and one day a man will come along and take one look at her and snap her up, but not if the rest of you are there dazzling the poor fellow instead. I, for one, do not care if prudence never gets a husband, announced Grace loyally. I doubt I shall ever marry. I shall be like great Aunt Hermione, a sad and lonely spinster, jilted by my one true love. I shall keep cats and live off my memories. Great Uncle Oswald snorted. You'll marry my girl, and I'll hear no more of such nonsense from you. Keeping cats, indeed. Hermione was always peculiar. There was a short silence, while each of the girls contemplated a bleak future. 
does Prudence actually have to marry before Charity can make her coming out? asked Hope suddenly. Great Uncle Oswald plonked down his newspaper in an irritated gesture. I told you, Missy. I mean, what if she were betrothed? Hope explained hurriedly. And, and what if her betrothed wished to wait for some time until they were wed? If Prudence were betrothed, then could the rest of us, Charity and Faith and me, make our debuts? Great Uncle Oswald shrugged. If Prudence were betrothed, I see no reason why not. But Prudence ain't betrothed, Missy, so cease plaguing me until she is. Hope shot a look of triumph at Prudence. See? We could make our come out. Tell him, Prue, Hope said fiercely. If looks could kill, Hope would have been fried where she sat, but Prudence said not a word. How could she, when her betrothed reputation, livelihood, and future prospects depended on her silence? And besides, she had promised to keep it secret from all except her sisters. Great Uncle Oswald frowned in sudden suspicion. Something you ought to be telling me, girly. No, Uncle, nothing at all. Prudence threaded a length of scarlet silk with shaking hands. If you do not tell him, I shall, Hope said vehemently. It is not fair that we should all be at risk simply because Phil... Be quiet, Hope, Prudence jumped to her feet. You have no right. Silence, Great Uncle Oswald roared. He glared at his great nieces, his face suffused with anger. So deceit and deception under my own roof is there. You two, out. He stabbed a finger at Faith and Grace. Now! He bellowed. They fled. Prudence tried to think. Any moment now, hope or charity would be made to confess that Prudence had entered into a clandestine betrothal, and then he would demand to know the name of her betrothed. And Prudence, knowing the damage it could bring him, had sworn never to reveal it without Philip's permission. She had to do something, but what? Well, girls? Great Uncle Oswald stared at each of them in turn. They said nothing. He addressed Hope. Come, Miss Hope, out with it. Has your sister secretly promised herself? Hope nodded and burst into noisy tears. Charity joined her. God deliver me. Must females always cry? Grumbled Great Uncle Oswald. Stop that dratted caterwauling, will you? He waited until the worst of the sobbing had died down. Then turned to Prudence. Now, Missy, you have some explaining to do. Who is this blackguard who has cousined you into deceiving your legal guardian? Prudence thought frantically. She could not tell him the truth. She had promised Philip she would protect his position. Uh, he is a perfectly respectable gentleman, I promise you, sir. Great Uncle Oswald sniffed. Perfectly respectable gentlemen don't enter into heavy cavy betrothals behind people's backs. Oh, but he is a very private gentleman, uh, and does not enjoy the fuss and botheration of a public celebration. Great Uncle Oswald snorted. There's a big difference between a private arrangement and a clandestine one. Now stop beating around the bush, girl. Name the blackguard at once. Prudence's mind raced. It is... it is... She could not betray Philip. She could not. Spit it out, girl. It is... From the ether, Prudence plucked a name. The previous evening she'd overheard two ladies discussing a man who was a famous recluse, an unmarried man who apparently never came to London. He is the Duke of Dinstable. There was a short, stunned silence in the room. Hope and Charity regarded her through astonished, drenched, beautiful eyes. The Duke of Dinstable? repeated Great Uncle Oswald, stunned. You've entered into a secret betrothal to the Duke of Dinstable? Yes. Prudence attempted a bright smile, desperately attempting to recall everything she'd heard the ladies say about him. That fellow they call Hermit Ned, she nodded. Dinstable, fellow who hates cities, hasn't been seen in London for years, lives in some godforsaken corner of Scotland. Prudence nodded again. She was starting to feel quite pleased with herself. The Duke of Dinstable. It was positively inspirational. The Duke of Dinstable might be odd, even peculiar, but he was reputed to be extremely rich. And if he never came to London, Great Uncle Oswald couldn't ask him to explain a secret betrothal. Of course, 
he could always write, but letters took a long time, and perhaps the reclusive duke would not answer. It was a reprieve, if only a temporary one. The Duke of Dinstable, Great Uncle Oswald repeated, shaking his head in amazement. Prudence, tired of nodding, inclined her head. How did you meet him, this Dinstable fellow, if he never comes to London? Imagine not liking London. He may not come to London, but there is no reason why he should not come to Norfolk, she said, careful not to compound her sins by uttering any more actual lies. Her great uncle frowned. How old were you when you agreed to this damned irregular arrangement? Nearly seventeen, Prudence said. It wasn't a lie either, not precisely. Not that she had even met the Duke of Dinstable, but she had become betrothed at sixteen to Philip Otterbury, whom she had known all her life. Philip, who had sworn her to secrecy and gone away to India, promising to return a nabob. You were only sixteen, Great Uncle Oswald exploded wrathfully. And you have waited more than four years for this blasted duke to come to the point and wed you. Prudence nodded. Was it really that long? No wonder your sisters have been chafing at the bit. Can't blame them now I come to think of it. Dashed casual attitude to take to my great niece. Four years. Why the devil didn't you tell me? Prudence didn't reply. She could hardly meet his eye as it was. He'd been so kind and generous. But as soon as they were safe, she would confess it all and she vowed she would make it up to him. Dinstable, eh? Great Uncle Oswald walked over to the fireplace, frowning. Dukes, even rackety hermitish dukes, don't just up and propose to chits of sixteen. You didn't let him do anything to you, did you? Anything you shouldn't have let him do? He peered at her shrewdly. You know what I mean, Missy. Prudence flushed rosily. He never touched me, she declared with complete truth. Hmm. And it was four years ago. He frowned thoughtfully. And why so secretive, eh? Not as if he were the younger son of a farmer, after all. Prudence flushed. It was a perfect description of Philip. Grandpapa wouldn't allow us any visitors at all, let alone suitors. Great Uncle Oswald snorted. Always was short-sighted in matters of business, Theodore. I don't suppose this duke put anything in writing. Prudence shook her head. Grandpapa would never allow us any correspondence. Not even clandestine letters. Never knew the girl yet who didn't manage a bit of illicit correspondence in matters of the heart. She flushed and glanced at the fire. Ah, burned em, did you? Pity. Letters might have cinched the deal. I don't suppose he gave you any love token, nothing with a crest or anything. Prudence hesitated, then pulled Philip's grandmother's ring from her bodice. She'd worn it on a chain for four years. Aha! Great Uncle Oswald leaped forward and examined it. Trumpery thing, and no ducal crest to nail him down, but it's old, probably some family thing. It might do the trick. He nodded resolutely. Not so bad as I thought, then, if he's given you a ring. Might be dragging his feet, but dash it, if the fellow didn't wish to become a tenant for life, he should never have handed over the evidence. Now don't you fret any longer, my dear. I'll fix it, make it all legal. Ha! Thirty thousand a year, I'm told. Prudence nodded dazedly, hoping that the weather on the roads to Scotland would be foul and the mail delayed for weeks, preferably swept away in a flood. Hope, recovering from her bout of guilt with remarkable speed, asked tentatively, So, may Charity and Faith and I make our coming outs? Eh? What's that? Charity and you twins, eh? Well, if your sister's betrothed, even in such a dashed hole-in-the-corner fashion, I see no reason why the marriage you diamonds may not begin to dazzle society. Hope uttered a squeak of excitement, so he added witheringly, Starting with Miss Charity. We shall see about you and your twin after that. Miss Prudence, you'll wait not a month longer. You may begin preparations for your bridal at once. I'll call on the fellow first thing in the morning and make the arrangements. Prudence felt the pit of her stomach drop in horrid anticipation of disaster. What did you say? Great Uncle Oswald? Call on whom first thing in the morning? Dinstable, of course. Great-uncle Oswald replied. 
Make the arrangements for the wedding at St. George's, Hanover Square, I think. And all the usual fuss and nonsense you ladies enjoy. Fellow may have botched the betrothal, but we'll fire you off in style, my dear. Don't you worry. Prudence, Hope, and Charity stared. Prudence gathered her wits first. But the Duke of Dinstable resides in the far north of Scotland, Uncle. How on earth can you make a morning call on him? Great Uncle Oswald grinned and patted the side of his nose knowingly. Ha! You didn't know, did you, Missy? No doubt I've spoiled the fellow's romantical surprise. But this probably explains why he's broken his rule after all these years. All the tabbies have been buzzing about him, wondering what's brought about his unexpected arrival in the metropolis. And even if he didn't intend a romantical surprise, I'll give him one. He'll not out-jockey Sir Oswald Merridew. He rubbed his hands in glee. Won't the matchmaking mamas be green when they're here? My plain little prudence, a duchess, eh? We might yet snag a brace of dukes yet. Stap me if we don't. He left the room chuckling with pleased anticipation. The three girls stared at each other in shocked silence. Whatever made you say such a thing, Prue? Charity shook her head. Now we are more than ever in the suds. Prudence subsided into a chair and shook her head. I don't know. I was clutching at straws. I didn't want Philip to lose his position, and when Great Uncle Oswald was roaring at us, so very like Grandpapa, the name came to me and just popped out. Can he really be going to call on the Duke of Dinstable tomorrow? said Charity at last. Prudence shook her head in despair. But people the other night said the Duke of Dinstable never comes to London. That's why I picked him. They said he hasn't been here for years. I must say, Prue, it was frightfully clever of you, began Hope. Don't you dare say a word, you horrid little snake in the grass, snapped her loving older sister. If it hadn't been for you. Yes, and I'm sorry, but I was desperate, Prue. I so want to go to balls and parties. I want to dance the waltz with a handsome man and fall madly in love. I would rather die than go back to live with Grandpapa. But Philip's tardiness has ruined things for all of us. I don't blame you. I would have grabbed at him too, if it was the only chance I was likely to get. I did not grab at Philip, interrupted Prudence indignantly. Nor was it the only chance I was likely to get. It was the most romantic moment of my life. It was the only romantic moment of your life, Hope interrupted crushingly. And it was more than four years ago. I still do not understand how Great Uncle Oswald can call on the Duke of Dinstable first thing in the morning if he lives in the north of Scotland, Charity said plaintively, ignoring the sisterly squabbling. Prudence and Hope, reminded of the disaster that faced them, instantly forgot their differences. When he said the Duke might be planning a romantical surprise, he glanced at the newspaper, Prudence said slowly. Perhaps. The sisters fell on the newspaper, divided it between them, and began to scan the sheets avidly. Here it is, Charity announced after a few moments. In a hollow voice she read, this metropolis has been graced by the rare presence of D of D, who has left his northern hermitage and come to town. Rumour has it that the D is considering matrimony. She stared at Prudence in dismay, and passed her the dreaded passage. The Duke of Dinstable in town. He hasn't been to London in more than ten years. Prudence stared in disbelief at the paper, and crushed it slowly in her hands. Oh, how wretchedly inconvenient! He has been perfectly happy in the wilds of Scotland for years. Why come to town now? She considered the disaster for a moment, and with a groan added, And whatever will he think when Great Uncle Oswald calls on him and tries to force him to marry me? There was a long silence in the room. What are you going to do, Prue? Prudence considered the problem from all angles. No matter how I look at it, I can see no alternative. Charity nodded. I know. Oh dear. Oh dear. Tears began to roll down her damask cheeks. Hope too began to sob. He'll send us all back to Grandpapa now. Oh Prue, I am so sorry I said anything now. I did not think. She snuffled and groped for her handkerchief. Prudence sat up and regarded her sisters with astonishment. 
Whatever are you carrying on about? We are not going back to Derham Court. Charity blinked through her tears. But when you confess to Great Uncle Oswald, he... Confess to Great Uncle Oswald? Prudence exclaimed. I have no intention of confessing to Great Uncle Oswald. But what else can you do? I'll speak to the Duke of Dinstable, of course. There's no other solution. After an astonished pause, her sisters finally found their tongues. But where? How will you meet him? And when? Great Uncle Oswald plans to call on him tomorrow morning. Prudence smiled grimly. Well then, Prudence Merridew will just have to call on the Duke a little bit earlier, won't she? Charity was horrified. Call on a man? In his own home, unannounced and without a proper introduction? Prudence, you cannot. Prudence squared her shoulders. Just watch me. Chapter 3 A girl, no virgin either, I should guess, a baggage, thrust upon me like a cargo on a ship, to wreck my peace of mind. Sophocles Miss Merridew to see his grace, the Duke of Dinstable. A butler looked down his nose at her in faint superior disapproval. Prudence drew herself up to her full height, and stared him straight in the livery attempting to look assured and unconcerned, as if she called on strange gentlemen at their homes every day. Strange ducal gentlemen, strange ducal hermits. The butler's gaze shifted to Prudence's nervous maidservant, Lily, who blushed and stared at the white steps of the London mansion of the Duke of Dinstable. The butler returned his attention to Prudence. And is his grace expecting you, miss? said the butler in a tremendously bored voice. Prudence attempted to look tremendously bored in return. It was a difficult task when her pulse was rattling along like Herr Meltzel's metronome, but necessary. Boredom, she had learned since coming to London, was a sophisticated acquirement. The more bored she looked, the more sophisticated she would seem, and she could tell that only the most terribly soigné of misses would gain entry from this butler. And besides, he smelled of musk. She refused to be intimidated by a butler who smelled of musk. She raised her eyebrow in faint, sophisticated surprise. I believe his grace will be most put out if he misses me. The butler hesitated. Come now, Prudence said in a firm voice. It is raining, and my maid is getting cold. The butler glanced at Lily, who, discreetly nudged by Prudence, shivered obediently. Very well, miss. If you would care to wait in the green drawing-room, I shall inform his grace. He held open the door, and with a sigh of relief, Prudence entered. Silently indicating that Lily should remain on a seat in the hallway, he took Prudence's hat, umbrella, and damp cloak, and ushered her into a large room, furnished in the Egyptian style. If you would care to wait, miss, the butler bowed and left the room. Prudence glanced around the room, deciding where to sit. The choice was not a simple one. The main item of seating was a green and gilt settee, shaped for all the world like Cleopatra's barge, with a carved headboard depicting a river scene with water lilies and dolphins, surrounded by writhing asps. 
the other end looped up in a gilt and ebony curve, rather like a salt and slipper, and the feet looked horridly like crocodile's feet. It was not the sort of settee on which one could sit correctly. It was the sort of seat that invited one to loll. She could not greet an unknown duke lolling. She needed every shred of dignity and poise she could muster. Gingerly seating herself on a carved ebony chair, with snarling one-legged gilt lion armrests, Prudence waited. She sat in her most ladylike pose, smoothing her dress and gloves, willing her heart to slow. The jackal-headed Anubis and the hawk-headed Horus stared impassively down from a sideboard. Nearby a footstool sported four lion's feet that mysteriously became the top half of very immodestly dressed ladies. She tried to imagine Grandpapa in this room. He would have an apoplexy, she decided. The thought cheered her. She had never done anything so bold in her life, apart from becoming secretly betrothed to Philip, that is. But for an unmarried lady to call uninvited on a strange gentleman in his home, that was truly shocking. Great Uncle Oswald's coachman had even been shocked when she'd inquired about the Duke's direction. It was a thing, apparently, that unmarried ladies did not even ask. A sphinx stared silently at her from the wall. Her fingers tapped an impatient, anxious tattoo on her reticule. It was the pasteboard reticule, slightly lopsided from where Grandpapa had damaged it in his rage, and very dear to Prudence's heart. It matched the room, being shaped like an Egyptian sarcophagus and carefully painted in blue, green, black, and gold. Grace would be thrilled to see this room. Her little sister would see that not all the world thought the Egyptian taste to be wicked, heathenish foulness. Her fingers were clenched around the reticule, she realized. She forced them to relax. If she handled things properly, Grace would never again be beaten for an innocent mistake. It all depended on how well she handled this duke and Great Uncle Oswald. An ormolu clock, mounted on gilt griffins, ticked noisily on the overmantel. It was well after nine o'clock. Great Uncle Oswald would have finished his hot water and apple cider vinegar drink by now, and be beginning on his sheared eggs. She had, perhaps, twenty minutes, if Great Uncle Oswald was not early. He was a man of regular habits. Prudence smoothed her skirt for the hundredth time. She thought it would be quite exciting to be bold and adventurous, instead of always trying to be invisible, so as not to attract Grandpapa's attention. But the longer she waited, the more anxious, and the less bold she felt. She told herself to be calm. Nothing dreadful could happen with Lily so close outside. Besides, she had no choice. The clock ticked remorselessly on. The Sphinx stared. The lion head snarled in frozen gilt fury. Oh, where was this wretched duke? Great Uncle Oswald will be here any minute. What have we here, Bartlett? Prudence jumped. In the doorway stood a tall, dark, rather raffish looking gentleman. Prudence blinked. She had seen several dukes since arriving in London. This one did not look as a duke ought to look. Though his clothing was of the finest quality, it was rumpled and crumpled. His coat was unbuttoned and carelessly worn. His neckcloth was a little skewed and knotted negligently beneath quite moderate shirt points. And he seemed not to have shaved, for his chin, though attractively shaped, was decidedly dark and rough-looking. She had expected a duke, even a hermit, to be a little more dapper in appearance. Only royal dukes looked this dishevelled. But perhaps this was why he was a hermit, or perhaps she had got him out of bed. For some reason the thought made her blush. Had she not known who he was, she might have been concerned at being alone with such a man, for he looked decidedly dark and dangerous, and the gleam in his eye as he looked at her was certainly not one a girl should trust. Prudence decided, duke or no. His eyes were dark and narrow, and seemed to be laughing at her, for no reason she could imagine. She sat a little straighter on the hard chair, and clutched her reticule beneath her bosom. Bartlett? He repeated to the butler standing just outside the door. He sauntered in, not taking his eyes off Prudence. Who is our charming visitor? The butler followed him into the room, bringing with him the faint scent of musk. 
This young person, sir, arrived intemperately this morning, announcing her determination to converse with the Duke of Dinstable. There is another female outside who accompanied the young person. Prudence jumped up indignantly. How dare you speak of me in that tone? I am not a young person at all. I am a young lady. And I did not arrive intemperately. It is a perfectly reasonable hour. The tall gentleman's brow quirked sceptically, and she flushed and corrected herself with dignity, recalling that she had probably got him out of his bed, and that she was supposed to be a bored and soigné young lady, quite accustomed to calling on gentlemen. Perhaps it is a little early for some people, but when you hear what I have to say, Your Grace, I am sure you will understand. Oh, but, began the butler, that will be all, Bartlett, the tall gentleman said suavely. The butler hesitated a moment, looking doubtfully from the Duke to Prudence. Prudence bridled at his expression. Your master will be quite safe with me, she snapped. I mean him no harm. The tall gentleman chuckled softly. You heard the Lady Bartlett. I am quite safe with her. You may go. The butler left. What a perfectly detestable man, Prudence declared although I suppose you pay him to be detestable. Not at all. It comes naturally to him, the Duke said. Oh, I must confess I find his uh, repellent skills useful at times. He sat down on Cleopatra's barge, crossed one long leg over the other, and regarded her with a faint look of amusement on his face. Now, what can I do for you, Miss... Uh... She watched him critically noting that he had quite definitely lolled. Miss Meridew, Miss Prudence Meridew, she explained in as composed a voice as she could manage. The way he was looking at her was quite disconcerting. I have four siblings, all sisters. I am the eldest. Indeed, he asked politely. Yes, and that is the heart of the problem, she said, for one of us must marry. She frowned, realising she had started her speech wrongly. She had rehearsed and rehearsed it last night, until she had it perfectly off by heart. But something in the way this dark-eyed man watched her had the effect of scrambling the words in her mind. I see. And you imagine this has something to do with the Duke of Dinstable? His words were perfectly polite, but a certain harsh quality had entered his tone. His dark eyes regarded her intently, and Prudence felt her nervousness increase. Yes, well, no, not directly. It was a mistake on my part. She stopped, realising she wasn't making sense. It was most unlike her. I am sorry. I am making a shocking mull of this. It is extremely awkward, you see. She stood up and took a few paces around the room to cool her suddenly heated cheeks. The way he looked at her was most unsettling. She took several deep, calming breaths and considered how best to explain. He was right to be suspicious of her motives. She had claimed to be betrothed to him. He was about to be confronted by an angry great-uncle. She gripped her reticule a little tighter, glanced at the clock, and forced herself to go on. I must apologize, Your Grace, for it is all my fault. I truly never meant to drag you into it, only, she sighed, it is a complicated tale, but I shall try to cut to the bare essentials. He smiled. Good. I always prefer essentials bared. Somehow he made it sound wicked. Prudence blinked hurriedly and wished she'd brought a fan. It really was very warm in here all of a sudden. You see, one of us must find a husband quickly, only it cannot be me. One dark-winged eyebrow arched in a sardonic query. She hurried on. It must be one of my sisters. Only my great-uncle thinks that we should not come out together, that I should come out first. I see. She flushed, and for some reason found that she could not bring herself to explain the reason to him. Yes, so I told him a lie, and, and, your name came up, and I'm sorry, I truly am. I thought it would help my sisters to come out, only it has all come awry. I did not think it would cause such a problem, because I thought you safe in the wilds of Scotland. I had counted on the delay, you see, and let us go astray all the time. The mobile mouth twitched a little, and the hard expression in his eyes was replaced by an amused gleam. 
It was thoughtless of me to come to London, I see. So inconvenient. He smiled a slow smile, and for a moment it drove all rational thought from her head. She stammered. Oh, no, you could not know. But I was shocked to find you here, for you almost never mix in society, do you? No, he said apologetically. I do not care for many of the people, you see. The clock struck half past the hour, chiming once in a sombre fatalistic fashion. Prudence jumped. Oh no, half past nine, already! She resumed her pacing. Yes, a ridiculous hour, I agree, he yawned. Ridiculous? Prudence stared at him in amazement. He clearly had not grasped the urgency of the situation. If only he would stop looking at her like, like an amused satyr, she might be able to manage a clear and rational explanation. The thing is, Your Grace, Great Uncle Oswald is coming to see you any minute now to demand an explanation. Oh, Great Uncle Oswald is also vexed with me for not staying in Scotland, is he? Oh no, said Prudence distractedly. He is delighted you are here, of course. She flushed and swallowed, and tried to gather her composure. For, for reasons that are rather complicated, but altruistic, I allowed my great-uncle to come to a certain conclusion about you and me. She felt her face heat further. It was not like her to dither, but the situation was truly fantastical, and the way this man's gaze kept slipping over her was very disconcerting. He flustered her. A certain conclusion. She cast him a look of entreaty, putting off the horrid moment of truth yet again. You must believe me, Your Grace. I never meant to land anyone in a pickle. No, of course not. His eyes were dancing now, she noticed. How could he be amused at a time like this? He stood up, strolled across the room and pulled at the cord hanging by the fireplace. In a moment, the door opened and the butler stood there. A brandy, if you please, Bartlett, and something for the lady. Ratafia? Tea? Prudence was appalled. You cannot possibly mean to be drinking spirituous liquor at this time of the morning. The Duke nodded at Bartlett. Tea for Miss Meridew, then, and brandy for me. And Bartlett, bring the decanter. But you cannot greet Great Uncle Oswald with a glass of brandy in your hand. My dear girl, I'm afraid I cannot greet him any other way. It is not morning for me, you see, but the end of a particularly long and tedious night. And if I am to be thrust into a pickle without the fortification of a brandy, I cannot answer for the consequences. Guilt stabbed Prudence at his words. She rallied. The situation was difficult enough to explain without the Duke getting drunk. But Great Uncle Oswald abhors the evils of liquor. He can have tea, then. Oh, will you please be serious? You cannot imagine what is about to happen. He laughed at that, a deep-throated chuckle that filled the room. I have not the faintest notion what any of this is about. Just then, Bartlett arrived with a tea tray, on which stood a pot of tea, a plate of cakes, a cup and saucer, a fat crystal glass, and a tall crystal decanter containing a mellow golden liquid. As he placed it on a side table, the front door knocker sounded thunderously. Prudence squeaked. Oh no, he is here, Great Uncle Oswald. I believe it is the lady's great uncle at the door, Bartlett, the Duke said. Show him in, if you please. Bartlett bowed, thin-lipped, then left the room in a stately manner to answer the summons. The thing is, Prudence gabbled. For reasons I have no time to explain just now, I told him that you and I were secretly betrothed. The smile on his face froze. Betrothed? Yes, I am sorry. It was all I could think of to make him see reason about Charity and the twins making their coming out, for which the need is urgent, though I cannot explain why, but Great Uncle Oswald will not let them come out with me. I imagine he has good reason, the Duke said ironically. Well, yes, because, she flushed, the reason does not matter. What matters is that they cannot enter society until I am out of the way, and I thought you would suit my purposes perfectly being a famous hermit. Are you really? He interjected interestedly. 
Am I what? demanded Prudence, confused. A famous hermit. Not me, Lackwit. You, she snapped. Oh, I do beg your pardon. My nerves are shredded. But you are the famous hermit. Except you've emerged from your hermitage, and some wretched busybody put it in the paper, and now here is Great Uncle Oswald, come to demand that you marry me, immediately. What? Bat wiped the smile from his face, she noted with satisfaction. I told you it was serious, Your Grace. An expression of unholy glee flashed across his dark-visaged face. I can see it is, he chuckled, and I definitely need that brandy. He strolled across the room to the tray with the decanter. Would you care to pour your tea, Miss Merridew? Outside, Prudence could hear Great Uncle Oswald noisily demanding to see the Duke of Dinstable. She hurried across to where the Duke was standing and laid a reassuring hand on his arm. Do not fear, she whispered hastily. It may be a tangle, but it is not a trap. If you will only allow my uncle to believe we did have an understanding, I promise you most faithfully I will sever the engagement immediately. Please, I beg of you, just follow my lead. Trust me, Your Grace. I mean you no harm. He glanced down at her hand, patting his arm soothingly. Trust you. His eyes caught hers and held them for a long, long moment. And for a second, Prudence felt as if something important had happened. But then he shifted, and his eyes laughed down at her again, as if that moment of connection had never been. And bring on your dragons, fair maiden, he said, and lifted his glass to his lips. Prudence scanned his face worriedly. He was very hard to read. For a second there, she'd felt so, so heartened by that long look, as if she could depend on him in some way. Yet a moment later, he seemed to find the whole thing hugely entertaining, and was quite unworried by the prospect of Great Uncle Oswald's imminent arrival. Was that because, as a duke, he thought himself perfectly safe? She took a deep breath, and braced herself for the coming scene. Gideon watched her interestedly out of the corner of his eye. She was an attractive little thing, he decided, not conventionally beautiful, but with a decided air of determination and a most appealing way of looking at him. Her simple pale green gown set off her thick glorious hair, pale skin and wide grey eyes. The simple style, the direct grey gaze was refreshing in a Quakerish sort of fashion. Not that her behaviour was Quakerish in the least, but then, nor was his interest, he had to admit. That small stubborn chin was braced for trouble, prepared to meet it head on. It seemed as though, having imagined she got him into hot water, she was now prepared to defend him. He found it rather refreshing. He sipped the cognac and made a small wager with himself as to how far she would let the joke go before she confessed all. Of course, she might be a blackmailing harpy, but he didn't think so. He was all too well acquainted with females of that variety. So, you would offend me from your great uncle? He asked softly. She turned back to him with wide, sincere eyes. Of course I will. It was more than refreshing. It was irresistible, and Gideon couldn't help himself. Without thinking, he put down his glass, pulled her into his arms, and kissed her. He'd meant it to be a swift, light kiss, something of a thanks with a touch of mischievous provocation, but instead found himself plunged into unexpected depths. She tasted of surprise and sweetness and innocence, but she could not disguise her instinctive response to him. No Quakerishness there, he thought raggedly, and took the kiss deeper. The taste of her was intoxicating. He let his own instincts rule him, and drew her more firmly against his body, enjoying the way her soft curves moulded against him. Her stiffness slowly dissolved, and when he felt the first tentative response from her, it sent a thread of pure possessiveness arching through him. A clatter outside the door brought him to his senses. Reluctantly he released her, and she moved back an inch or two, blinking up at him, looking adorably confused. He was very tempted to kiss her again. She eyed him with a mixture of disapproval and shocked awareness. You should not have done that. He took a moment to respond. I'll do it again in a moment if you don't stop looking at me like that. Don't you dare! 
she gave him a haughty little warning glare. He fought the urge to smile. Even her disapproval was appealing. Mastering the urge to kiss her again, he picked up his cognac and sipped. The door was thrown open. Prudence jumped visibly and clutched Gideon's arm. He was certain she had no idea of it. Good God! A fussily dressed elderly man came into the room and stood stock still on the threshold, staring at the occupants in stupefaction. Prudence, how come you to be here? This was, no doubt, Great Uncle Oswald. In a leisurely manner, Gideon finished his cognac, well aware that the elderly man was snorting and snuffing in outrage, but forced by good manners to wait for his host to acknowledge his presence. Gideon let him wait. Miss Merridew was still clutching his arm, unconsciously, he suspected, though he couldn't be sure. He waited for Great Uncle Oswald to become aware of it. It did not take long. What shamelessness is this? The old man's face darkened, and his white brows gnashed fiercely together. Never one to overlook an opportunity, Gideon wrapped his arm around her waist. It was a delightful waist, he decided, soft and inviting, with the most appealing curves above and below. She stiffened under his clasp. Unhand my great niece, you unshaven lout, roared Great Uncle Oswald. The unshaven lout ignored him and hugged the great niece a little tighter around the waist. He leered down at her. Great Uncle Oswald gobbled like an enraged turkey. Flushing, Prudence wriggled out of Gideon's grip, pushed his hands away, and stammered an introduction. Great Uncle Oswald, I'd like to present you the Duke of Dinstable. She cast Gideon a minatory glance. Your Grace, this is my great uncle. Sir Oswald married you. Abandoning his pose as vile seducer, Gideon bowed correctly. Your servant, Sir Oswald. Sir Oswald gibbered silently, shocked. You, your grace. So it was true then. But you surely cannot be the blackguard who has cousined my niece in such a heavy cavy way. I accept I must be, Gideon said meekly. Does it seem heavy cavy to you? I confess it never occurred to me, although blackguard does seem a trifle harsh. Rascal, I might accept, even scallywag, and unshaven lout, certainly, since I've been out all night. He passed a rueful hand across his roughened jaw. But blackguard? Surely not. In the face of this barefaced provocation, Sir Oswald resumed his gobbling. What the devil does my great-niece mean to you, sir? he demanded. Aware that Miss Miradieu was holding her breath anxiously, Gideon hesitated, then cast her a soulful look. I cannot say, he replied truthfully. After all, he knew almost nothing about her, except that her lips tasted delicious. He heard her exhale in relief and smiled to himself. Did the girl really think he would denounce her when he was having so much fun? Do you deny that you have extracted from her a promise? I could deny it, I suppose, but I doubt you would believe me, he sighed plaintively. Disgraceful, especially for a man of your position. You must have known the girl was too young to be allowed to make a promise like that without the knowledge of her guardian. Gideon glanced at Prudence and shrugged. She does not seem too young to me. Blast it, man! Sixteen is far too young! Gideon stared at Prudence in shock. You cannot be only sixteen. I do not believe it. You look, uh, much more mature. His eyes dropped to the evidence of her maturity. Do not prevaricate with me, man. I'm talking about four and a half years ago, as you very well know. Four and a half years ago, Gideon repeated blankly. Prudence, observing his hesitation, stepped into the breach. When we became betrothed, of course, you must have known I was sixteen at the time. Must I? He grinned. How? We discussed it at the time, she replied with composure. You have forgotten. Ah, yes, I must have been thinking of other things at the time, he agreed, adding softly. So that means you must be what? At four and a half to sixteen. More than twenty now. Such a great age. No wonder great Uncle Oswald is desperate to fire you off. Almost on the shelf as you are. She narrowed her eyes at him, and her fists clenched as if she itched to box his ears. She was utterly delightful, 
thought Gideon, enjoying himself hugely. But you are a duke, Sir Oswald thundered. Why wait four years if you wanted the girl? Why, indeed, Gideon poured himself another cognac. Brandy, Sir Oswald, poisoning your innards with brandy at this hour of the morning. Disgraceful, Sir Oswald turned puce. Ah, yes, Miss Meridew did warn me. Tea for you, then, agreed Gideon gently, and waved a hand toward the teapot. Or shall I ring for a fresh pot? With visible difficulty, Sir Oswald harnessed his outrage and moderated his tone. No, no, nothing to drink, I thank you. What I am trying to understand, he said, is why all the secrecy and creeping around. Gideon raised his eyebrows. Have I been creeping around? he asked Prudence in a tone of dread. How very peculiar of me. Though she primmed her mouth at him, a dimple betrayed her. She was enchanting, caught like this between amusement and outrage. Sir Oswald persisted. You know what I mean, blast it. If you wanted the girl, you must have known your suit would have been looked on favourably. Damn it, you are a duke after all, even if you do dress like a shag bag. Gideon looked affronted. A shag bag? He glanced ruefully down at his dishevelled clothing, sighed, and turned a pair of mournful eyes on Prudence. I creep about, and I dress like a shag bag. Are you sure you still wish to be betrothed to me, my dear? No, not at all, Prudence snapped in exasperation. The interview was not going at all as she had planned it. She should have taken control of the conversation much earlier, only her brain seemed to have seized up for a moment after that kiss. Several moments, in fact. Instead of concentrating on the matter at hand, her wretched mind kept sliding back to relive that scandalous kiss. Even her lips still seemed to tingle from it. She was in command of herself now, but in the meantime the situation had galloped out of control. If only this wretched duke would stop his nonsense and let her enact the role she had spent half the night rehearsing. It would all be sorted out by now. Instead, he seemed to be having a high old time of it. Enough of this shilly shallying around snapped Great Uncle Oswald. I want an answer, now. Why did you not come to speak to her guardian, like an honest man? Prudence opened her mouth to explain. Be silent, girl. I want to hear it from him, damn it. He has spent long enough avoiding the question. He turned to the Duke. Come, Sirrah, explain. Why did you not ask for her hand, openly, like a man? There was a short silence as the Duke considered the question. Prudence held her breath. I was shy, said six foot one of bashful male. He grunted as a sharp feminine elbow thudded inconspicuously into his side. Prudence stepped forward resolutely. Great Uncle Oswald, my eyes have been opened. I no longer wish to be betrothed to this, this... Cad? The Duke supplied, sotto voce. Cad, she declared, mastering the faint quaver in her voice. I find I was mistaken in his character. I was foolish at sixteen, but now I am a... a woman grown... Beautifully grown, murmured a deep voice in her ear. And I could not possibly marry a man who do not have the courage to face you or Grandpapa like a ma... Not Grandpapa as well, the cad beside her groaned theatrically. What a miserable coward I have been. Yes, she agreed severely. And now it is too late for that, since poor Grandpapa lies. God rest his soul, the wretch intoned piously. Poor Grandpapa lies on his sick bed, Prudence corrected him. And he is therefore unable to be spoken to, she faced Great Uncle Oswald resolutely. In any case, I find my eyes have been opened to his grace's true defects of character. After all this time I thought you must be willing to overlook the defects murmured the Duke irrepressibly. Don't tell me you didn't even notice them. I am mortified, simply mortified. Prudence pressed her lips together a moment, forced a bubble of laughter back down, and continued. I cannot marry a man who is such a miserable coward, not miserable surely, quite cheerful at, and who, moreover, she flung him a quelling glance, displays a deeply flippant attitude to the serious things in life. One of those being Great Uncle Oswald. 
the dreadful man beside her murmured. He is frightfully serious, is he not? Could do with a bit of cheering up, in my opinion. Prudence spluttered as the mirth bubbled up inside her again. Great Uncle Oswald, I find on reflection this man is quite unsuitable, not to mention the fact that he... Er... Uh, she tried desperately to think of a final clinching reason to sever her betrothal. Dresses like a shag bag. Is an unshaven lout? The Duke offered under his breath. She ignored him. Brandy in the morning? He muttered. Prudence seized on it. A man who drinks brandy at this hour of the morning could never be the right man for me. Great Uncle Oswald frowned and considered her statement. Yes, that is all very well, and I take your point. He glared at the Duke, who immediately looked crushed. So pathetically crushed, in fact, that Prudence found giggles welling up in her again. She glared severely at the wretch. The wretch winked at her. Don't you dare wink at my great niece like that, you blasted scoundrel! snapped Great Uncle Oswald. She is not some loose woman to be winked at by the likes of you. He seemed suddenly to recall that this unshaven, carelessly dressed lout was a duke, and added, Er, uh, duke or not? I beg your pardon? A soft voice said from the doorway. Prudence and Great Uncle Oswald glanced around in surprise. In the doorway was a neatly dressed man of medium height. In many ways he was the opposite of the Duke, Prudence thought. Where the Duke was tall and loose-limbed and dishevelled, this man was plump, square and compact. Where the Duke was dark and unshaven and casually dressed to the point of carelessness, this gentleman was as neat as wax, freshly shaved, his hair perfectly quaffed and his clothing crisp and fresh. He looked to be about thirty. Morning, Edward, the Duke said, grinning. Good morning, Gideon, the gentleman responded. There seems to have been a great deal of noise coming from this room. Could I prevail on you to explain it to me? This is private business, sir, Great Uncle Oswald began. And I'll thank you to... The gentleman ignored him. Gideon? He repeated. Hang it all, sir, Great Uncle Oswald blustered. Who the devil do you think you are to be demanding explanations when I just told you it was our private business? The gentleman turned haughtily. Who the devil am I? He said in a cold voice. I, sir, am Edward Penteith, the Duke of Dinstable, and this is my house. And who might you be? Chapter 4 she is as headstrong as an allegory on the banks of the Nile. I'll be Sheridan. The quietly uttered words seemed to echo around the room. Great Uncle Oswald gaped for a moment, then spluttered. What? What the devil do you mean you are the Duke of Dinstable? The neatly dressed man merely raised an eyebrow, but it was the sort of gesture one could only inherit from generations of haughty-browed ducal ancestors. Great Uncle Oswald needed no further convincing. Then who the deuce is this smoky knave? he demanded angrily. The Duke raised his eyebrow again. Allow me to present my cousin, Lord Caradice. And you are? Lord Caradice! exclaimed Great Uncle Oswald, goggling in horror. Lord Caradice! Why, I. I've heard of you. Lord Caradice bowed. It was a perfectly correct bow, thought Prudence, annoyed, yet it conveyed all sorts of other things. Mockery, indifference, amusement. How dare he bow at her great-uncle like that? How dare he trick her? She frowned at him. Delighted to meet. Great-uncle Oswald cut him off. Delighted nothing, sirrah. I've heard all about you. You're nothing but a rake. A scoundrel, a blackguard of the worst sort. You have heard of me, murmured Lord Caradice, with every evidence of delight, and he bowed again. Prudence squashed an impulse to giggle at such disgraceful behaviour. She glared at him again. How dare you deceive me as to your true identity? Great Uncle Oswald turned to the Duke. Do you realise, Your Grace, that this, this scoundrel, offered Lord Caradice helpfully. Shagbag. Unshaven lout. Cad. Smoky knave. This 
unmitigated reprobate, continued Great Uncle Oswald, undeterred, had the temerity to introduce himself to me here in this very room by your own title. The Duke glanced at his cousin in inquiry. Actually, I didn't, Lord Caradice said gently. But, began Great Uncle Oswald. Lord Caradice held up a hand. Ungentlemanly as it may be, I must point out that it was your great niece who introduced us. He turned to Prudence. Miss Meridew, you have the floor, I think. His eyes met hers with wicked amusement, belying the earnest, reproachful manner he had adopted. The wretch! Prudence gripped her reticule hard. He was positively delighting in embarrassing her. He had led her most cunningly down the garden path, and was taking quite obvious delight in watching her flounder in her tangled web. The fact that she deserved it didn't make her any less annoyed. She longed to throw something at his handsome face. No wonder he had been not the slightest bit perturbed when she explained the false betrothal rules to him. He'd known all along he couldn't possibly be implicated. Not as the Duke of Dinstable. He'd known that she'd be made to look the veriest simpleton, the most complete nincompoop. Oh, what a fiend! He could have warned her, could have explained, but no, he'd only compounded her errors with his silence. Two can play at that game, my lord. What had the Duke called him? Gideon. Yes, that was it. His first name was Gideon. She blinked innocently back at Lord Caradice, and said in a soft, puzzled voice, But Gideon, dear, I do not understand. She allowed her voice to falter. You mean, you are not really the Duke, and this gentleman is? She gave the real Duke a brave little smile of piteous bewilderment. But... Why would you? She broke off artistically. There was another short silence in the room, as its occupants absorbed the implications of this speech. Too late, Prudence realized that her temper had led her into a worse case than before. Oh, vile deceiver! Great Uncle Oswald leaped to his feet. How dare you dupe an innocent girl in such an appalling manner! Flying under false colors, you cowardly impostor! What a shocking humbug! To try to dazzle an unworldly child by laying claim to a rank not your own. Child? interrupted the Duke of Dinstable. Sixteen she was, when this blackguard first tried his bamboozling ways upon her. Sixteen! The Duke looked at Gideon. Unconcerned, Gideon pulled out a slender sheaf of papers from his coat pocket. He broke the seals and thumbed quickly through them, feigning complete indifference to the discussion at hand. He was enjoying the role of a callous heartbreaker. For once, he was innocent of all accusations. Not that he ever dallied with innocence, it was one of his rules. And he doubted he had ever broken anyone's heart. The ladies he dallied with bore little evidence of a heart. He darted a quick look at Miss Meridew, and his amusement deepened. A most unusual female, gently bred and, he thought, a true innocent, despite her brazenness in entering a strange gentleman's house and claiming a secret betrothal with him, or perhaps because of it. No truly worldly female would have the temerity to try such a simple ruse. He had no idea what bizarre game she was playing, but there was no denying it. The whole thing was vastly amusing. Sir Oswald shook a furious finger at him. Use another man's title to steal the innocent heart from a maiden's tender breast, would you? Gideon tossed the papers carelessly into the coal scuttle, and regarded the maiden's tender breasts with interest, examining their shape and fullness with great pleasure. They were hastily covered with a pair of militantly crossed arms. He lifted his gaze and met a maiden's glaring eyeballs. Her smooth cheeks were flushed, and the tender breasts were now heaving in indignation beneath their green muslin armour. A small slippered foot tapped angrily on the parquetry floor. Gideon chuckled. Prudence had had enough. How dare he, he, look at her in such a manner? She felt hot, breathless, excited, furious. It was time to end this disastrous charade. So she declared. You have been deceiving me. 
Unable to muster a convincing sob, she whipped out a lace handkerchief from her reticule and applied it to her eyes. All of this time, you have been filling my ears with lies. She drew herself up and said with immense dignity, I cannot bear it a moment longer. You are without shame. I could not possibly wed a man of such unsteady character. Lord Caradice, more than her equal in the dramatic arts, slapped a tragic hand across his heart and staggered back a pace and demonstrated wounded to the quick in silence. Great Uncle Oswald watched, frowning. He looked unconvinced. Prudence cast around for some way to end the matter definitively. An idea flew into her mind. She snatched up the papers he had tossed aside so carelessly. My letters, she explained to her great uncle. She turned and brandished them in Lord Caradice's face. You are heartless to flaunt these in my face, to treat them with such cavalier disdain. It is over, Lord Caradice. I want never to see you again. She ripped them up and dashed them into the fire with great panache. Oh, that I was ever foolish enough to give my heart to a rake. The fire smouldered, then flared eagerly as the papers caught. Oh, no, not the billet doux. My love letters, cried Lord Caradice in a choked voice. He leaped toward the fire and snatched in vain at the burning papers. He burned his fingers on one and dropped it with a mild curse. Stunned, Prudence watched him. The shredded sheets of paper curled into twists of flame and ash. He couldn't be serious. Surely they could not be real love letters she had burned. He just glanced at them and cast them into a coal scuttle with a complete lack of interest. Anything thrown into a coal scuttle was meant for burning, wasn't it? And yet he looked so distraught. The hollow feeling in her chest grew. What if they were love letters? Had he tossed them in the coal scuttle as a blind, meaning to collect them later? She'd used all sorts of devious methods of hiding Philip's rare letters from prying eyes. Apart from one special letter that she treasured, his letters weren't romantic. Philip was a prosaic writer, and his letters were usually a short recital of his daily activities. Even so, she'd never tossed even the dullest one into a coal scuttle. Prudence bit her lip. Lord Caradice was staring into the fire watching his letters burn. He looked desolate, completely crushed. Even his giveaway eyes were no longer laughing. She groaned inwardly. Why had she ever considered this mad idea? It had seemed quite simple at the time. There must be insanity in her family. Certainly Grandpapa was eccentric. But even he had never burst into a strange ducal residence, claimed betrothal to the duke, who was really a lord, and apparently a notorious rake as well, and then burned the rake's love letters. Who knew, but the writer of those letters might have reformed him of his rakish behaviour. Love could reform a rake, she had heard. She thought of the one special letter Philip had sent her. You are the sole dream that keeps me going, in this hellhole on earth. Any moment now, Lord Caradice would turn on her in rage abandon his inexplicable charade and explain her outrageous folly to her great-uncle Oswald and the Duke, and then she would have to confess all, and she knew well what would happen then. She would be sent back to Norfolk in disgrace, and then her sisters and she would never escape. Prudence felt sick. She thought she'd come up with such a clever plan, but in fact she had ruined everything. Lord Caradise heaved a huge sigh. It had the effect of drawing everyone's attention back to him. Oh well, it was worth a try, he said in a regretful tone. Prudence guiltily recalled his burned fingers. Even a charred shred of a love letter was better than no love letter at all. I suppose such an imposture was bound to be exposed in the end, he added. Imposture always does come out. He looked at Prudence sadly. Imposture. He was about to expose her. Prudence took a deep breath and braced herself. I apologize for deceiving you, Miss Merridew. Prudence blinked. You cannot mean you did deceive this young lady as to your identity, Gideon. The Duke looked mildly shocked. Lord Caradice shrugged sheepishly. 
I'm such a worthless fribble, you know, Edward. Girls are so much more impressed with your title than mine. The Duke's eyes narrowed, but he said nothing. Prudence held her breath. Great Uncle Oswald finally spoke. You, Sarah, are a disgrace to your name and your class. Telling a filly a few Banbury tales to impress her is one thing. Masquerading as a duke and entering into a secret betrothal is quite another. And this poor trusting little creature has waited for you to speak to her grandpapa or me, as a man should, for nigh on four and a half years. Four and a half years? Four and a half months? Four and a half minutes? Lord Caradice gazed at Prudence soulfully. Time means nothing when one is in love. The Duke frowned, sent a piercing look toward his cousin, then turned his gaze on Prudence. Prudence didn't know whether to kiss Lord Caradice or to strangle him. She was grateful that he had not exposed her. Of course she was. But his talk of love was making things worse again. She had severed the false betrothal, and he was off the hook. If he would only be quiet, she could leave now, and though Great Uncle Oswald would be angry, it might not be the complete disaster she had feared a few moments before. Come, Great Uncle Oswald, let us leave, she said in a low voice. I have no desire to have my folly any further discussed. My betrothal is at an end. No harm has been done, and I would be grateful if we could depart at once. She took the old man's arm and tried to steer him toward the door, but Great Uncle Oswald refused to budge. He glared from Lord Caradice to the Duke and back. So, that's it then, is it? Nobody responded. Prudence tugged at his arm in vain. You engage yourself to my great niece in a dashed havy cavy manner under a false title. You keep the girl dangling for four years. Then I find you meeting her in secret alone and unchaperoned. No, no, I brought Lily with me. Great Uncle Oswald dismissed her maid with a wave of his hand. In the hallway doesn't count. And there was the butler. He was with us almost all the time, Prudence added desperately. Pah! Butlers can be bought! An affronted snort came from outside the door. Lord Caradice grinned. Bry Bartlett! But he's so expensive. Be that as it may, said Great Uncle Oswald. The girl has been compromised enough by— No, no, cried Prudence, realizing Great Uncle Oswald was about to insist on marriage. There is no question of compromise. I utterly refuse. The betrothal is off. I cannot marry a man such as— such as— this. Unable to think of any sufficiently damning epithet, she gestured at Lord Caradice in disgust. She looked at him hard, willing him to take up her lead. Surely he would. Lord Caradice opened his mouth to speak. Prudence relaxed a little. What if I shave? he said. I look much better when I'm shaved. My cousin will vouch for that. Do I not look almost handsome when I shave, Edward? He didn't wait for the Duke's reply, but turned earnestly back to Prudence. Do you think you could marry me if I shaved? The Duke frowned and stared at Lord Caradice intently. Lord Caradice ignored him. The man was impossible. Prudence glared at him. No, she snapped. I would not marry you if you were the last man left alive in the world. You are a complete, an utter... She waved her hands in frustration, but the words would not come. All she could think of was shagbag, or scoundrel, or unshaven lout, or smoky knave, and if she uttered those words, she knew she would be completely undone. It was impossible. The whole thing had got completely out of control. She had tried everything she could think of, and now she could see only one way out of her current predicament. So she fainted. It was quite a good feint, she thought, being unplanned and the first she had ever attempted. It certainly put an end to the ridiculous conversation about her betrothal to Lord Caradice. The only trouble was that she should perhaps have signalled her imminent collapse to Great Uncle Oswald, a sigh or a small gasp of feminine distress, perhaps. Elderly men clearly found it not to their liking to be the recipient of an unexpectedly falling female. 
Great Uncle Oswald staggered and gasped under her weight. He seemed in imminent danger of dropping her to the floor. It may have been a miscalculation on her part to fall toward him, instead of collapsing gracefully into insensibility onto Cleopatra's barge. It took all her control to maintain the illusion of insensibility as she felt herself slipping. And then, with shocking suddenness, she was snatched from disaster by a pair of muscular arms. She was only just able to prevent herself from squeaking as she was lifted bodily off the floor and clasped securely against a broad, masculine chest. It was not Great Uncle Oswald's chest. It was not the Duke's. Prudence hoped very much it was the butler, Bartlett, who was holding her with such apparent effortlessness, but Bartlett had seemed more cushionesque than otherwise. She sniffed surreptitiously. There was no telltale scent of musk. There was, she sniffed again, just to be sure, a faint aroma of spirits and tobacco, a tang of soap and starch from his linen, and most intriguing of all, the scent of... She was hard put to recognize it, but it was most appealing. Could it be the scent of a rake? Reluctantly, Prudence allowed her mind to recognize what her body had known instantly. It was Lord Caradice who had snatched her thus, against whose chest she was nestled. It was a very broad and comforting chest, she had to admit. She felt an overwhelming desire to curl up against it forever. But apart from the fact that she had no business feeling anything so shocking, she knew that within that chest beat a heart that was quite without proper feeling of any kind. Great Uncle Oswald had called him a famous, nay, an infamous rake, a scoundrel, and a reprobate, and he hadn't denied it. He'd even seemed quite proud of having such a dreadful reputation. It seemed quite conclusive. And Prudence had the evidence of her own eyes that he took nothing seriously. He ought to have been shocked by her wicked forwardness. Instead, he had casually entangled them both even further in deception, embroidering on her initial lie with merry abandon, adding layers and layers of further complication without, apparently, a thought for the consequences. She did not excuse her own part in creating the lie in the first place, but she at least had been driven by desperation. He seemed to have joined in for... for fun. He'd even taken most shocking advantage of her duplicity by using it to steal a kiss. Moreover, a kiss that had not only taken her by surprise, but that had undermined her own sense of ladylike behaviour. She could not quite rid herself of the suspicion that she had pressed herself against him in quite a forward manner, and there was no denying that the experience, though shocking, had been pleasurable. There had been several instants after he'd stopped kissing her before she'd remembered to push him away. And those dark, wickedly dancing eyes told her he knew it. Every time he looked at her, it was most ungentlemanly of him. He seemed to have very few notions of gentlemanly behaviour. In fact, judging by his demeanour throughout, he seemed to thrive on deception. She supposed rakes must, else how would they be rakes? Ladies surely did not wish to be ruined. There would have to be deception or trickery involved, wouldn't there? She sighed, feeling the very appealing strength of the arms that held her. It was suddenly much clearer to Prudence how an otherwise virtuous lady might find herself wishing to be ruined. She waited for him to put her down, knowing that a pony girl had to be too heavy for any man to carry for more than a few seconds. So she held her breath, and waited, and waited and he showed no sign of needing to do so. Prudence had never felt so delightfully delicate and feminine in her life. She knew she was not, of course, but the sensation was indescribable. It was a very good thing that gentlemen in general were not encouraged to carry ladies about, otherwise there would be even more sin in the world than there was already, she decided. She kept her eyes firmly closed, lying limp against his chest, in absolute certainty of his strength supporting her. If she looked up, she knew she would find herself looking into a pair of dark, laughing eyes, and from this distance she would find him extremely difficult to resist, and that would be fatal. She dangled bonelessly in his arms and listened to the flurry of activity around her. Bartlett had apparently produced some feathers and was wishing to burn them under her nose. 
Lord Carradice objected to that, saying the smell of burned feathers disgusted him. Bartlett said that was the point. Lord Carradice responded that he did not wish to be disgusted at such an ungodly hour, that he had had quite enough to deal with as it was, and that Bartlett would oblige him by putting the feathers away and fetching a glass of water instead. Bartlett sniffed. The scent of musk receded, and Prudence concluded that he had gone to fetch the water. Uncle Oswald was searching through Prudence's reticule, muttering that women's indispositions were very disconcerting things for a man to deal with, very disconcerting, and why the deuce wasn't she carrying her dratted smelling salts? The Duke, it appeared, had fetched Prudence's maid, and seemed to be expecting Lily to do something, but Lily, overwhelmed by the grand company in which she found herself, said to the Duke over and over again, "'I dunno, to be sure, Your Highness. She ain't never fainted before.' Prudence felt another giggle coming on. She stifled it, and abruptly felt herself squeezed, in the most alarmingly exciting manner. If you dare to laugh now, I shall drop you in the fire, along with my tailor's bills," he murmured under his breath, his mouth against her ear. You have carried the whole thing off beautifully, but if you giggle, you shall ruin everything. He knew she was feigning insensibility, and yet he continued to hold her in this shockingly intimate fashion. Prudence stiffened with indignation and then the meaning of his words sank in. His tailor's bills, the love letters he had tried so heart-rendingly to rescue from the flames, were his tailor's bills. She compressed her quivering lips together hard. Oh, he was a devil to be sure. She had felt so guilty at burning them. His tailor's bills. Put me down at once, she hissed through stiff lips. He made no move to do so. Instead, he jiggled her in his arms in a most provocative fashion. Put her down at once! Great Uncle Oswald's voice echoed her words uncannily. Oh, there's no danger of me dropping her, said Lord Carradice casually, and jiggled her again. I'm merely trying to get more air in her lungs. Oh, well, if you insist, I shall place her here, on the settee. Prudence felt herself being lowered onto something long and padded. Cleopatra's barge, she thought. As his arms released her, she sighed. With relief, she told herself. Should we not fetch a carriage and take her home? said the Duke's soft voice. Yes, yes, her sisters will know what to do, exclaimed Great Uncle Oswald in obvious relief. He sounded quite flustered. Ladies' indispositions best left to ladies, after all. You, girl, whatever your name is, see to your mistress while— Damn it! I sent the carriage home. Thought I'd be here longer. He turned to the Duke. It will have to be a hackney, if one can be procured, but your man will need to inspect it first. The last time I used a hackney, it stank shockingly of onions. And check the seats. If my great niece is to lie on the seats. Oh, hang it. I'll inspect it myself. I need some fresh air after all this botheration. He turned back to Lily and barked. Don't leave her side for a moment, gal. Y yes Sir Oswald. In her mind's eye, Prudence could see Lily bobbing a curtsy. She heard the Duke and Great Uncle Oswald leave the room. Silence fell. She was alone then, with Lord Carradice and Lily. Prudence lay still, her eyes tightly closed, trying to decide when would be the best time to make her recovery. She had no wish to allow Great Uncle Oswald to have second thoughts about her so-called broken betrothal with the false Duke. Lord Carradice. On the other hand, she did not think she could cope with being carried out to the carriage by Lord Carradice. It was too… unsettling. Motionless, eyes closed and breathing gently, Prudence considered her options. Cleopatra's barge was surprisingly comfortable. She was lolling on it, she realized suddenly, and had to suppress a spurt of laughter. Lily, is it? I wonder. Could I trouble you to pop out to the kitchen and desire Mrs. Henderson, the housekeeper, to give you a bottle of smelling salts?" said Lord Carradice, in a soft, deep voice that was all liquid charm. Oh, er, well, sir, it's just— Lily hesitated. Lord Carradice chuckled. You don't think I'm going to do your mistress any harm? 
Do you, Lily? His voice was pure dark honey. Prudence stiffened. No woman could resist that voice, let alone a simple country maid like Lily. She decided to give Lily an incentive to stay, and moaned a little, as if she were about to come around. Look there, said Lord Caradise instantly. See, she is coming too. Run and fetch those smelling salts instantly. There's a good girl. But Sir Oswald said, shouldn't I stay? What if she should fall over again, Lily? You would not be able to catch her, a frail little creature like yourself. I think I had better stay. Frail little creature indeed, thought Prudence furiously. Lily was a good fourteen stone at least, and had been known to knock a cheeky footman on his ears with one blow. Oh, he was a rake indeed, wickedness incarnate. There was not a word of truth in him. Yes, of course, sir murmured Lily in a dazed, adoring voice. That would be best. I'll fetch those smelling salts, sir. No trouble at all. And perhaps a reviving cordial, suggested Lord Caradice in a solicitous voice. Mrs. Henderson will know which one. The room fell silent. Prudence felt a sudden warmth against her leg. He'd had the cheek to seat himself on the settee right beside her. So close beside her, in fact, that she could feel the heat of his body right through her skirts. Cautiously, she opened her eyes, and immediately found herself gazing up into the darkest, most alive pair of eyes she had ever beheld in her life. He bent over her, his hands gripping the gilt edging of Cleopatra's barge on either side of her, not actually touching her, but imprisoning her all the same. If she tried to sit up, she would have to push against him, and she already knew his strength. She had never in her adult life been carried so effortlessly. Feeling better, he smiled down at her. There ought to be a law against smiles like that, Prudence thought dazedly. But he had no doubt smiled in just such a caressing way at her impressionable maid. She rallied her defences. You know perfectly well that I didn't faint. In fact, you should be grateful to me for it. Oh, indeed I am, he said, grinning irrepressibly, and somehow she just knew he was recalling the shocking way he had jiggled her in his arms. Prudence tried to strain away from him, pressing into the padding on the settee. She felt completely breathless. His eyes smiled knowingly at her, as if he could somehow read her secret thoughts and desires, as if he knew they were at war with her principles. In defence, she dropped her gaze to his mouth. It was a very nice mouth, she thought breathlessly. Finely chiselled and made, it seemed, for laughter, and for kissing. She glanced up at him again and instantly took fright. Go away, she wriggled and thrust her hands against his broad, warm chest. Let me up. It's no use you looking at me like that, he said softly. It's far too late to attempt escape. And with that, he lowered his mouth to hers. Chapter 5 Oh, nothing is more alluring than a levy from a couch in some confusion. William Congreve It was not like the first kiss he had given her, that swift, startling, stolen kiss that had wiped her mind as blank as a new slate and left her lips tingling many minutes afterwards, this was altogether more, more, just more. She had been kissed before, yes, but not like this, not with the whole mouth. His lips were firm and sure, effortlessly robbing her of her will, domination by pleasure. His tongue was like warm velvet, stroking, seeking. She could taste him. She tasted the brandy he had drunk a short time before. But beneath that, there was hot, dark, irresistible enticement. With each stroke, Prudence's resolution dissolved a little more. Without conscious volition, her body arched against him, her fingers tangled in his hair. She ought to stop this, but whatever it was that he was doing seemed to have robbed her mind of every coherent principle and all resolve. It was magic. It was bound to be sinful. It was. 
Prudence could not think. She could only hold on to him helplessly, entranced. A sensation swamped her. His tongue moved in a slow, relentless rhythm. A feverish rush of pleasure engulfed her. She'd never felt like this. Her mouth and body possessed, fueled by heat and magic. After a moment, Prudence realized he had stopped kissing her. She battled to marshal her wits, but all she could do was blink and stare at his mouth, so close to hers, and wonder at the turmoil it had caused within her, was causing still. Who would believe what mere lips could do, and tongue? She flushed again, as a wave of heat passed through her. She fought for breath, battling to regain her composure, aware of his looming physicality, his hot gaze upon her, still scorching her awareness, so that she was unable to look up. Unable to look anywhere, in fact, except at his disheveled cravat. Only she could not help seeing his mouth as well. She hadn't realized a man's mouth could be so masculine, and yet so beautiful as well. She thought about the way that mouth had transported her, and closed her eyes for a brief moment. The scent of him teased her senses. Would she ever be able to forget it after this? A faint odor of brandy, and cologne, and man, and desire. He'd imprisoned her in a cage made of his body, and hers. Each place their bodies touched, burning into her consciousness like a hot iron. His hard right hip pressed against the softness of her thigh. His strong arms were braced on either side of her, one long fingered hand resting against her shoulder, the other so close beside her left cheek that she could feel its warmth. If she only turned her head a little, her face would be resting on his hand. He bent over her, his chest just inches from hers, and he was breathing heavily, raggedly, as if he had just run a race and each time he breathed in, his waistcoat just brushed her breasts. Each faint, feather-like sensation sent a quiver right through her body, all the way to her toes. Prudence held her breath and closed her eyes. She had no desire to escape. She knew she ought to, but she felt so deliciously languid, and yet hot, flustered, and tense with expectation at the same time. She opened her eyes again and forced herself to look at him, she had to see, to know what he was thinking. He was staring down at her, for once no gleam of humour in those dark, dark eyes. He seemed almost... shaken. A faint frown creased the space between his brows. His gaze pinned her, intense, slightly puzzled, as if she were some enigma, some mystery. Who the devil are you, Miss Prudence Meridue? he murmured. Like a bucket of icy water dashed against her overheated skin, his question brought her back to her senses. She focused with all her might. I'm sorry, Lord Caradice. I didn't mean to cause anyone any trouble, she said in a shaky voice, suddenly perilously near to tears. I lied to protect my real betrothed. He is a younger son with meagre prospects and dependent on my great-uncle's goodwill. That's not what I meant. His voice was deep and vibrated through her body. She felt suddenly breathless and took an abrupt, shaky breath. Dazed by the turmoil of feelings, she groped for some sort of composure, swallowed, for her mouth was unaccountably dry, and licked her lips. A mistake, she realized instantly, for his gaze heated and his mocking, beautiful mouth twisted with an unknown emotion, and before she could say a word, she was being kissed once more. Prudence felt her body rise to meet his. Her mouth opened to receive the hot, spicy heat of him, and as the dark vortex of sensation whirled around her consciousness again, the cool texture of his waistcoat and the cold metal of the buttons bit into the thin fabric covering her breasts. The heat and power of his body radiated through the clothes, and she quivered again, a long shudder of awareness. Suddenly his hand was on her breast, caressing, teasing, causing the most exquisite sensations to ripple and shudder through her. She trembled and sighed under his hand, and he groaned softly. It was the groan that did it. It sounded to Prudence's ears like the purr of a self-satisfied cat, an extremely self-satisfied cat, deep and low, 
seductive and wicked. It brought her to a shocked awareness of what she was doing. Here she was, in a strange man's house, a strange duke's house, lying in an abandoned manner on a decadent Egyptian sofa, receiving the most intimate and shocking liberties from a man whom she had only just met. A man, moreover, who was a known rake, a man whom she had seen for herself cared nothing for the usual proprieties or canons of good behaviour, and he knew she was betrothed. Good grief! What had she allowed him to do? She did not even know him, and what she did know should have been enough to make her shun him. He had deceived her, lied about his identity, mocked her great-uncle. He was dishevelled, carelessly dressed. His chin was rough with bristles. Prudence tried not to think of how deliciously abrasive those bristles had felt against her skin. He had been out carousing all night. He drank brandy at breakfast time. The sharp, hot taste of his brandy was now in her mouth. She felt the blood rise in her cheeks at the thought of it. He was a well-known rake, and Prudence Meridue, within minutes of meeting him, had allowed him unimaginable intimacies. His hand even now stroked her thigh through her thin dress. The other one cupped her breast, his long fingers rubbing, teasing, and worst of all, worst of all, was not that she'd allowed it, it was that she liked it, more than liked it. Women are nothing but weak, untrustworthy vessels, slaves to their base animal instincts. Grandpapa's voice echoed in her mind. Prudence froze. She had fought against Grandpapa and his horrid strictures all her life. She was no weak vessel, no helpless female. She was a slave to no one, and nothing. She'd prided herself on it. Yet now look at her, sprawled helplessly beneath a man who had just taken the most shocking liberties, and she was wishing, most wickedly, for more, even though she was betrothed. How could a decent betrothed woman possibly enjoy the illicit advances of a stranger? All her principles and resolve had simply gone up in smoke, vanquished by the casual skill of a rake. He bent and kissed her again. His tongue lapped at her closed mouth, his teeth nipped gently at her lower lip, demanding entrance. And her body longed to open to him, allow him whatever he wanted, slaves to their base animal instincts. It was not her first experience of her base animal instinct, but Prudence would be no man's slave. She'd been taken unawares, but she was a woman of principle. Or she tried to be. She pushed his face away. Unhand me, sir, Prudence said crisply. I wish to get up. Unfortunately, the words came out feebly, almost dreamily, and with a complete lack of conviction. She was mortified to realize her hand still cupped his face. She could not seem to let go. He took a deep breath, blinked, stared down at her, and the look in his eyes made her gasp. He seemed to shake himself, then his expression changed. It was as if a shutter came over his eyes. That gleam of laughter returned. He sat back a little, took another deep breath, and, unforgivably, chuckled. I doubt if you can stand yet. There was knowledge and self-satisfied male pride in his eyes, as well as amusement and a certain careless possessiveness. He thought her his for the taking. The realization galvanized her resolve like nothing else could. He might be a rake, but Prudence Meridue was not a loose woman, even if she had behaved like one for a moment or two, or three. Good heavens! At any minute Lily or that odious butler, not to mention Great Uncle Oswald and the Duke, could walk into the room and find her carousing with a known rake. She would rather die than allow that to happen. I said, unhand me, sir! This time her voice sounded much more crisp and authoritative, she noted with satisfaction. Even if her body was still feeling deliciously languid and shivery and enjoying the sensations of his arms around her far too much. He smiled, shook his head provocatively, and tightened his hold. He leaned down, clearly intending to kiss her senseless once more. She could not allow it, not even one kiss, much as her body might crave it. 
She simply had to break away from his possession of her. The longer she stayed in such intimate contact with him, the feebler her resolve, and the stronger the desire to feel his mouth on hers again. Prudence panicked. Let me up. I have had quite enough of your manhandling, Sarah. Her tone was pure Great Uncle Oswald, she reflected, but it was the best she could do. His brow quirked. Manhandling? Prudence flushed. I wish to stand up, sir. I am no longer, uh, indisposed. She could not quite meet his eyes. But it's been so delightful, uh, reviving you like this. Are you sure you are, uh, recovered? He purred provocatively. That did it. He was playing a rakish game. All of Prudence's resolve rallied. Set me free, sir! She raised her hands to push him back. Her reticule, still attached by the strings to her wrist, bumped against her arm. No, he grinned. I think you require a little more, uh, reviving. Please let me up! He shook his head. Then, if you will not do the gentlemanly thing... Prudence said sweetly, and hit him over the head with her reticule. It collided against his skull with a most satisfactory clunk. Grace had used very good quality pasteboard, and had lacquered over the heathenish Egyptian designs very thoroughly. Ow! Blast it! What? She tried to push him away, but he kept her imprisoned still. She hit him again. Damn it! He lifted a hand to ward off the reticule, and his grip on her loosened. Prudence took the opportunity to reel out from beneath the cage of his body and slide awkwardly to the floor. She stood up and found her knees a little wobbly, so she retreated behind an ebony inlaid desk and used it to support herself unobtrusively. How dare you, you, assault me like that? Assault you? He rubbed his head. You have the nerve to accuse me of assault after attacking me with that blasted thing. What the devil is it anyway? Prudence ignored him. I am not for the likes of you, Lord Caradice. Lord Caradice stopped rubbing his forehead for a moment. He looked at her with spaniel dark eyes and said with mock reproach, Now, Prudence, I thought it was apparent to both of us that you like the likes of me. And then he grinned in an infuriatingly appealing way. Prudence ignored the appeal and concentrated on being infuriated. Well, you are wrong. I most emphatically do not like the likes of you, she said in what she trusted was a convincing tone. A devilish look came into his eyes, and he prowled toward her. I'm certain you are mistaken. I think we should test that theory again. Oh, heavens, he was going to kiss her again. His eyes had that hot look of dark intent she was beginning to recognize. She could not let him touch her, Prudence retreated behind the table. Stop that at once. I am not for you, Lord Caradice. He looked crushed, most unconvincingly. Oh, but after all we have meant to each other, I told you I am betrothed, Prudence reiterated in desperation. Oh, yes, so you are. I quite forgot. Lord Caradice grinned, rubbing his head again. You are engaged to the Duke of Dinstable, or me, or some younger son with no prospects. I forget which. You know perfectly well I was never engaged to either you or the Duke, Prudence snapped. As I explained, it was... it was a mistake. Not removing that blasted reticule from your wrist was the mistake, said Lord Caradice in an aggrieved voice. What the deuce is it made of? Wood? pasteboard. Though I do not know what concern it is of yours. It's my concern if I get biffed over the head by it. It has a dozen sharp corners and is as heavy as lead, and besides which it is damn, uh, deuced ugly. Why the devil you must carry a thing that weighs a ton and is absolutely hideous to boot is quite beyond me. The reason I carry it should be obvious even to you, Prudence retorted waspishly. A girl clearly needs a strong reticule in London, does she not? Especially when she comes visiting. Besides, it is not hideous. 
It was a gift, a labor of love by my little sister, and therefore is to me much more beautiful and valuable than all the hideously expensive furniture in this decadent, horrible room. Oh, I quite agree. Prudence looked at him through narrowed eyes. She trusted his instant agreement, not a whit. He grinned unrepentantly. The furniture is horrible. Edward's mother had it all done up, like a pharaoh's dinner, some seven or eight years ago, in the expectation of him entering London society, but then, for reasons we shall not go into, it all came to naught, and here is this house, filled to the brim with hideous furniture, that is now quite out of date. And the worst thing is, Edward has no interest in furniture, so he leaves it like this, to lacerate the sensibilities of people of taste. At least you have an excuse for carrying that frightful reticule, since it was foisted upon you by an infant. Grace is not an infant, and it was not foisted on me. Besides, I happen to be very fond. She stopped herself and took a deep breath, mastering her temper with difficulty. We will not speak of my reticule, she said with dignity. My reticule is not the issue here. Tell that to these bruises. She could not prevent herself glancing at his forehead. There were indeed several faint red marks, where a pasteboard corner had dented his skin. Guiltily, she met his gaze, only to find laughter spilling from wicked dark eyes. There was not a trace of a contrition in the wretch. Prudence opened her mouth to speak. She would wipe that confident smile off his face. Ah, I see you have quite recovered, the Duke interrupted from the doorway. Prudence wondered how long he had been standing there. Something about his expression, a lurking expression of stifled amusement, made her think he might have observed more of her dealings with Lord Caradice than she would wish anyone to witness. She felt an embarrassed flush rise. Yes, your colour is returning, the Duke murmured in a voice of such blandness that it confirmed her suspicions. Sir Oswald has finally managed to procure a satisfactory hackney cab, and your maid-servant awaits you in the hall with some smelling salts. And your betrothed will escort you to the door, Lord Caradice added affably, if you will just inform us which of us he is. He extended his arm to her in a mockery of polite behaviour. The man was impossible. You know perfectly well I am not betrothed to either of you. Prudence lifted her chin, and prepared to march out the door. Lord Caradice laid a restraining hand on her arm. Oh, but if you've been pining for me for the last four and a half years, I really think you deserve a fiancé. Pining? Prudence was outraged. I would never indulge in such spineless behaviour, and even if I did, I would never pine for you, Lord Caradice, as you very well know. Oh, but now you have come to know me so much better. He waggled his eyebrows at her. You will pine, Prudence. You will. It was an outrageous thing to say, especially when she could still feel the imprint of his mouth on hers, and the taste of him. Prudence glanced from his dancing eyes to the long, strong hand lightly clasping her arm. He was quite incorrigible, and impossibly charming. But she would not be charmed for the amusement of a light-hearted rake. Oh, will you release me? She said crossly. No, never, my heart. I never release my betrothed, he said soulfully. Oh, stop it! I told you the truth, she snapped, tugging unsuccessfully at her arm. She turned to the Duke and explained hastily. I am deeply sorry for the imposition, Your Grace. For the last four and a half years I truly have been betrothed to a man called Philip Otterbury, and Lord Caradice knows why I was unable to tell my great-uncle about it. She tugged again to free her hand from Lord Caradice's grip. Now will you let me go? And with that she swung her reticule at his head for the fourth time. Gideon was better prepared this time, releasing her arm. He ducked, and the cardboard sarcophagus bounced harmlessly off his shoulder. He looked up, laughing, to see her storming out of the house with not a backward glance. A moment later, he heard the front door slam. That, the Duke said thoughtfully, is a most unusual young lady. Gideon grimaced ruefully. She is indeed. 
I don't believe I have ever seen a female repulse you so decidedly. No. Gideon rubbed his jaw. I find it rather refreshing. Yes, well, you would. It is that perverse streak in the pen teeths. The Duke smiled absent-mindedly. I collect that despite the farrago of nonsense her elderly relative was spouting, your acquaintance with the girl is of recent duration. Gideon chuckled and glanced at the clock on the mantel. Yes, recent is the word. I would say I've known Miss Prudence Merridew for all of about forty minutes. The Duke arched an eyebrow. She is not one of your... Uh... Gideon laughed again. Oh, good Lord, no. She is not one of my errs. You should know better than that, Edward. My errs may be many and various, but they are never young innocents, and without doubt Miss Prudence is a young innocent. Besides, no self-respecting err would dream of enacting such a ludicrous scene. The Duke nodded. Yes, I thought she was not your usual type. Do you, uh, have an interest in her yourself, Gideon? Gideon looked blank for a moment. He opened his mouth, then closed it. He frowned, thought for a minute, opened his mouth again, then closed it. Then he shrugged carelessly. You know I have no interest in innocence. Are you sure? Yes, of course I'm sure. Gideon snapped, irritated. Why do you ask? If you have no interest in her, I may decide to pursue my acquaintance with Miss Merridew. Gideon glanced up sharply. Good God! Why? Have you so soon forgotten the reason for my trip to London? Gideon scowled, crossed one leg over the other, and smoothed the fabric of his buff pantaloons with elaborate care. Of course not. You have dragged yourself away from your beloved moors and mountains with some ludicrous desire to thrust your head into a matrimonial noose. Edward smiled gently. If I choose properly, it will be no noose. Gideon snorted. Properly? How can you choose properly? How can anyone, man or woman, choose properly? Do you and I not have the evidence of our own lives that marriage is no safe choice for anyone, man or woman? Yes, but no one knows what they're getting themselves into when they wed. The mere notion of choice is one of fate's nastier jokes. Yes, perhaps, but still it must be done. Gideon snorted. Mine is an ancient name, cousin. There is that, and the dukedom to be considered. My own wishes and fears are unimportant by comparison. I have a duty to marry. So do you, though I know you have set your mind against it. Gideon snorted again. Duty. The duke continued. So far as choosing a wife is concerned, I have thought the matter over very carefully, in order that I may minimize the risk. Naturally, I do not want a beautiful bride. We both know why. A plain and convenient bride will suit me, someone I can simply be friends with. If there are no strong emotions on either side, all risks will be minimized. Besides, beautiful women make me nervous. Gideon frowned. Yes, I know. So why do you speak of pursuing an acquaintance with Miss Merridew? The Duke looked at his cousin in surprise. She is no beauty, at any rate. Gideon sat up. What? She's no commonplace society belle. I grant you that, but... Indeed, quite the contrary. I find her most comfortably ordinary. Ordinary? Gideon was disgusted. Good God, man! What the devil's the matter with you? You said yourself she was refreshingly unusual. Yes, of course, Edward murmured in a bland voice. I mean, ordinary-looking. Almost plain. Plain? Is there something wrong with your eyes? She's not the slightest bit plain. Those eyes, that smile, that hair, from top to toe. Prudence Merridew is a rare little gem. A gem, you say? The Duke observed his cousin thoughtfully and smiled. Quite. I phrased it badly. At any rate, she doesn't make me nervous. More for you, then. Gideon rubbed his head feelingly. She makes me damn nervous. Never know what the chit is going to do next. 
he subsided into a chair with a faint reminiscent grin. Edward steepled his fingers carefully and said, She seemed to have an interest in dukes. I see no reason why I should not allow her to pursue it. Gideon looked narrowly at his cousin. I wouldn't refine too much upon it, if I were you. I cannot be sure whether she thinks she wishes to marry a duke, or whether she wishes not to marry a duke, but whatever it is, you shall put her from your mind forthwith, Edward. But if she is interested in dukes, what a happy coincidence. I am a duke, after all, come to London to further my acquaintance with the female sex. It was your idea, Gideon, if you recall. I must have been cast away at the time. Miss Merridew is the only female I have met in London so far. That shall soon be remedied. And since she is refreshingly unlike the females I have met in the past, I think I shall call on her and Sir Oswald this afternoon. It is a very bad idea, Gideon said firmly. Why? Gideon groped for an acceptable reason why his very wealthy, very eligible cousin should not make a respectable call on an unmarried lady of the ton in the company of her great-uncle. I believe her to be deranged, he said finally. The duke's mouth twitched, but he responded solemnly. Ah, you think so? Gideon stood up and took several paces around the room. Well, of course she is. She comes here, uninvited, at the crack of dawn, half past nine. Exactly, the crack of dawn, claiming to be betrothed to you. Then she mistakes me for you, and then, as soon as her great uncle arrives, she rails at me for a faithless beast, snatches up my tailor's bills, rips them up in my face, and dashes them into the fire. Finally, not to be outdone, she stages a faint, and when I save her from falling and try to resuscitate her, what does she do? Biffs me over the ear with a hideous miniature Egyptian coffin that weighs a ton, announces she is engaged to some other blasted fellow, and storms out. There was a short silence, as both men recalled the scene. Yes, agreed the Duke calmly. As I said, refreshing the unusual. The cousins glanced at each other, and as one, collapsed into laughter. After a time, the Duke rang for coffee to be brought in. They drank it in silence, each man pondering the events of the morning. Gideon could not stop thinking about the kisses he had stolen from Miss Prudence Meridew, or rather, his own reaction to them. For a few seconds he'd felt like a callow boy, out of his depth, stirred more deeply by a simple kiss from an unknown girl than anything had ever stirred him before. It drew him like a magnet. It fascinated him. It terrified him. Another cup, Gideon? With difficulty, Gideon forced himself back to the present. Not for me, thank you. He yawned. I'm for my bed. I shall see you this evening. We go to... where is it? He frowned and then pulled a face. Oh, Lord, yes. Almax. No, Almax is tomorrow night. The Duke reminded him. I have a little time yet before I must gird my loins, screw my courage to the sticking place, and offer myself up to the matchmaking mamas at Almax. Shakespeare at the crack of dawn. Gideon shuddered. Vile habit. And if you had any consideration, cousin mine, you would not mention matchmaking mamas. You need not go to Almax if you don't care for it. I don't care for it at all, as you very well know. But we do need to go there. You want to meet eligible young ladies, and Almax is stuffed to the ceiling with them. Indeed. But I don't need you to hold my hand, you know. I am quite capable of braving the terrors of the marriage mart by myself, though it is kind of you to offer. Besides, I may not need to brave Almax at all. I told you, I have a mind to further my acquaintance with Miss Prudence Meridew, said the Duke guilelessly, and lifted his coffee cup to his lips. Gideon frowned. Miss Prudence married you wouldn't suit you at all. You say you want a nice, steady, plain, quiet girl. She's none of those. And she has a frightful temper. You should have seen the way she ripped into me for offering an aesthetic judgment on that blasted ugly reticule, all because the damn thing was made by her little sister. I mean, 
If I had a sister who perpetuated such artistic atrocities, I wouldn't go around brandishing them in public, let alone attacking harmless fellows for the crime of being honest. Edward chuckled. Gideon shook his head earnestly. No, no, you may laugh, but Edward be warned. The girl might have a sweet face and a bucket load of charm, but underneath she's a regular little shrew. Whereas, he gestured with one hand like a stage magician producing a rabbit from a hat, there are dozens of females at Almax, most of them nice, steady, quiet girls, some as dull as ditchwater, if that's what you really want. And since you have no desire for a beautiful bride, and I don't at all blame you for that, I can even introduce you to some positive antidotes, if you want. And almost all the girls at Almax will be plainer, richer, and altogether more eligible for your purposes than Miss Prudence Meridew. Oh, I am not such a high stickler, the Duke smiled tranquilly. And I don't care for an antidote for a bride. No, Miss Prudence Meridew is interesting. And you know, I formed the impression that she would like to marry a Duke. So, if I can avoid hurling myself into the fray of the marriage mart. She has no idea of what she wants, snapped Gideon, and neither do you. She is not the woman for you, Edward. The Duke clapped his hands. Famous. I never thought to see this moment, and to think I always considered London to be so dull. Oh, cousin mine, how the mighty have fallen. Gideon rolled his eyes. Pah! You know I am not in the market for a wife. I have no taste for marriage, duty or not. I might, perhaps, indulge myself in mild flirtation, but that is all. And you know perfectly well I do not make sport of youthful innocence. His cousin inclined his head. I do know it, dear boy. That is what makes the whole thing so very interesting. Gideon scowled, but said nothing. Edward was wrong. Nobody had fallen anywhere. She might have stirred him unexpectedly, but he was not going to pursue the matter. He did not need to be stirred. He did not wish to be stirred. He was content with his life as it was. To further his acquaintance with Miss Prudence Meridew would be courting disaster. He was far too sensible to do that. And then, of course, there is the Otterbury factor, added the Duke. You believed her, Gideon said scornfully. A moment before she was claiming to be betrothed to the Duke of Dinstable, and you know how genuine that was. This is just another one of her faradiddles, the Duke shrugged. Sounded genuine to me. Certain note of conviction in her voice. Nonsense. She was just putting me in my place. Yes, the Duke smiled, adding. It worked too, didn't it? Gideon shoved his hands in his pockets, crossed his legs at the ankle, and glowered at his gleaming hessian boots. It had worked, damn it. Their little sparring match had stirred his blood. No woman had ever repulsed him so vigorously, particularly after being kissed. And he had to admit he was intrigued, or he might have been, if he wasn't being sensible. The Duke chuckled. I don't believe she pulled that name out of a hat. One doesn't keep names like Otterbury in hats. Sounded to me like it burst out of her, like, like some secret she's been keeping for a long time. Perhaps for four years. Four and a half, Gideon scowled and hunched down in his chair. There was substance to what his cousin said. Otterbury. She had tossed the name down like a gauntlet and stormed out. Could she really be betrothed to a man called Otterbury? Not that he was interested, of course. Merely curious, as anyone might be. Otterbury must be completely ineligible. A sit, perhaps. Someone hopelessly below her in station. Whatever his station, he had to be someone damn special for a woman like Prudence Meridew to wait for him for four and a half years. The Duke rose and patted his cousin's cheek provocatively as he passed. Sweet dreams, dearest cuz. Damn your eyes, Edward, responded Gideon absent-mindedly. The Duke left, chuckling softly. Gideon, lost in thought, stared at his boots. Chapter 6 I hope you do not think me prone to an iteration of nuptials. William Congreve 
The carriage rolled away from the Duke's residence. Now, Missy, I want an explanation for this extraordinary... Prudence rolled her eyes silently in the direction of Lily, sitting tense and upright on the leather seat beside her, a wooden expression on her face. But Great Uncle Oswald was made of sterner stuff. To men of his upbringing and generation, servants did not count. Well? I shall explain all when we get home, dear Great Uncle Oswald, Prudence murmured. Only, I am still feeling a little... Her voice died away and she lifted the vinaigrette to her nose, a silent reminder of her recent episode of feminine delicacy. Humph! <laughs> Great Uncle Oswald subsided. Prudence closed her eyes, snatching at the brief reprieve. She needed to come up with a way out of this mess, fast. Her small, simple plan had spiralled quite out of control. Besides, her indisposition was not completely feigned. At the moment, she could barely think straight, her whole body was still trembling. With righteous indignation, she told herself. Of course she was upset. Who wouldn't be mauled in such a... a lascivious manner by a perfect stranger? A perfect rake. Although perfect was the wrong word. He was by no means perfect at all. Her legs were still trembling, and her hands. Even her insides seemed to be quivering. Not surprising she told herself firmly. She'd had to use her reticule to defend her honour. Any gently-born lady would be unsettled after such an experience. She didn't feel unsettled. She felt invigorated, excited. A deliciously sensual shudder passed through her. Great Uncle Oswald spoke suddenly. Caught the shivers too, eh? No doubt you were sickening for something. Her eyes snapped open, and she felt herself blushing. It's not every day a girl gets herself into a mess like this one, Missy, so I'm not surprised if you're having palpitations. Great Uncle Oswald leaned forward in the carriage and observed her closely. A slight hectic touch about the cheeks too, I see. I have no doubt it's all worsened by that dratted ham you will eat at breakfast. Red meat at any time of the day is not good for young girls. It inflames the passions. I expect you need a purge. Declining to comment, Prudence rested her head on the leather squabs and closed her eyes. It wasn't a slice of ham that had inflamed her passions. It was... no. She would not think about Lord Caradice. It was her indignation that had become inflamed, not her passions. She would put him very firmly out of her mind. Besides, she had to find a solution to this mess she'd created. Her sister's future depended on it. But as soon as she closed her eyes, she could think of nothing but the way his eyes had seemed to darken as his mouth came down over hers. On arrival home, Great Uncle Oswald, declaring she looked distinctly feverish, had sent her instantly upstairs to lie down and recover herself. A few minutes later, he brought up a nasty-smelling herbal draught, a purge that he declared infallible, and ordered Prudence to drink every drop. Having no choice... Prudence obediently drained the cup and lay on her bed to ponder her problems. They whirled around in her brain. She could see no way out. There had to be some way she could support her sisters. She turned the problem over and over in her mind. She could gain employment as a housekeeper or a governess, perhaps. But even if she could earn enough, which was doubtful, she would hardly keep a job with four sisters in tow. Try as she might, the unpalatable truth stayed the same. One of her sisters had to marry. Somehow, she had to get Great Uncle Oswald to break his decree. Eventually, she did what she had done every time she failed to come up with an adequate solution. She began another letter to Philip. His long silence could contain a message. On the other hand, it was also true that letters from India had been lost or delayed. Some by years. Deliberate silence or accidental delay. She had to know, one way or another, where she stood, and all she could do was write and ask. She finished her letter just as her maid scratched at the door and peeped in. Seeing Prudence was up and clearly recovered, she bobbed a curtsy and said, Please, miss, Sir Oswald says if you're recovered, he would be obliged if you was to present yourself in the yellow saloon at four o'clock. Prudence felt her heart sink. Thank you, Lily. 
Please inform Sir Oswald that I shall attend him. Lily turned to leave, but Prudence stopped her. Lily, you didn't get into trouble, did you? For accompanying me, I mean. You must tell me if you did, so that I can make amends for it. Oh, no, miss. Sir Oswald was a little snappish about it, to be sure, but he knows as how I was only following your orders. So you didn't get into trouble? No, miss. Old Niblet gave me a bit of a jormy dead about it, but I don't care for that. The butler? Oh, dear. I will speak to him. I am truly sorry to have involved you in my troubles, Lily. Oh, no, miss. Don't you fret none about old Niblet. Lily grinned and smoothed her apron demurely. He was just jealous, because he's never been inside a real duke's house. And I have. Coarse and ignorant country hoyden that I am. And I spoke to the duke face to face. And his handsome cousin, the lord, called me a frail little creature. What's more? So old Niblet is jealous fit to bust. She winked at her mistress and bounced out of the room. At precisely four o'clock, Prudence stood outside the yellow saloon, took a deep breath, and knocked on the door. She hurried into an explanation as soon as she entered. I am so sorry, great Uncle Oswald. I hope you're not too upset. It was all my fault, I know. I have been thinking and thinking about how I could have made such a foolish error, and I have come to the unwelcome conclusion that Lord Caradice probably paid me a few graceful compliments, and I must have refined too much upon it. Building castles in the air, you know. We girls tend to be very romantical at that age. Great Uncle Oswald's face softened. Yes, I don't doubt that you are unused to receiving compliments. No wonder the wastrel was able to turn your head so easily. Swallowing her pride, Prudence nodded. In any case, I have not seen him for more than four years, so there is no need to worry. Are you sure, Missy? Oh, yes, I promise you. This morning was the first time. That was the truth, at any rate. Well, I don't pretend to like it. And I cannot understand why the fellow told you he was the Duke of Dinstab. I think that was my fault, too. Prudence jumped in. It was my initial mistake, and he simply never corrected me. But to let you go on addressing him incorrectly for four and a half years. He shook his head. Prudence felt herself colouring. The kindness in his tone was harder to bear than any amount of shouting. No need to flush up, my dear, said the old man gruffly. I expect it was all love nonsense, not about names and titles at all. Am I right? Bright red, Prudence shrugged. Thought so. Dashed loose manners the young reprobate has. Now, before I let it go, I'll ask you once more. It occurs to me you might not have wanted to admit such a thing with your sister's present. Did the rascally knave touch you in any improper manner? You know what I mean, Missy. Missy thought of the way the rascally knave's mouth had almost devoured hers. She thought of a long-fingered hand cupping her breast and stroking it in a way that made a shiver pass straight through her leaving her toes curling at the mere memory. Yes, she knew all too well what he meant. Prudence, knowing she had turned scarlet, hung her head and said in a low voice, No, Great Uncle Oswald, Lord Caradice never touched me in an improper manner. Humph, <laughs> didn't suppose so. A rake like Caradice wouldn't waste a time dallying with a plain and virtuous gel, Great Uncle Oswald said gloomily. Pity. Prudence stared at him in shock. Pity? Great Uncle Oswald saw her look. Full of juice, Caradice. Prudence still didn't understand. Not that I approve of such goings on, for I don't. But all the same, if there had been hanky panky, it wouldn't have been a bad match for you, Great Uncle Oswald explained. Settled you right and tight. But would Lord Caradice wish to be settled right and tight? Prudence said with an edge to her voice. I cannot imagine it. Not if he has such a famous reputation as a rake. Ah, well, as to that, marriage gives a rake respectability. Prudence couldn't think how, for it seemed to her that if a man had been trapped into marriage, he would have no incentive at all to change his dissolute habits. It seemed likely to her that in such a case a rake would most likely continue his rakish ways, 
and she pitied the woman married to that rake, for she would probably be miserable. Probably. There might be some compensations, she thought wistfully, recalling the exquisite sensation she had experienced on Cleopatra's barge. But since he didn't attempt any hanky-panky, we won't force the rascal's hand. Prudence sat up. I would never allow anyone to force a man to wed me, hanky-panky or not. The very thought is utterly repugnant. It would be completely humiliating. Humph! <laughs> you can't call a splendid match like that humiliating, my girl. Don't matter how it came about. A good match is a good match, and I don't deny Caradice is a better match than even I'd hoped for. For you. I think it would be a perfectly frightful thing, Prudence declared hotly. Married off to a man who cares not a button for you, merely in order to prevent a little scandal. You have led a sheltered life, Great Uncle Oswald said simply. You don't understand these things, he sighed. It don't matter anyway. Question is entirely academic, since he never laid a finger on you, nor promised anything in a letter. I suppose we have to be grateful that he didn't come across your lovely sisters in Norfolk, he snorted. Well, I suppose they were mere children at the time. Juiced good thing, too. Couldn't see a blasted libertine holding back with one of those little beauties in his arms. Lucky it was you, eh, Prue? Prue just looked at him. Not even to get out of this mess would she admit to being grateful for being too plain for even a rake to seduce. What I'm saying, Great Uncle Oswald said apologetically, I don't mean it was lucky at all. He bruised your tender heart, didn't he? Not used to admiration from any man, let alone a London rake. Like putty in his hands, weren't you, poor little lass? He reached out and patted her knee clumsily. A few stray compliments, and you took him at his worthless word. Turned your little head, didn't he, Prue? Prudence gritted her teeth, mortified. The fact that the picture was false didn't make it any better. She might not have had her head turned by Lord Caradice as a girl of sixteen, but this morning, at the advanced age of almost one and twenty, she'd acted no better than her gullible maid, and allowed a libertine to... to take liberties with her person. Worse, she'd flowered under his touch. It was pathetic when she thought about it. She was unused to compliments from men. Grandpapa was virulently uncomplimentary. And Philip was the practical sort, not given to flowery speeches. Great Uncle Oswald freely gave her compliments about her noble soul, but since they were interspersed with comments about her plainness, they failed to turn her head. She probably was susceptible to a cousining rogue. She had been putty in his hands, the softest, most pathetically eager putty, right up until the last few moments, she realized bitterly. At least plain Prudence Meridue had summoned enough self-respect to reject the irresistible Lord Caradice in the end. Prudence sighed, as her customary honesty reasserted itself. It was not self-respect that had made her reject him. It was neither respectability nor virtue. It was simply the fear of discovery that had put a particle of common sense back into her foolish, dazzled brain. Had there been no danger of discovery, she would probably have allowed him anything and reveled in every minute of it. Slaves to their base animal instincts. It must have been instinct, she told herself, recalling the way her body had moulded itself to his without any consciousness on her part. The sensation she had experienced in his arms, delicious as they were, certainly had nothing to do with reason or logic, or any of the other principles so important to enlighten humankind. Never mind, Prue. Great Uncle Oswald patted her knee again. We all make fools of ourselves at some time, he peered at her in a gruff, kindly way. Prudence felt tears pricking behind her eyelids. He looked so much like Grandpapa. But there was no comparison. Beneath the noise and bluster and foppish appearance, Great Uncle Oswald was a dear. She had spent all her life braced against hostility and harshness. She had no defence against kindness. The Duke seemed a decent enough fellow, don't you think? Great Uncle Oswald asked with a touch of anxiety. I'll have to be polite to him, my dear. I don't mind cutting a rake like Caradice if I have to, but I don't think I could cut a Duke, Prue. Prudence nodded vaguely. She had no interest in Dukes. 
She had been momentarily dazzled by a rake with as much morality as a cat and a smile that ought not to be legal, but she knew the dangers now. She felt a sudden twinge in her stomach, Great Uncle Oswald's herbal purge making its presence felt. She grimaced and rose hurriedly, wishing there was an equally effective herbal remedy against rakes. But she had an uneasy suspicion Lord Caradice would not submit to a purge the way her breakfast undoubtedly had. As she stood, the butler Niblet threw open the door. The Duke of Dinstable, he announced in a sonorous voice. Prudence glanced at Great Uncle Oswald in horror. Why would the Duke come calling so soon? What would he say? Would he demand an explanation? What would she say? And would he be accompanied by his cousin? She held her breath and stared at the door. The Duke of Dinstable, dressed in neat buff breeches, gleaming hessian boots, and a coat of dark blue superfine, quietly entered the room. How do you do, Sir Oswald? Miss Meridue, he said, bowing politely. Slightly bemused by the unexpected visit, Great Uncle Oswald invited the Duke to be seated. With some reluctance, Prudence resumed her seat. One did not rush from the room the instant a Duke entered it, and her dilemma was not one she could raise in polite company. "'I came to inquire about Miss Meridue's health,' said the Duke. "'Miss Meridue, have you quite recovered from your indisposition?' Miss Meridue, finding the urge of Great Uncle Oswald's herbal purge most insistent, hastily assured him she was indeed completely recovered. The Duke expressed himself delighted to hear it. He then made a comment about the weather they had been having, and asked Prudence's opinion of it. Prudence responded that it had been quite delightful, such glorious sunshine, such balmy breezes for this time of year, and wondered desperately how soon she could leave the room without causing offence. She would never again swallow one of Great Uncle Oswald's herbal concoctions. Great Uncle Oswald rang the bell and ordered refreshments. Peppermint tea and plain oat biscuits. The Duke blinked, but said nothing. The herbal concoction within asserted itself again, and Prudence leapt to her feet abruptly. The two gentlemen instantly leaped to theirs politely. She stared at them wildly. I, uh, I need to... Just then the door opened, and Charity, the twins, and Grace entered, the latter three talking animatedly between themselves. "'Oh, Prudence, dear, there you are,' Charity said. "'We were planning to walk in the park, and were looking for you to see if you cared to come with—' "'Oh!' she broke off, staring at the visitor. The visitor stared back. The other girls stopped their chatter and broke into hasty curtsies. "'Oh, dear!' Hope rose carefully from her curtsy. We didn't realize you had company, Great Uncle Oswald. Yes, we thought Prudence was alone. We're very sorry for barging in like this, Faith added. Quite all right, my dears. Let me introduce you to our distinguished guest, the Duke of Dinstable. The girls gasped, bobbed another curtsy, and with one accord turned their horrified faces to Prudence. Prudence had no interest in their horror. She was entirely occupied with the effects of herbs. I shall see to the refreshments. Pray, excuse me for a moment, Great Uncle Oswald. Your Grace. And she rushed from the room. Great Uncle Oswald frowned. Don't know what's got into the girl. Butler can bring him in perfectly well. And what she thinks cooks, maids and footmen are for, I don't know. Shaking his head, he continued. Your Grace, may I present my other great nieces. This is Miss Charity Meridue, the second oldest. His face, blank of all expression, the Duke bowed over Charity's outstretched hand. <laughs> Miss Charity. Then there are the twins, Miss Hope and Miss Faith. The Duke didn't move. He held Charity's hand, staring. Charity, blushing prettily, tugged gently at her hand. Miss Hope and Miss Faith, Great Uncle Oswald repeated in a loud voice. The Duke started glanced at Great Uncle Oswald, dropped Charity's hand, and swiftly murmured polite greetings to the twins. And this is the baby of the family, Miss Grace Meridue, the Duke murmured vaguely. How do you do, Miss Grace? Er, uh, you were planning to walk in the park this afternoon, you said. All of you? Together? His gaze flickered briefly. Yes, Hyde Park. All the fashionable people go there at this time of the day. 
on the strut, you know, Grace explained artlessly. It is so interesting to see everyone dressed up in their finest. Yes, quite. Er, uh, perhaps we shall meet there, one day, the Duke said, looking at no one in particular. It was mid-afternoon when Gideon finally gave up all pretense of sleeping. He ought to have slept. He was tired. He'd been up all night playing PK, and he'd had quite a bit to drink, which usually ensured him a sound sleep, but something, or rather someone, had prevented him from sleeping. A small, curvaceous someone, with huge grey eyes and curly copper hair, whose soft, surprised little mouth had made him forget who he was for several long, unforgettable moments. A small, determined whirlwind, most improbably called Prudence. He smiled to himself and stretched languorously in his big, wide bed. Whoever had named her Prudence was way off the mark. Imprudence was more like it. He chuckled again. Miss Imprudence Meridew. He liked it. What would she have to say to that the next time he saw her? He stretched again, enjoying the energy that surged through his body and thought of the next time he'd see her, because, of course, there would be a next time, and soon. He couldn't get that kiss, those kisses, out of his mind. In those few moments with Prudence on the couch, he'd lost all sense of himself, or where he was. There was only her. He couldn't recall when that had last happened. He wasn't sure if it had ever happened. He would see her again. He could remain sensible and indulge his curiosity at the same time. There was no danger. He glanced at the slabs of afternoon sunshine sliding imperceptibly across the floor, snatched his watch from the bedside table and flicked it open. Nearly four o'clock. Just enough time to pay a call on Miss Imprudence Meridew and her great-uncle. Suddenly energized, he bounded out of bed, called for his valet and for hot water and his razor to be brought in and his phaeton to be ordered for half-past four. Miss Prudence may have made the acquaintance of an unshaven shag-bag this morning, but this afternoon she would receive a call from an immaculate Corinthian. Not that he had any intention of pursuing her, he didn't dally with innocence, and marriage was no part of his plans, but he had to find out whether that kiss was a fluke or not, find out whether he would find himself lost in sensation again. Besides, he owed it to Edward to discover what game she was playing. His first thought on meeting her, his second actually, his first had been what a sweet face she had, had been that it was some kind of plot to entrap his cousin. He'd expected trouble since that mention of him in the morning post. A young wealthy duke, as yet unwed and newly come to town, was a temptation not simply to matchmake him a Mars or ambitious great-uncles but Prudence had repeatedly ended the false betrothal. Even when Gideon's levity had threatened his own head with a matrimonial noose, she dragged it back out of danger. Why had he done that? He pondered the matter deeply and could come up with no satisfactory solution. It must have been the brandy. He could think of no other reason for such a burst of insanity. Brandy had never before incited him to flirt with the possibility of marriage. Thank the Lord she continued to repudiate him although when he'd kissed her, it was a different story. Her hesitant, surprised, instinctive response to him was not only intensely arousing, it had somehow struck a chord deep within him. His reaction had been so primitive, it shocked him. She was his. His. But he'd never been the possessive type. How had that happened? How had he allowed it to happen? His brows drew together. He would have to warn Edward about that particular batch of brandy. It obviously had very peculiar effects. He owed a debt of gratitude to Miss Prudence Meridew. Gideon could not imagine any other young unmarried woman of his acquaintance passing up the opportunity to snare, if not himself, than the Caradise Fortune. In any case, the number of women who'd rejected him in any way was gratifyingly small. Yet Miss Prudence Meridew had most unmistakably rejected him several times, wielding that damned lethal reticule like a little Amazon to emphasize her point. Now he came to think of it, that reticule was something of a gauntlet. Caradice has never backed down from gauntlets. Gideon was waiting in the hall for his phaeton to be brought around when the butler coughed discreetly at his elbow. 
Excuse me, my lord. A message from the stables. A crack in the wheel of your phaeton has been discovered, and your man has taken it to the wheelwright to be mended. Blast. At that moment the duke walked in the front door, his expression slightly glazed. Gideon turned to him. The most irritating thing, Edward, there's a damn crack in my phaeton wheel, and I was planning to drive out just now. Could I borrow your curricle? The duke didn't reply. With a preoccupied air, he allowed Bartlett to remove his driving coat. Wake up, cousin. I asked you a question. Gideon eyed his reflection critically in the hall looking glass and adjusted his hat to a more dashing tilt. I presume you've finished with your curricle. Can I borrow it this afternoon? Edward nodded. Hmm. Yes. Of course. But the curricle is being repainted. I'm using my mother's landau. Send a message to Hawkins, Bartlett. The butler bowed and snapped a finger to a waiting footman, who sped off. The Landau? That's stodgy. But there, I'm being ungrateful. The Landau it shall be. Gideon frowned critically at his own reflection. Everything all right, Edward. You look like a stunned mullet, he said with a vague cousinly concern as he adjusted the high-standing points of his collar. Where did you go? Er, uh, paid a call. Did you now? Gideon said cheerily, making a minor alteration to a fold of his neckcloth. Brave fellow, I thought you dreaded. He whirled around and eyed his cousin narrowly. Who did you call on, Edward? He said in quite a different tone. Edward looked a little self-conscious. I'm in a hurry, Gideon. I'm going out again. Who? Edward. But Edward had apparently discovered a piece of fluff on his coat and was engrossed in removing it. When he looked up again, his face was tinged with pink. Gideon frowned in darkest suspicion. You called on Miss Prudence Meridue, didn't you? Edward raised his brows haughtily. If a lady becomes indisposed in my house, it is only polite to inquire after her health. Don't raise those pen-teeth brows at me, Edward. I am immune to them. As for her being indisposed, you know perfectly well that faint wasn't genuine. There's no use trying to flummery me. You tried to steal a march on me with Miss Meridue. The Duke shrugged and said mildly, Steal a march, dear boy. How very vulgar. We of the House of Penteath never steal anything. We've never needed to. It was the Caradices who distinguished themselves as, what was the euphemism? Border Raiders, was it not? Don't change the subject. The Duke smiled. Dearest Cuz, you claim to have no interest in Miss Meridue, and naturally, as a gentleman, I took you at your word. Now, I really must leave. But you just got home. Gideon frowned, as his cousin set a curly-brimmed beaver carefully on his neatly pomaded logs. For a reputed hermit, you've become very sociable all of a sudden. Where are you going now? Do you need the Landau to drop you off? No, you take it. I'm going for a walk in Hyde Park. A walk? You never walk, Gideon glanced at the hall clock. And at this hour, Hyde Park will be teeming with humanity. All the ton will be there. You will hate it, Edward. Will I? The Duke said blandly. We shall see. Gideon shrugged. Don't say I didn't warn you. To tell the truth, he wasn't much interested in where his cousin was going now. He was much more interested in where he'd been, and whom he had talked to and whether she'd been impressed with his, his dukishness, damn him. He could not forget that it had been a search for a ducal fiancé that had first brought prudence into his orbit. Fifteen minutes later, the duke's driver, Hawkins, drove the Landau into Providence Court for the second time that afternoon. It halted in front of number 21. Gideon made a quick survey of his person to ensure there was no hint of shag bag, took a deep breath, seized the brass knocker with a bold hand, and rapped smartly, and waited. He was absurdly nervous. It was ridiculous for a man of his address and experience to be feeling nervous, Gideon told himself. He had made hundreds of morning calls, well, dozens at any rate. Rakes did not make morning calls, as a rule. They dropped in on their friends' lodgings, called in at their clubs, visited their mistresses, popped into Jackson's for a bout or two with the clubs. 
They left polite little ritualistic morning calls to others, and thought it was ridiculous to call an afternoon visit a morning call. His neckcloth felt unaccountably tight. Some idiot had starched his shirt points so that they felt like knives, waiting to cut into his chin if he so much as slouched. Not that he was planning to slouch, of course. Gideon resisted the urge to run a finger around his collar. He was a grown man, for heaven's sake. He could drink tea and nibble cakes with the best of them. They might even serve him a glass of wine. Great Uncle Oswald abhors the evils of liquor. No, he sighed. It would be tea. Or Gideon felt himself blanch. They surely wouldn't expect him to drink rat of fear, would they? He swallowed, and felt his shirt points dig warningly into his jaw. Why the devil were they taking so long to answer the blasted door? He reached up to rap the knocker again, as the door was opened. An ancient butler stood there, eyeing him expectantly. Sir? His hand hung foolishly in midair for a second, then Gideon collected himself. Lord Caradice, to see Sir Oswald Meridew. He presented his card, and made to step over the threshold. I shall inquire, my lord, said the ancient retainer in a sonorous voice, and taking the card, he closed the door in Gideon's face. Gideon blinked. He had never in his life had a door shut in his face. Well, once, by an irate woman, but never by a butler. Senile old fool, he muttered and feeling a little foolish at being kept waiting on the doorstep like a tradesman, he inspected his nails, whistling lightly under his breath in a carefree manner. After what seemed like a very long time, the door opened. Sir Oswald is hat home, and we'll see you now in the yellow saloon. Gideon followed the butler inside, and detained him a moment. What about the young lady? Uh, the young ladies? He corrected himself, recalling there were sisters. Are any of the Miss Meridews at home? He smiled at the butler in a man-to-man -man fashion. The butler regarded him balefully. Listen here, Gideon began in a confiding tone that had won over many a butler before. It's actually Miss Prudence Meridew I have come to see. Nip upstairs and let her know I am in with Sir Oswald. Would you? He pressed a folded banknote into the butler's ready hand. The butler stared down his nose, quite as if his hand hadn't pocketed the note in a flash, shrugged, then opened the door to what was obviously the yellow saloon. Sir Oswald greeted Gideon bluntly. Have to admit, I never looked to see you come calling. Gideon bowed. How do you do, sir? Eh? Oh, how do you do, Caradise? Sit down, sit down. I'm just about to take a cup of healthful tea. Here, he handed Gideon a cup. Now I presume you've come to explain that disgraceful scene this morning, not to mention your heavy cavy dealings with my great niece. Ah, indeed, Gideon sipped the tea, wondering how to answer, then almost choked. What the devil was this filthy tasting stuff? Have you had a chance yet to talk with Miss Meridew? I have, Sir Oswald frowned balefully. Ah. Gideon swallowed another hideous mouthful, wondering what tale Miss Imprudence had come up with now, and hoping there had been no mention of an Egyptian couch. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Ah, oh, yes, I am. I am, Gideon assured him, for in the expression on the old fellow's face, the Egyptian couch had featured after all. A man of your experience, flirting with an innocent young girl like little Prudence. You ought to have known a girl like that would misinterpret your intentions. Ah, that was it. He was accused of flirting. No mention of kisses, or couches, Egyptian or otherwise. Suddenly his neckcloth felt a lot more comfortable. I know, I know, he said in a rueful man-of-the-world tone, and set his cup down. Sir Oswald refilled it. Fellow of your vast experience with women ought to know better than to dally with young girls. The old chap was off, and running in a splendid tirade. Gideon glanced toward the door. A sheltered young miss doesn't understand. Rascally rake. How long did it take that blasted butler to climb the stairs, damn it? Prudence ought to be here any moment. Sir Oswald glared at him. A decent man would make amends, do the decent thing. See the girl right. Gideon was not paying attention. 
was that a soft feminine footstep at the door. He glanced at Sir Oswald's face, realised some response was expected of him, and with an effort recalled the last thing the elderly man had said, something about seeing the girl. He nodded in agreement. Oh, yes, sir, I quite agree. You do? Sir Oswald seemed stunned. Gideon smiled at him winningly. Indeed, I do. And that's why you're here now. For prudence. That's why I'm here now. He smiled again. What did the old fool think? That he'd come to make a morning call on an elderly man? Of course he'd come to see prudence. Well, by Jove, that's more like it. Sir Oswald jumped out of his chair and shook Gideon by the hand. Well done, Caradice. I knew there was some good in you. Eh? Feeling as though he'd missed something crucial in the conversation, Gideon allowed his hand to be pumped energetically. Wondered if I hadn't been mistaken in you when you arrived here in your court and clothes. What? Horrified, Gideon glanced down at his immaculate outfit. Court in clothes? He opened his mouth to explain. Sir Oswald winked at him merrily. You can't fool an old man, Caradice. When a man changes overnight from shag bag to elegant sprig, there's courting in the air. You won't regret it. Damn fine little girl, Prudence. Make your fine little wife. A very fine little wife indeed. He rang the bell and called for the celebratory dandelion wine to be brought in. Gideon said nothing. He felt slightly hollow. Somehow, while making innocuous chit-chat, this dandified old lunatic had gained the impression he wanted to marry Prudence, a girl he had known less than a day. How had that happened? He ran over the conversation in his mind. There were some disconcerting blanks in his memory, the perils of a momentary lapse or two in concentration. Had he merely been given permission to court Miss Prudence Meridew, or had he unknowingly agreed to something more binding? He had an uneasy suspicion it was the latter. The old chap was making very free with the word wife. Gideon repressed a shudder. He ought to stop it right now, clarify the whole thing, clear up the misunderstanding. But for the life of him, Gideon couldn't bring himself to ask what it was they were celebrating, let alone deny it. He would sort it out later, when the old fellow had recovered from his transports of delight. On second thought, he might not need to. Prudence would deal with the whole thing more effectively, he was sure. She would deny him, as she had previously, and he would be safe again. What a relief. It took fifteen interminable minutes and several glasses of the most peculiar-tasting wine Gideon had ever swallowed before he could escape Great Uncle Oswald's raptures. The ancient butler escorted him to the front door. Gideon stepped onto the front step and recalled something. He detained the butler by the sleeve. Where the devil is Miss Prudence? Didn't you give her my message? The butler turned, a faint malicious smile on his face. She's gone out. None of the Mrs. Meridews is hat home. They left about ten minutes before you arrived. The smile became a smirk as he shut the door in Gideon's face for the second time that day. Damn and blast the fellow, muttered Gideon as he retraced his steps toward the waiting Landau. Gone out? Where had she gone in his hour of need? Shopping? The park, perhaps? It was the fashionable hour to be parading, damn it. The reason for Edward's bizarre desire to take exercise suddenly became crystal clear. Gideon leaped into the Landau. Hyde Park, Hawkins, and Springham! Hawkins, knowing the respect due to a vehicle bearing a ducal crest, and having placed both the Duke and Lord Caradice on their first fat ponies twenty-odd years before, declined to spring anything, but condescended to urge his beauties in the direction of Hyde Park at a decorous trot. Behind him, his passenger chafed and cursed the mule-headedness of old retainers and the deviousness of dukes. Chapter 7 Think of what it will mean, for your good name and mine, if you do this. Sophocles The Landau passed through the wrought iron gates of Hyde Park, and entered a throng of people and carriages almost as bad as the traffic on the streets they had just left. Gideon sat bolt upright, cursing the low-sprung vehicle. If he'd had his high perch phaeton, he could have seen over the heads of this lot and spotted the perfidious Edward in a trice. 
There he is, blast him, lurking among that gaggle of yellow-haired chits there. Pull over, Hawkins. Hawkins negotiated a halt beside the crowded path, and Gideon jumped down and thrust his way through the crowd to where Edward stood in the midst of a group of ethereally fair young ladies. Loitering suspiciously around the group were a dozen or so young bloods, several of whom Gideon knew very well to be rakes of the highest order. He knew well their quarry, for hidden right in the midst of all of them, where his cousin clearly imagined he could conceal her, was one small delightful lady, dressed in a silver-grey pelisse with dark green trim. As he had suspected, his conniving cousin had made an assignation behind his back with Miss Prudence Meridew. The grey pelisse was an exact match for her glorious eyes, the green the perfect foil for her magnificent hair, all but a few curls of which was currently hidden by an elegant bonnet with a dark green feather. Furiously, Gideon shouldered his way through the pack of rakes, edged past the gaggle of fair young things, plastered a surprised expression on his face, and made the guilty pair an elegant, sarcastic bow. Edward, Miss Meridew, what a charming and unexpected surprise. Miss Meridew, permit me to tell you how very charming you look. He bared his teeth at her in an attempt to smile the wolf catching Red Riding Hood in a flirtation with a beagle. "'How do you do, Lord Caradice? Thank you,' Prudence responded with composure. "'Permit me to tell you in return, sir, that you do look rather different from our last meeting also. More—' She paused, as if searching for a word. "'Elegant,' supplied Gideon silently. "'Dashing? Stylish?' "'Tidy.' said Miss Meridew. Tidy! Gideon concealed his chagrin behind another bow of elegance and grace. Blasted! Did the girl not know how long he had taken to tie his neckcloth? Could she not see the cursed thing was a miracle of precision and style? Was it not apparent to her that his coat was so much the crack he was barely able to breathe, and that his collar points were so highly starched they practically decapitated him? All she could say was that he looked tidy. Edward spoke. Cousin, I believe you have not yet met Miss Meridew's sisters. Sisters? Gideon looked around vaguely and realized that their conversation was being observed with great interest by several young ladies, two in pink, one in blue, and the other in white, all with yellow hair, though one had more red than yellow. Permit me to introduce them, continued Edward. He gestured to the one in blue. This is Miss Charity Meridew. Gideon bowed over the blue girl's hand, aware that Prudence had a faint worried frown on her brow. Ha! Feeling guilty, was she? So she should. If she was such a patterned card of virtue, she shouldn't be meeting Edward in secret. The Duke indicated the two in pink. Allow me to present Miss Faith and Miss Hope Meridew, who you will perceive are twins, and this is Miss Grace Meridew, the youngest of the family. Gideon bowed perfunctorily over the hand of each girl, fully aware of his cousin's game. If Edward thought that tossing a bunch of yellow-haired chits at him would distract Gideon away from prudence, he could think again. And if strategy was the name of the game, Edward had met his master. Gideon smiled down at the cluster of blonde young things. You have all come to London recently, I think. There was a soft chorus of feminine agreement. Gideon smiled again, feeling quite avuncular. London is made fairer by your presence. He shot a look at Prudence to see how she was reacting. She was glaring at him, like a cross little hawk. Ha! Source for the gander, Miss Imprudence. His smile encompassed all the young ladies. Are you enjoying your stay, ladies? One of the pink ones gave him to understand that they were but said they had hoped to mix a little more in society than they had hitherto been allowed. Gideon recalled Prudence, telling him her sisters wanted to get married. He had no objection. The sooner she was free of the worry of them, the better. Right now, the girls were very much in the way. Ah, indeed, indeed, he said. I don't suppose any of you young ladies would care to take a turn around the park in a landau, would you? Only mine, well, Actually, it is my cousin's. 
is sitting over there, blocking traffic, and Hawkins, the driver, is looking daggers at me, wishing to be on the move again. Would any of you care to be taken up for a circuit or two? He smiled encouragingly. Prudence's faint frown turned into a glare. No, the— Oh, yes, please, chorused the pair in pink. It would be of all things delightful, said the one in blue, whose name Gideon had forgotten. He was much more fascinated by the way the sun gleamed on the stray curls of Prudence's hair, revealing a hundred different colours in the silky tresses. Delightful, he murmured, and then recalled himself as Prudence swept militantly toward the vehicle, ushering her sisters before her like a small furious whirlwind. He strolled after her, enjoying the way her deliciously rounded hips swayed in her hurry. Like a busy little governess, she supervised her sisters as they climbed into the landau, darting him swift glances of reproof if he so much as offered to assist them. Gideon tried hard to repress a grin. She knew what he was up to, of course, knew he was trying to get rid of the girls so he could be alone with her, and so she'd gathered them around her in a protective flock, hoping to escape his attentions. Her defensive strategy would prove futile. Even Prudence could not get more than four into a landau, five with the little one in white. The two pink ones had almost bounded into the low-slung vehicle, and the blue one climbed gracefully in after them, followed closely, almost hastily, by the duke. Gideon beamed as his cousin seated himself in the landau beside the blue one. Good old Edward. Family loyalty coming to the fore at last. Sacrificing himself to a drive with a bunch of chattering girls, so his cousin could further his acquaintance with Miss Prudence. If a plain and dull wife were what Edward wanted, then Gideon resolved to find him the nicest, plain, dull girl the ton could produce. He winked at his cousin. Edward did not appear to notice. He looked a little glazed about the eyes. Poor fellow. He was unused to female company. There was barely room even for the littlest one. Gideon waited for Prudence to realize it. There would be no space in the landau for Prudence at all not unless she forced them to squash together in a horribly undignified manner. Her sisters were eager for the promised treat. She could not order them from the carriage at this stage. Instead of hiding among her sisters, as she'd no doubt planned, she would be separated from them. Apart from the milling crowds of fashionable promenaders, her only other acquaintance was her footman standing stolidly, observing events a few yards away. She was caught effectively alone in the park with him. There was not the slightest whiff of impropriety, but she was trapped, nevertheless. Common politeness would force her to stroll with Gideon, to accept his proffered arm, to participate in low and intimate conversation, all the while respectively under the eye of the ton, and with her footman at hand. Prudence, her hand on Grace's shoulder, watched as the twins carefully tucked in their skirts to make room for their little sister. She'd seen for herself the impact her beautiful sisters had made on Lord Caradice. He'd barely looked at them, a move that had instantly raised her suspicions. Everyone stared at her sisters. They were so beautiful that people could not help it. Then he'd instantly tried to tempt them away from her protection by offering them a ride in his elegant landau. She would scotch his rakish game. She had no intention of letting him take her sisters for a ride. She had evidence enough from that, that incident on Cleopatra's barge that his reputation as a rake was well deserved. She would protect her innocent and lovely sisters from his advances if it was the last thing she did. Come along, Grace, dear, she said. Once Grace was seated, there would be no room for anyone else. Prudence shot Lord Caradice a look of pure triumph and was shocked to receive a blazingly triumphant smile in return. What on earth could he be so pleased about? He must see by now that there was no room for him in the Landau. She had rescued her beautiful sisters, had cleverly bundled them out of his way, with the assistance of his quiet, eminently respectable cousin, the Duke, and left herself alone with a rake, with only a footman's protection, she realized suddenly. Surely she could not be his prey. But there was a distinctly wolfish gleam in his smile, as he helped Grace up the steps a gleam that started a thrumming in Prudence's blood. She remembered Cleopatra's barge, and swallowed. She could not be alone with him. 
she was not alone, she told herself firmly. There were hundreds of people in the park, respectable people, people who would ensure nothing could happen to her, and she had a big burly footman at her command. James would protect her from any untoward advances Lord Caradice might make toward her. The trouble was, Lord Caradice didn't need to make any advances. He set her heart a fluttering with just a look, a glance, and his lazy, wicked, crooked smile. Dear Lord! what that smile did to her insides. She must not be alone with Lord Caradice, not even in a crowd of hundreds in the middle of Hyde Park with James the footman at her elbow. It was not safe. She snatched Grace back to the ground, almost tumbling her out of the carriage in her anxiety. There is not enough room in the landau, Grace dear, she said firmly. If you try to squash into it, you will crush your sister's gowns. Stay and walk with me, my love. Grace's mouth opened to protest, but Prudence hurriedly nipped her arm, and her little sister subsided. She glanced from Lord Caradice back to Prudence and frowned. Prudence avoided the question in her gaze. Grace might be young and innocent, but she was not at all stupid. The Landau moved off, the sisters gaily waving, the Duke looking stunned to be seated among such a gathering of femininity. Prudence watched them go, then, in a determined fashion, linked arms with Grace. Oh, no, that is not at all the fashionable mode of promenading, Lord Caradice said, and in an instant he had inserted himself casually between the sisters, taking one on each arm. He smiled down at Prudence, and his arm tightened, pressing hers to his big warm side. This is how it's done, Miss Meridue. Is it not much better? Prudence shivered. No, it wasn't better at all. She could feel his strength, his warmth, could smell the faint smell of clean linen and freshly shaven man. It was much worse. You know I am betrothed, she reminded him in an elaborately casual tone. He chuckled, deep, low, and lazy. Prudence felt it vibrate clear through to her bones. On the other side of him, Grace gasped. Prue! I thought that was supposed to be a deadly dark secret. Hastily, Prudence changed the subject. Lord Caradice was most interested in the Egyptian reticule you made for me, Grace. He thought it very unusual. Gideon glanced down at the young girl on his arm. Aha! So you are the perpetrator of that. Prudence gripped his arm hard. Yes, indeed, Grace. Lord Caradice admired the workmanship immensely. She sent him a severe look and added, didn't you, sir? Uh, yes, quite, Lord Caradice responded. Tremendously solid, uh, workmanship, Miss Grace. I was much struck by it, he paused, then added. Very much struck. Prudence spluttered a little at his effrontery. He sent her a mischievous look and added in a thoughtful tone. In fact, I do not recall when I was so much struck by something as solidly artistic. He removed his arm briefly from Grace's, and rubbed his head meditatively. Your workmanship made a powerful impact on me, I must say, quite stunning. He sighed, and linked arms with Grace again. I don't suppose you'd think of making another one for your sister, only in netting. Extremely fashionable at the moment, netting reticules. Prudence tried very hard to remain serious. It was a severe struggle. They walked on in silence for a few moments, bowing here and there at passing acquaintances. Finally, Prudence mastered herself enough to continue the conversation. My sister is fascinated by ancient Egypt, my lord, as are we all. Perhaps if he thought them a family of blue stockings, he would lose interest. Gentlemen disliked studious women. She knew that from Philip. Did you truly admire my reticule, sir? Grace squinted suspiciously up at the tall, elegant man. Gideon glanced down at the creator of the instrument of his downfall, and softened. The child looked a lot like Prudence when she frowned. Yes, Miss Grace. There was much fascination with things Egyptian after Napoleon invaded that land, though, as a fashionable topic, it is quite passé now. The little girl's face fell, and, aware of Prudence's hand tightening on his arm, Gideon hastened to repair the damage. 
Of course, the frivolous world of fashion cannot keep anything in its silly head for long. People of sense will wish to study the world of the ancients for many years to come. The look of warm approval Prudence bestowed upon him almost took his breath away. It was followed almost as swiftly by a frown as he bent to draw Miss Grace out about her interest. A mercurial little creature, Miss Imprudence, more and more she fascinated him. Just then Prudence was hailed by a pair of ladies in a carriage. Lady Jersey and another lady Gideon didn't know. Gideon bowed in the lady's direction, but remained where he was. He was in no way inclined to be questioned by one of the most garrulous leaders of the ton. Bad enough she'd seen him in the park, walking with Miss Meridew and her sister. However, Prudence, being newly come to London, and still dependent on Lady Jersey's approval, had no option but to go over. She gestured to Grace to come with her, but Gideon kept Grace's arm linked in his, and said, No, no, you go ahead and chat to the ladies, Miss Meridew. Miss Grace will not mind staying behind to entertain me, will you, Miss Grace? Miss Grace agreed placidly enough. Miss Prudence, on the other hand, gave him a searing, mistrustful glare as she stepped forward to greet Lady Jersey and her friend. Gideon grinned. He would now find out the truth about Miss Imprudence's so-called betrothal. He looked thoughtfully at Prudence's little sister. She stared back at him with open candour. A small, solemn angel with strawberry blonde curls and celestial blue eyes. He'd never had much to do with young girls, having no sisters or female cousins, but he flattered himself he could handle females of all ages. Uh, do you have a doll, Miss Grace? I used to have a doll, but Grandpapa burned her. Ah. Gideon did not know how to reply to that. It occurred to him there might be an opening there for bribery. Would you like to have a new duh? My sister was worried about being alone with you. She made me come with her instead of going for a drive. Gideon was nonplussed by such plain speaking. Oh, well... You're the man who pretended to Prudence that you were really a duke, aren't you? The angelic blue eyes were fixed on his face. Gideon made a careless gesture, a small misunderstanding. But you did, didn't you? You pretended to be the Duke of Dinstable. The small angel smiled up at him seraphically. Well, yes, I did, admitted Gideon. But it was a mere... Ouch! What the devil? He bent down, rubbing his shin, and stared at the angel in shock. What the dev... Uh, deuce, did you do that for? It hurt. Good, said the angel. I was afraid these new shoes would not be sturdy enough. Good? Gideon repeated indignantly. Look here, I don't know what you did in the country, but in London you can't go around kicking people on... Why not? demanded the angel, a pugnacious tilt to her chin. Well, uh, it's just not done. But if people deserve kicking, what else can I do? Gideon rubbed his bruised chin and considered this fraught path. In what way did I deserve kicking? You played a horrid trick on my sister Prue, and... Your sister is chock full of tricks herself. Ow! Will you stop that? He rubbed the other shin. My sister Prudence is not full of nasty tricks. She looks after us all and protects us from gr... people. And she is good and kind and always tries to help everyone, and nobody ever helps her. She risked everything to get us to London and had a perfectly splendid plan to save us, and then Great Uncle Oswald ruined everything, and poor Prue blames herself, but she cannot help being plain and... Plain? Why the devil does everyone keep saying she is plain? declared Gideon in exasperation. Do you all need spectacles? Grace's diatribe stopped. She stared at him as if considering something. Gideon edged back, mistrusting the look in her eyes. You don't think Prudence is plain? She repeated. Of course I don't. Rash, yes. Mercurial, certainly. But plain? He snorted. Grace frowned. But you've seen her with the others, haven't you? What others? My sisters. She gestured in the direction of the long-departed Landau. Oh, those yellow-haired chits. Yes, I saw them. What about it? 
Grace tilted her head and eyed him with solemn consideration. So you think prudence is pretty? Gideon gave her a severe look. You'll not distract me so easily, miss. When I have something to say, I'll say it to your sister, not to some brat who goes around kicking people. She seemed to find this a satisfactory answer. Grandpapa used to call me a limb of Satan, she confided. He eyed the offending foot pointedly. Perfectly understandable. And that would be the limb he meant, I'm sure. I never kicked him. I wish I had, though, she said darkly. And I will if I see him again. Gideon rolled his eyes. If you go around kicking people, you'll never take in society, and it will embarrass your sister sorely, I assure you. She grinned. I won't kick you any more, as long as you don't hurt or upset Prudence. I don't like it when people are horrid to Prudence. Gideon couldn't help warming to the sprite, in spite of his aching shins. He wouldn't like it if anyone hurt Prudence either, and if they tried, he would do a damn sight more than give them a kick. He held out his arm to her. I assure you, Mistress Lim, I have no intention of harming your sister in any way. Quite the contrary, in fact. And if I did, I should deserve far more than a kicking. Now, shall we stroll on a little? She took his arm happily. Do you enjoy observing ducks, perchance? He inquired politely. There is a duck pond over there. No. In that case, we shall not visit them. Let us await your sister on this bench instead. They sat down and observed the comings and goings of the fashionable for a time. He glanced across to where Prudence was chatting to the ladies. She was watching him. Gideon felt warmed by her attention. He smiled at Prudence and patted Grace's hand where it rested on his arm, silent reassurance that he would take good care of her little sister. Prudence glared back at him horribly. Gideon wondered what unkind things the ladies were saying about him. Gossip was a shocking thing. He wondered how he could broach the matter of Prudence's betrothal with the limb. He didn't want her to become suspicious again. Neither did his shins. Lord Caradice, the limb interrupted his musings abruptly. If you were madly in love with someone, would you become engaged to them and then go off to another country and expect them to wait for years and years and not even write them very interesting letters? He turned to look at her. This was the opening he had hoped for. Have you been reading your sister's letters? She flushed. Only a few, and only because I'm worried, but would you leave someone if you are madly in love? He shrugged. Couldn't say. Never been madly in love. She frowned at him. But if you were engaged, would you leave the lady behind you for more than four and a half years? He shrugged again. Depends on the lady. If I didn't want to marry her, I might. What if she were Prudence? Gideon scuffed a pattern in the raked path with his foot. It would be most discreet to say nothing. Instead, he heard himself saying, Any man who leaves a girl like your sister for four and a half years is a thrice-blasted fool. You never know what she might do, waltz off and snag the nearest duke. Grace poked his side crossly. Oh, poo, that was for us, not her, silly. Gideon couldn't see how a false betrothal to his cousin would benefit anyone. He considered it a moment, and then, recalling the small angel's penchant for physical violence, asked diffidently, I don't suppose you'd care to explain it all to me? She frowned. I don't think I should. It is a secret, you know, a deadly dark one. Yes, I do know, Gideon reminded her. If you recall, your sister mentioned it just a moment ago in front of me. I am simply curious as to how my cousin the Duke was brought into it. He smiled down at the young girl so endearingly like her sister, and added, Come now, Miss Lim. You may trust me. My shins are at your mercy. Grace hesitated a moment, then capitulated. The thing is, Great Uncle Oswald will only bring my other sisters out after Prudence is safely betrothed, and of course she cannot tell him about being betrothed already, because she promised Philip she wouldn't, and Prue never breaks a promise, you know. Gideon silently filed that interesting little fact away in his mind. Grace continued. When Prue turns one and twenty, 
that's next month, we can live with her. But unless one of us marries by then, we shall have no money to live on. And if Grandpapa finds us, he will take us back, and we shall never get away again. Grandpapa is a very terrible person, you see. We have run away from him. Gideon did not really see. It was a garbled tale at best, but he persisted. Why does your uncle insist Prudence must be the one to be betrothed first? If he's trying to fire them all off, why not bring them all out together? Great Uncle Oswald says my sisters would ruin Prue's chances of marriage. He is excessively fond of Prue, you know. But he says no man would want to marry Prudence once he'd seen my sisters. It isn't fair, because Prudence is the dearest, kindest, nicest, bravest person in the world. Dear little soul. Gideon patted her hand again. There must be something wrong with the other sisters, something peculiar that would put off Prudence's suitors from wishing to marry her. No doubt that was the reason she'd rushed them into his Landau, so he wouldn't notice. So, Prudence needs a fiancé, in order that her sisters may find husbands, he said slowly. Because if one of you doesn't marry within the month, you'll all be taken away by Grandpapa. Yes. Grace shivered and snuggled a little closer to him. But Prue will fix things. She always does. Gideon was disturbed. The child was a little Viking. What would put that look on her face? He put a comforting arm around her. It's all right. I'll... He broke off in sudden shock. He'd been about to assure her he would look after them. What had got into him lately? You have no parents. No. They died when I was a baby, Grace explained. Grandpapa brought us all back from Italy after they died, but Prue takes care of us. She always promised us that when Philip came back from India, she would take us all away from Grandpapa, only... There was that look again. Gideon was beginning to have serious misgivings about Grandpapa. Only Philip hasn't come back, prompted Gideon. I think he must be dead. Grace confided. India is very dangerous, you know. There are all sorts of things that can kill you. It could have been stung by a scorpion or bitten by a cobra. That's a snake. They keep cobras in baskets in India. They're frightfully poisonous and play music to them. Or he could have caught one of those terrible tropical diseases where your nose falls off. Or is that something else? But I think he's been eaten by a tiger or trampled by an elephant. She ended with apparent relish. There are hundreds, even thousands of tigers and elephants in India, and I think it very likely Philip has perished at their... You can't say hands, can you? What would you say? Tusks? Fangs? Gideon was not prepared to speculate. He cut to the heart of her artless speech. Why do you think he is dead? Because he has not written to Prue for months and months. And though Prue says the mail from India is very unreliable, what with storms and ships sinking all the time, and people drowning, he cut off her ghoulish recitation. It is very unreliable. Yes. And Prue says to break off a betrothal to someone working in such terrible conditions as Philip is in India is as bad as breaking your promise to a soldier who is away at war. And I perfectly understand that. It is a matter of honour, isn't it? Gideon nodded thoughtfully. So Miss Prudence had considered the possibility of severing her betrothal, had she? But he has never taken so long to respond to her letters before. And you would think he would, wouldn't you? Particularly when our need is so great. Hmm. Gideon's mind was spinning. Yes, I can see your need is indeed great. Prudence smiled and nodded, responding automatically as her acquaintances quizzed her gently about being seen walking in the park with a famous rake. She bore the polite chit-chat as best she could, watching her sister and Lord Caradice from the corner of her eye. She was itching to get back there. Grace would be blabbing all sorts of things. That man could charm information out of a post, and Grace was no post. Her little sister was laughing and chatting away merrily, while Lord Caradice gave her his full attention. What was she telling him? Prudence's feelings were so mixed. On the one hand, it was wonderful to see Grace looking so happy. 
She had become so quiet and almost morbid during the last year or so at Derham Court, but a few moments in Lord Caradice's company, and she was smiling and chattering like any other ten-year-old girl. She'd even heard her giggle once. Prudence hadn't realised how long it had been since she'd heard Grace giggle. For that alone, she owed Lord Caradice her gratitude. It wasn't simply careless charm, either. He had been kind to Grace, sensitive to her fascination with ancient Egypt. Many fashionable types would have scoffed at her interest in a fad no longer current, but he'd reassured Grace and made her feel important, and now he looked as though he was listening to her with every appearance of interest. Not many sophisticated men of fashion would bother drawing out a child. It would be more common for their eyes to roam the park, seeking more interesting diversions, but as far as she could see, Lord Caradice's eyes had only strayed from Grace to Prudence. Again, it ought to have earned her gratitude, for Grace needed to experience masculine kindness, to know that all men were not like Grandpapa. All of these were excellent reasons why Prudence should feel warm toward Lord Caradice. Instead, they made her more determined than ever to avoid him. She didn't need Lady Jersey's warnings that he was a fatally charming rattlesnake, and she could place no dependence on his constancy. She knew about his fatal charm. He effortlessly drew her to him. The rake in him seemed to call to some dreadful female weakness in her. The animal instincts Grandpapa had spoken of so often that she'd never believed in, until Lord Caradice. To be in the grip of such instincts should be alarming, and indeed, when she was in a calm and rational state and out of reach of his rakish wiles, she was alarmed. But when she was with Lord Caradice, her deplorable animal instinct seemed to just take over. But that was only part of his danger. Prudence's short time in London had taught her that growing up as she had, in an atmosphere of cruel harshness, she had few defences against kindness. Lord Caradice's careless kindness to her little sister was devastating. It threatened to undermine all her resolve. It was the most dangerous while of all all the more dangerous because she suspected it wasn't a while at all. She watched him charming her little sister with kindness and tried to harden her resolve. Kindness wasn't everything. He was perfectly capable of taking advantage of whatever it was Grace had confided only to tease Prudence. And the trouble was that even while she knew he was only teasing, she... she felt things. Things a betrothed woman had no right feeling for another man. He was not the slightest bit serious about her. How could he be? He was a gazetted rake, and she was no beauty to entice him into fidelity. He had no respect for the concept. He knew she'd been engaged to Philip for years. He should have realized her mind was firm and resolute, and not to be swayed by a rake's easy charm. But did he care? She thought of Cleopatra's barge. Her mind might be resolute, but her body was only too easily swayed, and it could not be. As Lady Jersey had told her, he was simply bored, like the rest of London society, and thought he would entertain himself with her for the season. But like him or not, prudence would be no rake's idle entertainment. For her own peace of mind and self-respect, she would have as little to do with him as possible. She broke away from the two ladies as soon as politeness allowed, ready to send Lord Caradice on his way. But as she walked toward them, her decision faltered. Her little sister sat happily arm in arm with Lord Caradice, her eyes fairly blazing with excitement. Prudence blinked. Surely any man who could make Grace look so happy could not be all bad. His eyes too gleamed with laughter and anticipation. That look ought to warn her, she reminded herself. Just so had he looked before he had first kissed her. His eyes had glinted that way as he pressed her back on a certain Egyptian sofa. She couldn't trust him an inch. Thank you for keeping Grace company, she said brightly and seized Grace's hand. However, it is late and we must find our sisters and get home. Goodbye, Lord Caradice. She began to march toward the exit, but Grace dragged at her arm, saying, Prudence! Lord Caradice and I have come up with the most brilliant solution to our problems. It is so kind of Lord Caradice to be concerned, 
she said sweetly, flinging a look over Grace's head that told Lord Caradice she wished him to take himself off. However, I don't wish to trouble him with our private family affairs. I'm sure he has much more important matters to take care of. She hurried on. Not at all. He ambled along beside her and quite casually added, Grace and I have decided that the best thing is for you and I to become betrothed, purely for your sister's sake, of course. Nothing binding. She stumbled a moment in shock. You must be mad, Lord Caradice. I couldn't possibly agree to anything so absurd. She tried to lengthen her pace, as if to escape his outrageous suggestion. Beside her, Lord Caradice strolled along, his long legs easily outpacing hers, with no apparent effort. Why not? he asked in a reasonable tone. Yes, Prue, why not? I think it's a splendid plan, said Grace enthusiastically, skipping along beside them. Prudence darted her a quelling glance. It was not a splendid plan. It was impossible. Quite ridiculous. She hurried on through the park, peering around in an effort to see that Landau with her sisters in it. Unfortunately, there were so many other people, she could not oversee them. I'm a little worried that your coachman may have become lost with my sisters. Hawkins is never lost, and besides, my cousin is with them. Now don't change the subject. We were discussing our betrothal, said Lord Caradice calmly. Prudence came to an abrupt halt. Hush! She glanced around. People might hear you and not know you are funny, and then we should really be in the suds. He shrugged. I don't care if they hear. Well, I do. He took her hands and smiled down into her eyes, a sort of lazy, knowing smile that weakened her resistance quite disgracefully. She snatched her hands away. He lowered his voice slightly. Grace and I are agreed. Your sisters must have their coming out before Grandpapa's ankle is healed. And since Great Uncle Oswald is so pig-headed about firing you off first, and since Otterbottom is in India, giving some poor tiger indigestion, Mr. Otterbury is not, Prudence glared at Grace. Did you have to blurt out everything? Or oozing up between the toes of some miserable elephant? Lord Caradice continued imperturbably. You have need of a fiancé foe to foil Great Uncle Oswald's foolish dictum concerning your sister's coming out, and thus I humbly offer my services. Humbly? She snorted. It's impossible. Why is it impossible? I am frequently humble. I do humility extremely well. Ask anyone. I was voted the most hum— She interrupted his nonsense. I meant your offer is impossible. I wouldn't do at all. Why not? Grace likes me. You like me. Great Uncle Oswald. Grace is an impressionable child, easily deceived. Prudence ignored an indignant gasp from her sister, and continued in a heated tone. And you cannot possibly claim that Great Uncle Oswald likes you. He despises you. He called you a smoky knave and an unshaven lout. He passed his hand across his chin. You will perceive I possess a razor. He also called you a vile deceiver, a cowardly impostor, and a shocking humbug. Pah! Sticks and stones. Lord Caradice dismissed Great Uncle Oswald's strictures airily. And it was shocking humbug, not shocking. In any case, men of his age are not at their best at such an ungodly hour of the morning. I think you will find he is singing rather a different tune now. Pooh, snapped Prudence inelegantly. Why would he have changed his tune so suddenly? Lord Caradice managed to look wicked, smug, and saintly, all at the same time. In any case, Prudence added belatedly, I don't like you. He shook his head at her, a deep smile lurking in his dark eyes. Oh, Prudence, here I thought you were a truthful girl, relatively speaking, all dukes aside. Prudence found herself reddening under his suddenly intent and knowing gaze. She turned away, suddenly flustered. She did not like him, not one little bit. She couldn't possibly like such a frivolous person. She refused to. He added in a purr. I'm sure you do like me. I'm very likable once you get to know me. Grace liked me after only a few minutes, didn't you, Miss Lim? Her traitorous little sister nodded enthusiastically. 
See? Even great Uncle Oswald came to like me once he knew me better. I grow on people, you see. So do warts, she snapped. And I never gave you leave to call me Prudence. I mismarried you to you, sir. And I will not enter into a false engagement or any other sort with you. Come, Grace. Come, James. And gesturing to the waiting footman, she marched imperiously off, dragging Grace by the hand. He strolled along beside her, seeming to take one step to her three. It is most unfashionable to scurry through the park, you know. I am not scurrying. Prudence moderated her pace in as dignified a manner as she could. No? He said as if it were the most ordinary of conversations. Would you say scuttling was more accurate? I wouldn't have thought so, but I will not bandy words with you, Prudence said frostily, tugging her giggling sister along. No? What will you bandy with me, then? I'll bandy whatever you like. I don't mind. His voice lowered suggestively, bringing an irresistible image to Prudence's mind of those stolen wicked moments when he had driven every proper thought from her head and swamped her body with wondrous sensations, and her mind ever since with impossible dreams. Prudence could not bring herself to answer him. It was a ridiculous situation, she thought crossly, like fleeing from a tiger only the tiger persisted on loping along beside her, making conversational banter, and looking at her in a way that made her hot and flustered. With fury, of course. She strode on toward the exit nearest to Great Uncle Oswald's house, Grace skipping along on one side of her, Lord Caradice strolling on the other, and James the footman stolidly bringing up the rear. She suddenly remembered something and confronted him with it. Why do you think Great Uncle Oswald's dictum is foolish? She asked, and then cursed herself for her own foolishness. He gave her a direct look. Your sister's entry into society could make no difference to your own likelihood of finding a husband. A beauty need not worry about attracting suitors. Sir Oswald is a man of enterprise. If there is a fly in the ointment, he will no doubt find a dowry large enough to sweeten the pot. It was as if he'd slapped her. It was not as if she didn't know she was plain and undesirable. She had known it all her life. Still, the careless words, so casually uttered, had hurt deeply. It was a warning that she would be very foolish not to heed, Prudence told herself. This man had the power to slip past her barriers. They were barely acquainted, and yet he had already hurt her unbelievably simply by uttering words, words she knew to be true. It wasn't only her fashionable great-uncle and London's leading mantua-maker who thought her too plain to be desired in marriage. This was from a rake, a man who really would know, a man who had been teasing her from who knew what motives, teasing, flirting, putting foolish impossible dreams in her head making her feel attractive, desirable, almost pretty, and then telling her she was a fly in the ointment. How could she have thought he was kind? She didn't want his double-edged aberration. She didn't need his false foolish dreams or his false betrothal. She had a betrothed, Philip. Philip, who did not care that she was plain and had given her a ring to prove it four and a half years ago. She strode blindly on, blinking fiercely to prevent the sudden uprush of scolding stupid tears she could feel prickling behind her eyes and in her throat, just waiting to spring forth in front of, in front of everyone, and humiliate her. She stumbled over a cobblestone, and his hand was there to support and steady her. What is wrong? He said in a low, concerned voice. What have I? She shook off his hand fiercely. I have the headache. Just leave me alone, she snapped. Just go away, she heard her voice crack. Stay away from me in future Lord Caradice, and stay away from my sisters too. And snatching her sister's hand, Prudence hurried away. Gideon stared after her. What the? He glanced at her footman and received such a look of contempt that he was stunned. What did I say? He demanded. But the footman merely shook his head and marched off after the two girls. 
Chapter 8 There is nothing more unbecoming in a man of quality than to laugh, to such a vulgar expression of the passion. William Congreve All I did was offer to act as her betrothed, so that her wretched sisters could make their coming out. Gideon had arrived at the dining room that evening to find his cousin already seated at the table, gazing abstractedly at a silver bowl of fruit set in its centre. And she sent me packing and stormed off in a huff. It was more than a huff. What the devil had he said that upset her so? Very unsettling, responded Edward. Shall I ring for the first course? Gideon frowned. Edward seemed a little preoccupied. Perhaps he was finding the whirl of London society a little overwhelming, but he had no time to worry about his cousin. His last words had upset Prudence, and he could not for the life of him imagine why. He'd gone over their conversation a dozen times in his head already, and still he was none the wiser. He ought to have put it out of his mind. It was what he usually did. Women were odd creatures, and often did get upset by the strangest things. But for some reason he couldn't put it out of his mind. He decided to consult his cousin. I thought it was what she wanted, but she behaved for all the world as if I'd mortally insulted her. He shook out his napkin and cast a worried look at the duke. Even her footman gave me the blackest look. Am I so notorious? Edward shook his head. I wouldn't call you notorious. A terrible flirt, perhaps. A little too free with other men's wives on several occasions, though it has to be admitted that the wives do seek you out. But notorious, no. What exactly did you say to her? Gideon made a frustrated gesture. I simply assured her that her sisters could not make the slightest difference to her own marriageability, that beauty would always find suitors, and that if there was a fly or flies in the ointment, Sir Oswald would sweeten the pot with a fat dowry, and she behaved as if I'd insulted her. He shook his head and helped himself to the nearest dish. I'm sorry about foisting them on you this afternoon, by the way, but I wanted to get Prudence alone. The Duke looked up and smiled, a smile of peculiar sweetness. Oh, yes, I didn't mind. Not at all. He sighed and helped himself to a dish of buttered crab with smelts. Gideon, frowning, spooned something onto his plate. So tell me, cuz, what's wrong with them? The Duke frowned. Wrong? The crabs are excellent. Not the crabs, the sisters, the flies in the ointment, Gideon said impatiently. What's wrong with them? Edward blinked. There's nothing wrong with them, Gideon. Not cross-eyed, or simple, or obviously deranged? Edward stared. No, they're quite... quite perfect. Gideon shrugged. They must take fits, then. Why in heaven's name would you think so? Apparently Sir Oswald is adamant that the other sisters would ruin Prudence's chances. He doesn't know about Otterbury, by the way, so he's insisting that Prudence be fired off first. And underneath the bluster, he's pretty shrewd, so there must be something to it. If he says the sisters could ruin her chances, there must be something very wrong with them. No, it will be their looks that have him worried. Gideon raised his brows. Ah, a trifle on the gargoyle side, are they? On the gargoyle? Edward paused, the fork halfway to his mouth. Do you mean to say you didn't notice? Notice what? Edward shook his head in disbelief. Far from being gargoyles, Prudence's sisters are all quite extraordinarily beautiful. Gideon frowned. Beautiful? Are they? Are you sure? He lifted his fork and paused. He glowered down at his plate. He had unaccountably filled it with stewed cucumbers. He detested stewed cucumbers. They quite dazzle the eyes, confirmed his cousin. As lovely as Prudence. The Duke's jaw dropped. After a moment, he recovered himself and said, Much lovelier than Prudence. That, I surmise, is the problem. Each one of her sisters, even little Grace, would outshine Prudence in every respect. Gideon stared at him in a moment's disbelief. I might not have taken much notice of the other sisters, but I did spend upwards of half an hour with young Grace, 
And though she's a nice little thing, and quite pretty, she's not a patch on prudence. Edward observed him solemnly for a moment, and then gave a large, satisfied sigh. This, he says, promises to be vastly entertaining. What does? Gideon asked, unaccountably annoyed by the smug expression on his cousin's face. But the Duke would not explain. I don't understand what you are hinting at, but you are wrong. I have no interest in Miss Merriweather. You know how I feel about marriage, and this is not about marriage anyway. It's merely a ruse to enable her sisters to find husbands. Gideon speared a veal olive viciously. I don't pretend to understand why the whole thing must be shrouded in such mystery and subterfuge, but if a stand-in fiancé is what she needs, I'll do it. I don't mind helping her out, as long as it's not the real thing, of course. Very selfless of you, cousin. You may scoff, but I think it's quite altruistic of me, Gideon said. There's not many men who will risk Parson's mousetrap out of sheer disinterested helpfulness. Extremely sheer the Duke murmured. To a female who is, after all, very little more than a stranger. But she is an orphan, you see, and... The Duke was overcome by a sudden choking fit. Gideon waited until he had subsided, and added in an austere tone. If she needs a false betrothed so badly that she must come calling on you to get one, there's no reason why she cannot accept my assistance. None at all, dear boy. Call on her great-uncle, by all means. Well, as a matter of fact, I did earlier this afternoon, and he assumed I was there to ask for her hand. Silly fellow. So what did you tell him? Oh, well, it was complicated, Gideon said in an offhand manner. He was practically frolicking with delight, and I could not get a word in to disabuse him of the notion. But now... Since the damage is done, Miss Prudence may take advantage of the misunderstanding. I don't mind, if it will help her sisters out. They being orphans, too, the Duke agreed in a choked voice. I don't see what there is to amuse you so, Edward, Gideon said crossly. Nothing, nothing at all, to be sure, the Duke murmured solemnly, his lips twitched. I don't suppose Sir Oswald gets his brandy from the same supplier, does he? He might have received a bad batch, too. He doesn't drink brandy, Gideon said, but he did serve the filthiest tasting wine. Prudence was cross, more than cross. She was furious. The moment she had arrived home from the park, Great Uncle Oswald had called them all into the front parlour and congratulated Prudence on her great good fortune. Lord Caradice, it seemed, had done the decent thing and had agreed to a betrothal with Prudence. And since they were all so keen on it, Charity could now begin her coming out, starting tonight, in fact, by accompanying him and Prudence to Lady Ostwither's private musical soiree. He had already sent Lady Ostwither a note. There must be some mistake, Prudence had said, amid the general excitement caused by this announcement. Lord Caradice has no interest in me. Lord Caradice, in fact, had just told her she was more or less unmarriageable. So what was his game? On the contrary, my dear, the fellow is not such a scapegrace as I thought him. He must have a conscience after all, for he was here, in this very room, dressed to the nines in his court and clothes, and announcing that he fully intended to do the decent thing by you, Prudence, my dear, dear girl. And, of course, I gave my permission. Twenty thousand a year! Visibly moved, Great Uncle Oswald embraced her, with Great Uncle Oswald wreathed in delighted grins, blinking back tears and speaking ecstatically of the Caradice fortune, Charity fretting in instant pleasure panic about whatever would she wear to Lady Ostwithers, and the twins skipping in delight around the room predicting their own imminent coming out, and twittering on about how handsome Lord Caradice was. There was not much prudence could do except grit her teeth and smile. The wretch! He was making mock of her, that was clear. One moment he was wheedling secrets out of her ten-year-old sister, the next he was suggesting a false betrothal to Prudence, and in the next breath he had told her she was plain and unmarriageable, and now, no, hold. Prudence frowned on a sudden thought. He must have spoken to Great Uncle Oswald before he met up with them in the park. It must be some devious ploy of his, 
but to what purpose? She was brooding about the sequence of events, when her great-uncle made an announcement that shocked her out of her reverie. "'I shall send a notice to the Morning Post immediately.' "'No!' exclaimed Prudence, horrified. "'You must not. Grandpapa would see it.' "'Why on earth not, my dear? You've made a conquest of a fellow the tabbies have been stalking for years. Why not puff it off to the world? Nothing to hide, have we?' No, no, of course not. It's just that, uh, Prudence snatched an excuse from the air. Lord Caradice is in mourning. Great Uncle Oswald looked surprised. I'm sorry to hear it. I hadn't heard. Who was it who died, my dear? And if he is in mourning, come to think of it, why does his raiment not proclaim the fact? He was wearing a blue coat. Dash it all, blue! Upon my soul, the fellow is a careless dresser. Prudence thought frantically. Ah, uh, his great-aunt died, but she had a horror of black, so she requested that her family continue to wear colours for her. Great-uncle Oswald pulled a face. Dashed peculiar, these modern notions. Colours for mourning, for sure. Which great-aunt was it? Not Estelle, was it? Or Gussie? I hope it wasn't Gussie, although, come to think of it, Gussie is Caradice's aunt, not a great-aunt at all. Well, that's a relief. Always been fond of Gussie. Belatedly, Prudence realised great-uncle Oswald was likely to be acquainted with all of Lord Caradice's more elderly relatives. Uh, no, I don't think it was Estelle or Gussie. I, uh, I think this great-aunt lived a very retired life. In Wales. Oh, Wales. That explains it, said Great Uncle Oswald, quite as if Wales were out of Mongolia. And you didn't catch the name, eh? No mourning. Dashed odd business all around. Still, if he wants a quiet betrothal, I'll not oppose it. Twenty thousand pounds a year. I think that calls for a toast. Lord Caradice must have meant what he said in the park, Prue whispered Grace, while great-uncle Oswald poured them each a celebratory half-glass of dandelion wine. About wanting to be your fiancé full. Prudence nodded slowly. Yes, but why? That's the question, Grace, my love. Why would Lord Caradice want to enter into a false betrothal with me? I trust him not at all. Grace looked solemn. I don't think he wants a false betrothal, Prue. I think he really likes you. Prudence sniffed. Nonsense. What he likes is playing games. He's just teasing me, dearest. The man is frivolous to his bones. He knows I am promised to Philip. Hope had come up behind them and overheard Grace's words. Of course he likes you, Prue. Why, in the park, he could barely take his eyes off you. He didn't even look at charity, added Faith. Or any of us except you. Prudence raised an eyebrow at Charity for confirmation of this incredible tale. Charity shook her head. I'm sorry, Prue. I didn't notice. I was a little distracted by the other sights in the park. Hope and Faith burst into giggles and went into a huddle of whispers. Charity turned a little pink. Charity also has an admirer, exclaimed Hope slyly. Oh, don't be silly, Hope, said Charity but she looked a little self-conscious. Eh? What's that? Young Charity made a conquest already, has she? exclaimed Great Uncle Oswald in great humour. Don't surprise me at all. Such a dazzling creature you are, my dear. I'm sure we'll have him coming around in droves soon enough, now that we've got Prudence and young Caradice sorted out. Beaming, he raised a glass of dandelion wine. To the happy couple, Prudence set down her glass. She could not drink, not even to a false betrothal, and to a man who had clearly done it all just to tease her. She felt wretchedly guilty about Great Uncle Oswald's delight in her marrying into a title and a fortune. He would be horrified to learn she would actually marry a penniless younger son of an undistinguished family. Come on, Prue, my dear, drink up. Do you a power of good, dandelion wine. Strengthens the blood, you know. Great Uncle Oswald lifted his glass. To the future Lady Caradice. That was a toast Prudence could drink to. 
she could drink with a clear conscience to his unfortunate future wife. She heartily pitied the poor woman, whoever she would be. She sipped obediently, then returned to the subject of Charity's mystery bow. Now, Charity, tell us about this admirer. She did not know what devious game Lord Caradice was playing, but if it meant that Charity had the chance to be safely settled, she would do her best to turn it to her advantage. Never fret, Prudence, my dear, exclaimed Great Uncle Oswald. We'll fire young Charity off with no trouble at all, no trouble at all. Ravishing creature she is. It was you I was worried about, but you've done us all proud, my dear. Twenty thousand a year. I couldn't be more delighted. Upon my word, I couldn't. Our little Prudence, settled at last. Drink up, gals, drink up. He raised his glass and drained it of every last drop of dandelion wine. I'll speak to Caradice and work out when we can have the betrothal celebration. If he's gadding about town in colours, I can't imagine his Welsh great-aunt would object to a small, tasteful party. Prudence drank mechanically. As long as it remained a family secret, there should be no difficulty. She was confident she could carry off a false betrothal. She was almost confident she could manage Lord Caradice. Forewarned was forearmed, after all. All she had to do was keep Great Uncle Oswald happy and ensure Charity made a good marriage to a kind and loving man. In the meantime, she needed to know more about this mysterious admirer in the park. Charity had a streak of selflessness in her that could be fatal. Prudence didn't want her lovely, gentle sister to be dazzled into marriage, nor to sacrifice her own happiness in order to make her sister safe. Marriage was supposed to be joyful. Prudence had learned that by observing her loving parents. Her younger sisters remembered only the harshness of grandpapa and duty. Charity desperately needed to be loved, all her sisters did, to make up for the terrible childhood they'd had. Prudence had promised them the sunshine and laughter and love and happiness her parents had had, and she was determined that if Charity married, it would be for love. Nothing else would do. If necessary, Prudence would find another way to save them all from Grandpapa. She turned back to her sister. Charity, dearest, pray, don't be shy. Tell us about this admiring gentleman. Charity blushed. Oh, Hope exaggerates. There wasn't anyone in particular, she said. Several gentlemen asked to be introduced, in fact. No one in particular? What a bouncer! interrupted Hope. Why, a certain gentleman could not take his eyes off you, Charity, and you were looking right back. Charity, cheeks rosy, shook her head vigorously. Hush! It's nothing. Just nothing. You must not refine upon it. He... They were just being polite, that's all. Who couldn't take his eyes off Charity? asked Prudence. Hope opened her mouth, but Charity shot her a look that silenced her. Nobody. The twins are talking nonsense. She looked daggers at her giggling twin sisters. You are such children. But Prudence didn't believe her denials. Hope, who are you talking about? Hope waved her hand airily. That pudgy little duke, of course. Lord Caradice's cousin, Hermit Ned, the Duke of Dinstable. He couldn't take his eyes off Charity from the moment they were introduced, and she was all cow eyes in return. He is not pudgy. Charity pounced on her sister with fury. He's not the slightest bit pudgy. He's solid and strong, and he's handsome and kind and intelligent and... And worth thirty thousand a year, begad! exclaimed Great Uncle Oswald. Prudence stared at her sister in amazement. She'd never seen Charity so vehement, so protective, so passionate. The Duke of Dinstable, she said. But how? When? She broke off. It must have happened when he took the girls for the ride in the Landau. The Duke of Dinstable? I think that calls for a little more dandelion. No. Hang it. If we're celebrating a duke, it had better be the very best stuff. Great Uncle Oswald gleefully yanked on the bell cord. A bottle of our finest cowslip niblet. We are celebrating. What a day! What a day! A baron already hooked, and now the nibble of a duke on our line. 
Romance is in the air, girls, to the tune of fifty thousand a year. Bless my soul, I haven't had so much excitement in years. Lady Ostwith the soiree was just what Prudence would have wanted for Charity's first appearance in society. The gathering was small, only about fifty or so people, but very select. And since Lady Ostwither's own daughter was making her coming out this season, Lady Ostwither had made certain many of the guests were wealthy and eligible young gentlemen. Having met Prudence, Lady Ostwither was rather disconcerted when Sir Oswald Merridew's second orphan niece turned out to be a diamond of the first water. She collected her face with commendable dignity and said in a voice that grated only a little, You might have warned me, Sir Oswald. However, being a kindly lady, she made both girls welcome, and if it galled her to see so many of the young men she'd earmarked for her daughter, now vying to find Charity the best seat, the most refreshing lemonade, and anything else that should take her fancy, she didn't allow it to show for more than a moment or two. Prudence watched the buzz around her sister with satisfaction. There would be plenty of young men for Charity to choose from. If Hope and Faith were wrong about the Duke of Dinstable, there were other fish in Charity's sea. And though her sister was surely the most beautiful and sweet-natured girl, Prudence could not really see her becoming a duchess. A duke would expect to marry within his own rank, surely. Charity was only the granddaughter of an obscure and unfashionable baron, a girl, moreover, whose father had made a mesalliance with the daughter of a tradesman. Grandpapa had drummed that floor into them time and time again. Would inferior breeding matter to a duke? What nonsense, she told herself. There was no reason to fret at this point. She had no real cause to think the duke was interested in charity, only the mischievous reports of a pair of silly young girls, and charity's blushes and vehement defence of him. If there was truth in the report, Prudence would do what she could to promote the match, but in the meantime it was important that charity meet a variety of eligible gentlemen and then there would be the twins to be settled. As for herself, she would look after Grace. She wondered whether a letter had arrived from India. She left money with the scullery maid to give to her brother in the village, and had written out Great Uncle Oswald's address for him, but she was not sure how well the lad could read and write, and if he copied the address wrongly, well, how frail a thing was a letter, to carry such weighty responsibilities, and with so many possibilities for something to go wrong. All the more reason for trust and faith to remain strong, Prudence reminded herself firmly. That particular shade of sage is exquisite on you, my Prudence. A dark velvet voice murmured in her ear. She whirled. <laughs> Lord Caradice! He was staring at her in a way that made her feel hot all over, even though her gown was rather thin and she had been feeling a little chilly. She tugged her shawl around her. He did not move, but it was as if his eyes caressed her all over. Prudence felt the heat spread. I asked you to stay away from me. He simply smiled, and Prudence could see why so many women had made fools of themselves over him. Well, she would not be one of them. I would appreciate it if you would stop, stop ogling me like that, she hissed, tugging her very modest neckline higher. It is very embarrassing. She folded her arms across her breasts defensively. He tried to look contrite. It wasn't me, he confessed. It was my eyes. They are bold and easily led, and have no sense of propriety. His eyes wandered back to where her arms were folded, and he added softly, Besides, you are so lovely. My poor eyes cannot resist the temptation you give them. Prudence went breathless with pleasure at the unexpected compliment. You are so lovely. She tried to squash the small surge of delight. It was utter foolishness to believe a word he said, of course. Such empty flattery no doubt came to his lips as easily as breathing. In the park earlier he'd implied she was too plain to attract a husband. A fly in the ointment. He was flirting, and only naive country nobodies would fall for it. She pursed her mouth in what she hoped was a governessy fashion. You are talking nonsense. A short time ago you said I was the fly in the ointment of my sister's marriages and that— I said nothing of the sort, he interrupted indignantly. 
Why would I say anything so patently ridiculous? You did too, in the park. I did not. In fact, I distinctly recall telling you that you would have no trouble finding a husband. Beauties like you invariably attract suitors in droves, and that whatever is wrong with your sisters, it wouldn't lessen your own chances. She stared at him suspiciously. Beauties like her. He couldn't possibly mean it. Was he just trying to make up for lost ground? What do you mean, whatever is wrong with my sisters? There is nothing wrong with my sisters. No, that's what Edward says too, so you've no need to worry. He heaved a satisfied sigh. So that's why you were cross with me, because I insulted your sisters. I wondered about it all evening. I'm sorry. I'm sure they're very nice girls, and you'll manage to find someone for them eventually. Prudence couldn't think of a thing to say. He'd thought her beautiful sisters were the fly in the ointment. He'd called Prudence a beauty. He couldn't possibly be sincere. But he sounded sincere. Was his eyesight defective? She peered into his eyes, wondering. Instantly, they got that dark, sleepy, intent look in them. The look she knew meant she needed to be wary. They ran over her in a caressing manner that made her shiver, and not from cold. His voice deepened. Have I told you how lovely you look tonight, in that sage gown? It brings out the glorious colour of your hair, and makes me imagine that I could drown in the crystal depths of your eyes, quite happily. Yes, but I think you talk a lot of nonsense, and I asked you to stay away from me, and will you please stop ogling me? She tried to sound severe, but oh how his compliments went to her head. He instantly looked crushed. But as she had seen him produce the exact same expression for Great Uncle Oswald, his cousin, and a butler, she was in no way fooled by his apologetic mien. His eyes gleamed with laughter. The man had not a contrite bone in his body. I would if I could, but it's my eyes. They cannot resist you, you see. I will beat them for their forwardness. He batted his lashes rapidly, then gave her a sleepy, wicked look, purely sinful. Prudence found her own lips twitching with amusement. She fought to keep a straight face. He was an incorrigible rogue. She should not encourage him. But, oh Lord, how was she ever to resist him? Her upbringing had armed her against brutality, scorn, and harshness. She had no defence against the pleasures of compliments, and warmth, and laughter, and being told she looked lovely. I will have you know. I was raised according to the rules of the strictest propriety, she told him severely. No. Were you? He said sympathetically. Never mind. That's the nice thing about growing older. One can escape the results of one's upbringing. Escape our upbringing? His words jolted her. Suddenly all her problems rolled back into place. She ought not to be standing here flirting. Yes, that's what she'd been doing, flirting with Lord Caradice. He added lightly, Things change. People change. Some of them. Most delightfully. His eyes ran over her appreciatively. Feeling a wave of warmth as a direct result of his look, Prudence released her breath slowly. And some things didn't change, unless you made them happen. She had to make Lord Caradice go away. She couldn't think straight when he was near. She moved to the room where people were gathering for the musical recital. Lord Caradice followed. Twice now she'd asked him to stay away from her, and did he take the slightest bit of notice? She recalled her other grievance. I have another bone to pick with you. Oh, we can do better than bones, surely. He prowled forward. She backed away, giving him her frostiest, most repellent look. His eyes narrowed in amusement. My word! What a peculiar expression. Even something that disagrees with you, my dear, he said in a solicitous voice. Not surprising, that frightful weedy tea stuff your great uncle serves. Remembering the purge, Prudence flushed, then recollected that Lord Caradice had not witnessed that little debacle. I wish he had served you something much worse than his tea, she declared callously. Something poisonous. He did. Some atrocious dandelion wine. Ghastly. How dare you sneak off behind my back and arrange to get yourself falsely betrothed to me? Did I do that? How very shocking of me. 
Lord Caradice purred. And all the time I thought that was you, arriving at my cousin's house, all of a twitter because you'd claimed to be betrothed. Oh! Mortified, Prudence felt her face heat even more. That, yes, that. His eyes quizzed her so shamelessly that Prudence felt quite irritable. It was very bad of me, I know. However, I have already apologized several times for it, and since you are so uncivil as to continue reminding me of the fact, I shall repeat myself. I am very sorry for embroiling you in my problems. Oh, but Prudence, his voice was like warm, rich chocolate. I am happy to be embroiled in anything of your... I did not give you leave to use my first name, sir. Prudence cut him off primly, certain by the look in his eyes that he was going to say something vastly improper. He led her to a small group of chairs. No, you didn't, and you are quite right to point it out to me, he said, pulling a chair forward for her. A singularly inappropriate name it is, too. I shall not use it in future. It was one thing to dislike your own name, and quite another for him to cast aspersions on it, but Prudence decided not to take issue. She had another fish to fry. She allowed herself to be seated, then said, Now, about your visit to my great-uncle this afternoon. Did it upset him? He sat down beside her. Well, no. He wasn't distressed, concerned, offended, or enraged. Prudence gritted her teeth. No, of course not, but he was, in fact, quite pleased. Prudence refused to answer. It was difficult enough to deliver a reprimand without having to admit that his visit had made her elderly relative perfectly, quite vulgarly ecstatic. Whatever my great uncle may have thought, you had no right to suggest that I have agreed to a betrothal, she said severely. I didn't. It was bad enough, she broke off. What did you say? I didn't. Didn't what? Suggest that you had agreed to a betrothal, he said. In fact, I don't recall saying anything of the sort. It never even crossed my mind. Prudence scanned his face intently, unsure of whether he was teasing her or telling the truth. He was a very difficult man to read. He seemed to find everything amusing. The whole thing was Sir Oswald's idea. He shrugged and stretched out his long legs in front of him. He simply decided I was wearing court in clothes, and given our previous four-year history, leaped to the conclusion I had finally come to ask permission to wed you. I didn't ask, but he gave it anyway, and seems to think it a done deal. His eyebrows rose in polite inquiry. Tell me, does he always make such ludicrous leaps in logic? Oh. Prudence didn't know where to look. It sounded very plausible. She could easily imagine Great Uncle Oswald jumping to false conclusions. And if the misunderstanding was anyone's fault, it was hers, for precipitating the whole ridiculous mess with her lies. She glanced across at Charity, surrounded by Beau. Prudence might regret the lies, but she could not regret the results. Even if too close an acquaintance with Lord Caradise was one of them, she felt a wave of warmth pass across her skin. She turned back to him. I owe you an apology. Again. He waved his hand airily. Not at all. In any case, since Grace so kindly explained everything to me in the park, I have decided to remain betrothed to you, so you need not fret your mercurial elderly relative any more. Distracted as she was by the interplay between Charity and her companions, it took a moment or two for his words to sink in. She swung around. You've decided what? He smiled slowly, a smile that made her breathless even as she wanted to strangle him. Yes, I've decided to overlook your cavalier treatment of my love letters and forgive you, and so we remain betrothed. Great Uncle Oswald and I are in perfect accord. For a change. They weren't love letters. They were tailor's bills. And we are not betrothed. Ah, but the old gentleman thought the burning of the letters most affectingly romantic. So did I, for that matter. That tailor grossly overcharges. And besides, you know you need me, Imp. I don't need you, and... What did you just call me? Imp. It's short for imprudence. 
much more appropriate. Whoever named you Prudence was ill-advised. There is not a shred of prudence or caution in you. He observed her indignant reaction with patent approval, then commented affably, You know, huffing and puffing like that shows off your bosom very prettily. Prudence instantly stopped breathing. He smiled, a slow devilish invitation to wickedness. It's a very nice bosom. You should show it off. I was not show— There's no point arguing. You know you need me, Prudence. I know no such thing, she hissed. Now hush. Miss Ostwither is about to perform on the violin. He laid his hand on her arm soothingly and murmured, You don't need to admit it here and now. You can wait until we are alone. His thumb stroked her skin, sending warm shivers down her spine. She shook off his hand furiously. I shall take care never to be alone with you again, Lord Caradice, she whispered frostily. He leaned forward and murmured, Is that a challenge? I love a challenge. So, how will you admit your need of me? His warm breath heated her skin. He was far too close. She edged away. I will never admit any such thing. He gave her a heated look from beneath his dark lashes. It will be our little secret, then. He purred. I love secrets. Oh, hush! Chapter 9 Eternity was in our lips and eyes, bliss in our brows. William Shakespeare He sat back as the performance commenced. One long leg crossed over the other, his arm resting casually along the back of her chair. His hand dangled an inch or so from her bare skin. Did he know she could barely think, let alone speak, for awareness of the proximity of his fingers? Of course he knew. He was a rake. This is what he did, flustered virtuous ladies merely by his proximity. And shameless conversation. Prudence refused to be flustered. She concentrated on the concert, and utterly ignored the way his fingers occasionally brushed her skin. If she shivered occasionally, it was caused by a draught. After some moments, he leaned forward and whispered in her ear, his breath warm against her skin. If we were not betrothed, your sister would not now be sitting with my cousin, drinking Lady Ostwither's vile rat of fear, and listening to that girl inflict on us that excruciating noise she alleges is something Mozart created. Hush! She is our hostess's daughter. Yes, but from the sounds emanating from her, she must be standing on a cat, and I don't approve of cruelty to animals. Or ears. But you digress. He reprimanded her. We were discussing the necessity for our betrothal to stand. I digress. Prudence whispered indignantly, then bit her tongue. She would not take his bait. It was both impolite to her hostess and unwise tactically. His words were true. If great-uncle Oswald realized Prudence and Lord Caradice were not betrothed and never had been, Charity wouldn't be here, attended by several very eligible gentlemen. She glanced across at her sister. It was time to change the topic. Tell me, she whispered, who is the gentleman standing near my sister just now? Lord Caradice glanced over. Which one? There's a crowd of them. Carver is the tall yellow-haired fellow standing behind her. The soppy-looking thin one in the atrocious yellow velvet coat is young Hopeton, and as for the medium-sized duke on her left, weren't you betrothed to him at one point? Thank you, she whispered frostily. Miss Ostwither finished her piece and was politely applauded. She lifted her violin again, and Lord Caradice groaned. As Miss Ostwither murdered Mozart once more, he leaned across his mouth so close to Prudence's ear she could feel his heat, and whispered, Whoever that girl's music master is, he should be hanged, drawn, and quartered, preferably while she plays him a dirge on that thing. Unsuccessfully, she smothered a giggle. Pray, do not be so frivolous as to giggle at a serious musical event, he murmured austerely. Innocent cats gave their lives for this. She giggled again, and several people shushed them. 
The hand that had been resting so perilously close to her bare skin moved, and she felt the light touch of one fingertip. Her body burned with awareness of it. She tried to shrug it off. It hovered, then returned, stroking her skin in tiny thistle-down circles. The sensation was deliciously unsettling. Prudence shivered. How could a shoulder be so sensitive? She moved in her seat. The fingertip caress followed. She tried to wriggle away from it. You'll fall off that seat if you move much farther, he whispered. Prudence sat very straight on her seat for the remainder of the recital, clutching her reticule on her lap. She would have liked very much to biff him with it, but the circumstances made it impossible. There was nothing she could do. The man was incorrigible. He had no conscience at all. She tried to focus her attention on Miss Ostwither. It was not possible. Tiny sensations of pleasure rippled through her, spreading from that one tiny point to the rest of her body. Prudence fought them. A second finger joined the first. She sat up in rigid indignation. A silent message of virtue outraged. Unfortunately, it brought the rest of his fingers in contact with her skin. Now four long, strong fingers and a thumb sent tiny, hot ripples of sensation through her. Prudence immediately slumped in her seat to sever the connection. Some things were more important than elegance. He shifted casually, and the long, wicked fingers once again trailed feather-like twirls across her skin. Prudence sat hunched in her chair, fighting each insidious shiver of pleasure his touch created. She became hotter and hotter and crosser and crosser. Finally, Miss Ostwither's recital came to a screeching climax, and an interval was declared. Prudence almost leaped from her seat and hurried away from Lord Caradice as fast as she could. He strolled after her, and with no ceremony tucked her hand in his arm and resumed the conversation. Are you still sniffy with me over the resumption of our betrothal? I am not sniffy, and I don't wish to discuss it or anything else with you. I have had quite enough of your company, thank you. She tried to tug her hand out from his. He ignored her. Now, Miss Imp, you must be betrothed to somebody. After all, you can't wait around forever for a fellow who goes off and gets himself squashed by elephants. Very careless sort of fellow, this otter clogs. Won't do for you at all. You need somebody reliable. On hand. Like me. Reliable? You? Prudence made a rude sound under her breath, and bowed politely to a passing acquaintance. And his name is Otterbury. He gestured to his long, elegant form. At least I have the decency to remain unsquashed by elephants. I doubt even an elephant could squash you, she snapped, goaded. Besides, Philip has not been squashed by an elephant. How do you know? He moved forward, towing her inexorably with him. I would have heard from his mother. She was our neighbour in Norfolk, you know. Ah, and it must have been that tiger that got him. It was not a tiger. This is a ridiculous conversation. It is indeed. But you're the one who brought Otterbottom up in the first place. I have no idea why we're wasting time discussing some stupid fellow who went off to live with elephants. He must be addled in the brain. If you were mine, I'd never leave you, Prudence. I couldn't. For a moment, Prudence couldn't breathe. His words were so enticing, his voice so deep and dark and sounding so very sincere. His arm felt strong and warm and hard under her gloved hand, and the faint scent of his cologne teased her senses. She tried to tell herself it was the aftermath of those wicked caresses. How could such a light touch have such a pervasive effect on her entire body? She glanced around. Somehow, as they'd strolled, he'd manoeuvred them toward a secluded alcove without her realising. Dark red velvet curtains draped across it. She backed against them, instinctively needing the support of the wall or window the curtains covered, but found herself floundering in red velvet folds instead. He reached across her shoulder and brushed one of the curtains aside. She glanced around. No wall or window. The curtains concealed a door. He prowled toward her, so close she could feel his breath on her skin. She found herself backing away into the room behind. It was a small room, dim and private. 
The red velvet folds fell back into place. He closed the door behind him, and she heard a key click. The sounds of the ball receded. All Prudence could hear was the sound of her own heart thudding. Mere minutes after she'd sworn it would never happen again, she was alone with Lord Caradice. Breathless, flustered, and suddenly unsure of herself, she glanced up at his face. His eyes were warm and unfathomable, and seemed to wrap her in their velvety depths. No laughing devils in them now to warn her away. He bent, and suddenly Prudence knew he was going to kiss her. She held up her hands to ward him off, and somehow they simply came to rest against his chest. His hands caught her around the waist and drew her to him until they were hip to hip, chest to chest, and almost mouth to mouth. Oh, where was the pasteboard reticule when she needed it? Why had she brought the silk one? Lord Caradice, she began. Gideon, he corrected, and captured her mouth before she could utter another word. The tip of his tongue traced her lips, teasing, exploring, probing. Soft and tender at first, he grew more demanding. She felt herself softening, melting under the sweet onslaught of his mouth. She'd always understood kissing was a simple matter of lips meeting, and yet there was nothing simple at all about these kisses. She'd thought she knew what it was like to be kissed by him. She was wrong. A long, delicious shudder passed through her body. She gasped, and he possessed her mouth fully, lavishing himself on her, in her, ravishing her senses with delight. Prudence grew dizzy with pleasure. She could taste him inside her, the unique, intoxicating flavor of Gideon, and desire. She could taste it in the growing urgency of his kisses, in the fevered need of his embrace, in the searching, caressing mouth. A hunger deep within him, for her, for Prudence Meridue, deep, lavish hunger. His need consumed her. It called to something deep within her, and the last shreds of her resistance melted. She clung to his shoulders and kissed him back. He was addictive. Her hand slid over his clothing, warmed by the rock-solid muscles of his chest. His heart pounded under her fingers. Her knees weakened, and she leaned into him for support. His stomach was tight and hard. His long, hard thighs cradled her softness. She slid her hands up his body and wound them around his neck. Her fingers slipped into his hair. His hands slipped into her bodice. She froze and remembered who she was and what she owed. No, she whispered. He drew back slightly and seemed to read something in her face because his mouth twisted ruefully. His breath came in ragged gasps. His eyes burned, dark embers of heat. His desire was as powerful and potent as ever. He laid the back of his fingers against her cheek and slowly, slowly trailed them down to her jawline. It was the lightest of sensations, the most exquisite of caresses. Prudence tried very hard not to melt at the simple tenderness of the gesture. She did her best not to drown in the heat of his eyes, so dark and intense, and full of need. She told herself she should be warned by the small possessive smile that played about his lips as he watched her shiver under his hand. She couldn't make herself move away. His touch engendered feelings in her, unnameable, yearning feelings, feelings she shouldn't, mustn't, didn't want to have. Not for him. She licked her lips and tried to muster her resolve. It was pitifully small but her conscience burned. She stepped around him and made herself walk to the door on legs that still trembled. As she turned the key in the lock, she recalled how he'd said he loved a challenge. It's not fair, she whispered. What's not fair? His voice was soft. Tempting me like this, toying with me, with my feelings. He opened his mouth to respond, some flippant, rakish comment she was sure, and she couldn't bear it if he did. She was so swamped with emotion herself, so she cut him off and said in a rush, I've told you and told you I'm not free, and you take no notice of me. I know you think I'm a liar, and I don't. You have no idea what I think, but I'll tell you this, Miss Imp. I don't think of you as a liar. 
she gaped. How could he not after all the lies she had told? He flicked her chin lightly, and her mouth closed. I don't count that nonsense you told your uncle. You had good reason, I gather. But you're a rarity in the London ton, an honest woman. I shan't forget that morning in the Duke's house, when your uncle came in. You could have snagged me, claimed I'd compromised you, and though I'm no bargain, you could nevertheless have gained a fortune and a title. He smiled a little raggedly. His chest was still heaving. She tried not to watch. You promised me it wasn't a trap, and you kept your word. I couldn't name another woman who would do that, Miss Imp. Couldn't name another woman whose promise I would trust. She heaved a great sigh, frustration mixed with relief. Then please, do not play these seductive games with me. I know it's just a bad habit you've got into, but truly, I cannot bear it. I am not of your world. I don't know how to play such games, and I don't know how to... She broke off abruptly. She'd been about to admit that she didn't know how to resist him. That would be fatal. He paused a moment, then said, What makes you think it is a game? It can be nothing else, she said simply. You say you believe in my promises, and I am promised to Philip Otterbury. She looked at him, expecting he would acknowledge her words. He said nothing. A slight frown knotted his brows. She drew out the thin gold chain she always wore. On it was strung a golden ring of outmoded design, a large red stone glittering at its centre. Philip's great-grandmother's betrothal ring. It is given to the first bride of the family each generation. It represents the sacred promise I made him, a promise I will not break, no matter how you may fluster me with your seductive wiles and caressing ways. She flushed and added, I am bound to Philip in other, more private ways, but this is the visual symbol. I have worn it for four and a half years. I have never taken it off. Can you understand that, Lord Caradice? She gazed up at him earnestly. Can you respect it? I can but try, he said slowly. He gave her a crooked smile, in which regret was mixed with wry self-knowledge. Though I confess, my bad habits may get the better of me. Prudence sighed tremulously. He couldn't help himself. Even the man's apologies were seductive. She clutched Philip's ring like a talisman. Friends, then? She said, with valiant resolve. He heaved a gloomy sigh. Very well. Friends it shall be, though it will ruin my reputation if it gets out. She smiled shakily at him, and he slipped her arm through his. Our betrothal foe still stands, of course, he added, though outside the family. It shall be as secret as the grave. He drew her through the red velvet curtains, out into the alcove. The grave. His words jolted Prudence's memory. She opened her mouth to inform him of her latest folly, his imaginary mourning, but was interrupted. Lord Caradice, you wicked, wicked man. I thought I recognized those divine shoulders. Where have you been hiding? A light, brittle laugh and a knowing look accompanied the words. A dark-haired lady, with a bodice half the size of Prudence's, laid a hand on Lord Caradice's other arm. He bowed instantly. All light-hearted charm again. Mrs. Crowther, you look very dashing tonight. Red is certainly your colour. So much for his compliments, Prudence thought, feeling cross that they'd been interrupted. Sage was her colour. Red was this Mrs. Crowther's, too practised by half. Lord Caradice introduced Prudence, and though she was polite enough, Mrs. Crowther obviously thought her of little account. Soon they were surrounded by Mrs. Crowther's friends, Lord Caradice's friends too, it appeared. All the women were beautiful, or if not precisely beautiful, extremely attractive, and sophisticated, and the men looked Prudence over with bored, speculative eyes, glancing from her to Lord Caradice and back. 
Their suave knowing looks made her palm itch to slap them. Now, my dear Caradise, exclaimed Mrs. Crowther, you must come and settle a question my friends and I have been debating. Oh, yes, do, gushed a lady whose name Prudence couldn't recall. You are such an exquisite judge of what suits a lady best. Prudence tried not to pull a face. You must decide which is more frightful. Lady Bentnick's ridiculous turban with so many plumes she looks like a funeral hearse. Or the Dowager Duchess's cornet with the green velvet peaks frothing with lace and sprouting daisies at the top for all the world like a lace-encrusted mountain top. We have wagered on it, you see. Yes, please do go, Lord Caradise, Prudence said immediately. I see my sister signalling me. I must go to her. It was almost true. Besides, she needed to meet the other gentlemen, who were dancing attendance on charity. She stood on the edge of charity's circle, and watched Lord Caradise and Mrs. Crowther from across the room. There was much laughter and drinking, and to her intense annoyance a lot of touching of Lord Caradice's arms and hands by the ladies, and once, by Mrs. Crowther, a most familiar pat on his jaw. It was apparent to her that Lord Caradice and several of these ladies had been, were still, on extremely familiar terms. Prudence didn't like Mrs. Crowther or her friends, she decided but she was grateful to her for reminding her of a truth she'd been in danger of forgetting. Lord Caradice was a practised charmer, a frivolous tease. Women flocked to his side, touched him in a familiar manner, laughed with him intimately, flirted with him, and he flirted back. Because that was what he was, she told herself sternly. She wasn't condemning him for it, it was simply the way he was. He was a rake and as such not to be taken seriously, and never to be trusted. Gideon watched Prudence tend to her sister, smiling to himself at her little mother hen stance. He'd released her half reluctantly. He didn't want her to leave, but he also didn't quite like Prudence talking to Mrs. Crowther and her flighty friends. Teresa Crowther had a nasty tongue on her and an eye for gossip, and her friends were loose and silly. He didn't feel comfortable seeing them and Prudence together. He allowed himself to be led across the room, and smiled absently through the remainder of the conversation, wondering what he'd ever seen in Teresa Crowther, and whether he'd ever really enjoyed this shallow, vapid company. My sincere condolences, Caradice, a voice behind him said. Gideon turned, startled. Condolences? For what? A pained look crossed Sir Oswald's face. For whom? I think you meant Caradice. It's perfectly shocking the way you younger fellows mangle the language. He eyed Gideon's severe evening dress with approbation. At least you've had the decency not to wear colours tonight, though I am a believer in respecting the wishes of the dead. Gideon stared at him blankly. The wishes of the dead? What dead? Could the old chap be talking about Brummel, who'd introduced the fashion of black evening clothes, and who'd recently disappeared from society? As a matter of fact, I never wear colours in the evening, he said. But he isn't dead, Sir Oswald. He's living on the continent somewhere, fleeing debts. Sir Oswald frowned. Fleeing debts? There's no reason to go into mourning for people fleeing debts, Caradice. Or is that what they do in Wales? Dashed peculiar. All at sea, Gideon decided to ignore the bizarre Welsh references. I'm talking about Beau Brummel, he said. Brummel? What's he got to do with it? Why the devil are we talking about Brummel? Didn't you say he was dead? No. Is he? Can't say I'm surprised. Living among foreigners is a risky business. I know. Did it myself for years. Well, well, old Brummel, eh? What took him off? The drink, I'll be bound. Sir Oswald pursed his lips disapprovingly at the glass of champagne Gideon held in his hand. Gideon, feeling as if he was having a conversation in Bedlam, said carefully, I didn't say he was dead. As far as I know, he is still alive and living on the continent. Sir Oswald's bushy white brows bristled with indignation. Well, dash it all, man, I knew that. The whole of the ton knows that, known it for ages. What the devil are you regaling me with news so old it has mould on it, eh? 
Gideon drained his glass and looked around for a servant. He needed something a little stronger than champagne to cope with this conversation, but not brandy. My apologies, Sir Oswald. Shall we start again? Who is dead? Your great aunt, of course. My great aunt? Yes. Sorry to hear about it. My condolences, Caradice. I didn't know her myself, but I'm sure it's a great loss. When was the funeral? Gideon opened his mouth to explain that as far as he knew, Great Aunt Estelle was currently abroad, scandalizing most of her relatives by traveling unchaperoned with an Italian count. A small breathless female squeezed suddenly in between Gideon and Great Uncle Oswald, Miss Prudence Meridew, looking flushed and beautiful and conspicuously guilty. Of course. The moment conversations made no sense, Miss Imprudence would be at the bottom of it. He should be used to it by now. He smiled down at her, tucked her hand under his arm, and signalled a passing waiter to bring her a drink. Sir Oswald beamed benevolently at the gesture. Ah, Prudence, my dear, I'm just asking Caradice here about the funeral. In Wales, I suppose it was, Caradice? Never been to a Welsh funeral? Prudence said hurriedly. It was a very small private affair, I believe. Was it not, Lord Caradice? She sent him an urgent look. Gideon nodded. Oh, yes, Sir Oswald, it was very small. So tiny, in fact, that it almost didn't exist. A small hand squeezed his arm, not with affection. So he added, and completely private. Wales, you know. Great Uncle Oswald nodded understandingly. The hand relaxed. And which great aunt was it? For a moment I thought it might be Estelle. Gave me a nasty turn, but Prudence said no. I didn't know you had any relatives in Wales. She lived a very retired life, I believe, Prudence said. Oh, very retired, Gideon agreed. The family hardly knew she was there at all. The waiter arrived with the drink Gideon had requested. Across Prudence's head, Sir Oswald waggled his eyebrows at Gideon in a man-to-man -man fashion. Gideon, not knowing what else to do, waggled his back. Sir Oswald stared. His bushy brows beetled slowly upward. Oh, like that, was it? Packed off to Wales, was she? I see now why the whole thing was kept so dashed quiet. Take your point, Caradice. I'll say no more about it, then. Ladies present and all that. Now, Prudence, my dear, you surely aren't going to maudl your insides with that shocking stuff, are you? I thought you was getting a lemonade, Caradice. He glared at the champagne Lord Caradice had ordered, and removed the glass from Prudence's hand. I sent some of my special rhubarb tonic to Lady Ostwither. I'll go and roust up one of those fellows to fetch some for you now. Tonic for the blood, you know, rhubarb. He hurried off. Prudence turned to Gideon. Her brow furrowed, and her mouth pursed in the most delightful way. Gideon longed to kiss her. He cast a quick furtive glance around the room. What is it? Prudence said anxiously, just checking to see if anyone would notice if I kissed you now. She took a step backward. Don't you dare do such a thing. You said you'd stop teasing me. We agreed to be friends. He gave her an injured look. I was thinking of a very friendly kiss. You know what I mean. She made a praiseworthy, if unsuccessful, attempt to keep her mouth on a severe line. Gideon shrugged and tried to look guilty. Habits aren't so easy to change, Miss Imp. He studied her, a smile playing round his lips. She was three parts fierce, one part adorably flustered, and the whole of her completely irresistible, and that dimple peeping out just when she was trying to look most straight-laced and puritanical. He took a small step forward, closing the gap between them. She held her ground and lifted her reticule, not high, Nothing to draw any vulgar attention to them, just a small reminder to him of what she would do if necessary. Little Miss Imp, ready to do battle with the big bad rake. He sighed mournfully. You have no sense of adventure, do you, Miss Imp? Don't call me that. And don't you dare do anything improper. Now, what did Great Uncle Oswald mean about your great aunt being packed off to Wales? Gideon shrugged. I have no idea. I have never packed a great-aunt off anywhere, and if I tried, I'd come a cropper. 
a lady of backbone and fortitude, my great-aunt Estelle. Terrifying female. Nobody could pack her off anywhere. Somebody tried once, I believe. Poor fellow was never heard of again. But great-uncle Oswald said, Excellent things, eyebrows. One waggles them in a mysterious fashion, and people jump to all sorts of conclusions. I've no idea what your esteemed relative thinks about my imaginary aunt, and care even less. The point is, he dropped the subject. Yes, thank goodness. Do you think ladies' eyebrows can communicate as well? She asked. No, they don't have sufficient thicketry, he said with authority. Thicketry? Yes, that is the official term. Now, while dear Sir Oswald is fetching you some disgust, uh, delightful tonic, I don't suppose you'd care to enlighten me as to why I needed a recently expired Welsh relative in the first place. Not that I'm ungrateful, you understand. A thoughtful, if unusual, gift. Nor do I wish to exhibit vulgar curiosity. But if I'm to be acquiring dead relatives at the drop of a hat, oh, pray stop. There is no need to rub it in. I know it was wrong of me, and I meant to tell you earlier, but was distracted. Distracted, eh? His smile was rather smug, she considered. By your friend in the inadequate scarlet dress, she corrected him. The thing is, Great Uncle Oswald was going to put a notice of our betrothal in the morning post. Your being in mourning was all I could think of at the time to prevent him. I'm sorry. Gideon looked at her in admiration. No, you did very right. So I'm in mourning, eh? Yes, but you don't have to go into black, because I said your great-aunt had an aversion to black and the trappings of mourning, so her will instructed everyone to wear colours, and to go to dances, and so on. I'm particularly relieved about the so on, Gideon assured her. What a wonderfully resourceful girl you are, Prudence blushed. I suppose you think I'm a dreadful liar, but not at all exclaimed Gideon. I thought I recently reassured you on that point. Resourcefulness is to be admired. Prudence bit her lip. But you have grossly compromised my character, Miss Imprudence, and now you'll have to make it up to me. Make it up to you? In what way, pray? Prudence asked, darkly suspicious of his sudden injured saint expression. Compromised your character? I don't think such a thing would be possible. Gideon took her hand in his. Not possible to compromise my character, he exclaimed, deeply shocked. How can you ask such a thing? First you paint me as a pudding-hearted suitor with a sad want of dash, which is appalling, for I am particularly known for my aversion to pudding and my eloquence in dash. Next you break my tailor's heart by consigning his billet doux to the fire, and then you kill off my relatives willy-nilly and refuse to allow me to go into mourning. They were bills, not billet doux, Prudence objected. To a tailor, declared Gideon in an austere manner. It is the same thing. Now, allow me to escort you into supper, and over crab patties, partridge pulse, and lemon tartlets, I shall give due consideration to the matter of compensation owed for the blackening of my good name. Prudence looked mulish. I thought you said we were to be friends, he reminded her. Yes, but your view of how friends behave and mine seem to be chalk and cheese. And you must educate me on the matter immediately, before I disgrace myself by lapsing into bad habits again. And while you offer me knowledge on the etiquette of friendship, I shall offer you crab patties, which are food for angels. Not cheese. Plebeian stuff cheese. Quite unworthy of you. He tucked her hand back into the crook of his arm, and proceeded to steer her gently but firmly toward the supper-room, explaining, You shall nourish my mind while I feed your body. How did he do that? Prudence wondered as he swept her into supper. He'd not only overcome her scruples about going into supper with him, he'd made her laugh, and he'd also managed to make the innocent consumption of crab patties sound like some sort of seductive rite and she had no doubt he could make it so. She resolved to stick to bread and butter, and perhaps just one lemon tartlet. Chapter 10 Thus I am not able to exist either with you or without you. 
and I seem not to know my own wishes. Ovid It was barely a week since Charity had attended her first society function, and already she was a success, thought Prudence proudly. Now, attending her first ball, her sister was a picture of grace and beauty, seeming to float effortlessly through the complicated figures of the dance. Only Prudence knew the significance of the faint frown marring the marble smoothness of Charity's brow. At least the tip of her sister's tongue wasn't visible, as it was wont to be when Charity was concentrating hardest. For the days leading up to the ball, all five sisters had run the dancing master ragged, practicing and practicing until they knew all the steps by heart. It would be mortally embarrassing if Charity or Prue made a misstep or forgot the movements of the dance. They were determined not to look like the ignorant country misses they were. They had even practiced the wicked waltz, though neither of them expected to perform it yet. The dancing master might well have saved his shoe leather, thought Prudence with a wry smile. The Meridue girls might have performed their part in the dances with sufficient grace and skill to pass muster, but Prudence had danced several dances with veritable clodhoppers, and now the flounce on her new ball dress was torn so badly that she needed to pin it up. Charity seemed to gain confidence with every step. Prudence smiled, watching. Who would have thought that after spending a childhood where to sing or dance was to court a whipping from Grandpapa, her sisters would prove to have so much natural grace? She appeared perfectly at home in a ballroom, as if, like the other girls here, she had been preparing for it all her life. The dance drew to an end, and Charity's partner led her from the floor. Several gentlemen came forward offering her sister refreshments. Charity seemed unfazed by the attention. Observing her sister shyly responding to masculine gallantry, Prudence felt as though she would burst with pride. Her younger sister was a picture of beauty, confidence, and grace. It was a personal triumph over Grandpapa and all his meanness. Her sister was like a rose, who, having spent most of her life in a harsh and bitter environment, emerged into sunlight unfurling her delicate petals, untainted by the vicissitudes of the past. Prudence prayed that all her sisters would be as unscathed. She was watching Charity so closely, she knew to the minute when the Duke of Dinstable walked into the room. Their eyes must have met, for in an instant her sister changed from a shy young girl at her first ever ball to a glowing creature who seemed lit from within. Prudence blinked. She had never seen her sister thus. Charity was radiant. She glanced from Charity to the Duke and back again. It was amazing. Hope was right, after all. The Duke gazed at Charity in much the same way as she was looking at him as if entranced. There might well have been nobody else in the room, for all the two of them noticed. Was that how it was, love at first sight? It had been that way with her mother and father. One look and he'd known, Papa used to say. Mama would laugh and say it took at least three good hard looks at Papa before she decided he was the one. And Papa would laugh and kiss Mama and call her his beautiful slow top, Slow top indeed, Mama would retort in playful indignation. She was simply being discerning, and she would give him a look, and Papa would look back, and after a moment they would laugh and kiss again. Prudence sighed. Even though she'd been a child, she had never forgotten those intense magical looks, the look of two people in love. Now her beautiful younger sister and a shy, neat duke were exchanging just such searing magical looks. A lump formed in Prudence's throat. It was exactly what she had dreamed of for her sisters, the love that Mama and Papa had known, the love that only Prudence could remember, the love that Prudence had once dreamed of for herself. She watched the Duke bow over her sister's hand, and the breathtaking smile her sister gave him, and prayed that their magic, at least, was real and enduring. Prudence took a long swallow of rat of fear. She'd feared so much that her anxiety to see them safe might influence Charity into agreeing to the first possible man who offered for her. But if appearances were to be believed, and the Duke did offer for her, there would be no sacrifice. The Duke seemed a very decent man. What little she knew of him. 
quiet, a little shy, yet with unmistakable dignity and the assurance of rank. He was looking at her gentle sister with the kind of tenderness that made Prudence feel like weeping, and her sister was looking right back at him. For that look in her sister's eyes, Prudence would tell a hundred more lies. The Duke was surely not a rake like his cousin. In fact, that newspaper report about him she'd read had suggested he'd come to London in search of a wife. Prudence closed her eyes and said a little prayer. When she opened them, he was leading Charity toward the terrace, escorting her as if she were some sort of fragile bloom in need of care and protection. No, the Duke was not a rake like his cousin, Lord Caradice, thank goodness. He was totally sincere. So why did she feel so suddenly bereft? Recalling the torn flounce Prudence made for the lady's withdrawing room, she drew a packet of pins from the new netting reticule that Grace had made her and began to repair the damage. Torn your flounce, Miss Meridue. Do you want me to pin it for you? It was Mrs. Crowther, the woman she had met at the Ost with a soiree. Without waiting for Prudence to respond, Mrs. Crowther bent down and took the pins from Prudence's hand. She was wearing red again tonight, a brilliant, low-cut silk gown that pulled around her as she knelt. Prudence had little choice. She thanked Mrs. Crowther and stood quietly, while the older woman pinned the flounce with quick, efficient movements. That should hold it. Mrs. Crowther rose from the pool of crimson silk. Her dress moulded around her sinuous figure like a flame. Prudence, in her gown of creamy satin with dainty green and white snowdrops embroidered around the hem, felt like a gawky schoolgirl by contrast. Thank you. She put on her evening gloves again and made to leave. Not so fast, my innocent. Mrs. Crowther placed a long-fingered hand on Prudence's arm. I beg your pardon? Prudence raised an eyebrow, hoping she looked haughty. She did not like Mrs. Crowther or her tone. She tried to move, but found Mrs. Crowther was holding her fast. They were not alone in the room, and Prudence did not want to make a scene. A quiet word of warning, from one woman to another. Not knowing quite what to say, Prudence merely arched her eyebrows again. I think the situation calls for a little more privacy. Mrs. Crowther led Prudence into the adjoining sitting room, currently empty. What situation? asked Prudence, feeling annoyed with herself for allowing this woman to waylay her. But in truth, she did not know how to avoid it without being impolite. The situation with Lord Caradice. You have been seen with him on several occasions. I do not see that it is any business. Lord Caradice and I are friends. Intimate friends, you might say. Mrs. Crowther purred, sliding her hands voluptuously over the silken folds of her gown. Prudence stiffened. If she'd had the courage to make a small scene in the withdrawing room earlier, she would not be having to deal with this distasteful conversation. So I thought it only fair to warn you, my dear young lady. Men are such careless beasts. Of course, he is only amusing himself with you, but... How do you know he is only amusing himself? He may not be, interrupted Prudence, suddenly furious. She knew Lord Caradice was only amusing himself, but she was not going to allow this flame-wrapped harpy to say so. Or if so, it may not be me who is his little amusement. She allowed that to sink in, and then added pointedly, You are married. Are you not? Mrs. Crowther laughed, a brittle yap of scorn. Don't tell me you think he is serious in his attentions to you. He couldn't possibly be, my dear. Her tone was woman of the world to simple schoolgirl, and while Prudence privately agreed with the sentiments, Mrs. Crowther's sophisticated dismissal flicked Prudence on the raw. She raised her eyebrows and said in a calm, interested voice, Why not? Mrs. Crowther smiled and preened herself. If you had any knowledge of dearest Gideon at all, my dear child, any truly intimate knowledge of his history, you wouldn't have to ask that. The woman oozed smugness. Prudence couldn't bear it. She said in her silkiest tone, Perhaps you have misread the situation, Mrs. Crowther. 
as if bored by the conversation, Prudence frowned critically at her gloves, held them out, and smoothed them back to her elbows. Mrs. Crowther watched with narrowed eyes. Prudence fussed with her gloves until she thought the other woman would burst with impatience, and then added, Are you sure these gloves are not crooked? There is something in their fit. I don't quite... The gloves are irrelevant, snapped Mrs. Crowther. Prudence gave her a thoughtful look, then shook her head. Oh, I don't agree. An elegant pair of gloves quite sets off a ball gown, or ruins the effect. Now, what were we discussing? Oh, yes. Have you considered that dearest Gideon, as you call him, could be an old family friend? She adjusted the gloves again and added casually, I don't suppose it occurred to you that our mothers might have been bosom friends as girls, and if that were the case, would there be any surprise in him keeping a friendly eye on my sisters and me, for their sake? It was not precisely a lie, Prudence told herself, more a statement of possibilities. It wiped the smile off Mrs. Crowther's face. You knew his mother. So you must know about what happened. The old scandal. Prudence had no idea what the woman was referring to, but decided not to compound her deception any further. She raised a disdainful eyebrow. Even without masculine thickatry, eyebrows were useful things, she decided. People read so much into them. Mrs. Crowther frowned and said half to herself, it would explain why Dinstable is squiring your sisters around, too, for if your mother had known Lady Caradice, she would have known the Duchess also. So you must know about that business, she straightened and added briskly. In which case, you must also know that Gideon will never marry, and why? And since he has never shown any interest in, she glanced at Prudence disparagingly, debutantes, you would be foolish indeed to nourish any expectations. Expectations? Of Lord Caradice? Prudence laughed incredulously as she opened the door. Good heavens! What an odd notion! Set your mind at rest, Mrs. Crowther. I have no expectations concerning Lord Caradice at all. It was the truth, after all. She sailed from the room. Miss Meridew! Lord Caradice stood in the hallway. She wondered how much he had overheard. Sir Oswald and your sister have been wondering where you were, he said stiffly. You must be more careful of the company you keep at such affairs, Miss Meridew. Mrs. Crowther, will you excuse us? He bowed. Mrs. Crowther let out a peal of laughter. Oh, it is too, too amusing. Rake Caradice, playing the role of duenna. I vow, nobody would believe me if I told them. I see you spoke the truth, Miss Meridew. Your mothers would be proud. To Prudence's intense irritation, she trailed long white fingers familiarly along Lord Caradice's arm as she passed him, and he did nothing to prevent her. What the devil was all that about? Why are you talking to that woman? Lord Caradice took her arm as if he owned it and drew her father along the hall and into a small private room. He shut the door firmly behind them. Prudence glared at him. He seemed to know where every small private room in the building was. He was such a rake. And yet he had the audacity to criticize her behavior. Holding his gaze in a silent challenge, she began to strip off her long white satin gloves. Let him reprimand her, if he dared. She loosened the tip of each finger with a small angry tug, one by one. His eyes were fixed on hers, but she could tell by the slight flaring of his nostrils that he was aware of each movement, disapproving, no doubt. The combination of his intent observation and his silence inflamed her temper further. She drew each long, elegant glove down her arm, bearing the skin in a long, slow sweep, then tucked the gloves through the loop in her reticule. She was ready to do battle. What business of yours is it who I decide to talk to? You are not, despite what Mrs. Crowther said, my duenna. Gideon felt his temper flare. He'd been unaccountably worried about Prudence's absence, fretting lest one of the rakes who'd attended the ball had lured her aside and was taking advantage of her. He'd gone in search of her, on the terrace, in the garden, and through numerous small rooms and hidden alcoves, his anxiety mounting all the time. 
and then he'd found her with Teresa Crowther, and the sight of his former mistress in conversation with Prudence had caused a reaction in him he didn't quite care to examine, and it was not helped by the damned seductive way she'd removed her gloves. He felt defensive, yet aroused. It was not a felicitous combination. The duenna taunt had cut. Still, he found himself saying, She is not fit company for you. He sounded ridiculously prissy. His frustration increased a notch. Not fit company? Then why did you introduce us the other night? He had no answer to that. It was an error of judgment. I thought she was a friend of yours. An intimate friend, she said. Gideon gritted his teeth. Yes. No. Not any more. Hang it all, Prudence. I didn't come here to argue with you. You're an innocent. Just take it from me that Mrs. Crowther and her like are not fit companions for... Where are you going? Eyes snapping with temper, Prudence tried to storm past him. He blocked her exit with his body. She pushed at his chest crossly. I'm leaving. Since Mrs. Crowther and her friends are not suitable company for me, what does that make you, Lord Caradice, as her intimate friend, even less suitable, and so, she shoved at him with small determined fists, I'm leaving, or trying to. Gideon stared down at her, taken aback by her words. She was right. He'd known instant discomfort the other night, when she'd met, even briefly, with the set of people he called his friends. Only, they weren't really friends at all, merely companions in boredom and vice. She railed at him. I don't need protecting. I'm not at all the innocent you imagine me, and you have no right to decide who I may or may not talk to. Gideon rolled his eyes. Compared with that crowd, any decent woman is an innocent. His words inflamed Prudence's ire. How dare he compare her with his glamorous mistress, and then call Prudence a decent woman? He might as well call her dull and drab, in her girlish gown with the demure snowdrops. She wished she had a scarlet silk gown. Then she would show him. On second thought she didn't. Scarlet would clash horribly with her hair, and no doubt on her that tissue-thin silk would cling in all the wrong places. Life was so unfair. But she would show him anyway. Without hesitation, she reached up, pulled his head down to her level, and kissed him soundly on the mouth. It was a clumsy kiss, and in her haste she'd landed a little off-center. So she did it again, remembering how he had kissed her the last time. This time, she found her target dead on. She kissed him open-mouthed, and felt the familiar delicious shivers pass through her as he responded. She thought of scarlet dresses, and kissed him in the most wanton way she could imagine. Remembering what he had done with his tongue, she reached inside his mouth and stroked deeply and rhythmically. He tasted of wine and heat and Gideon. Their tongues tangled. He moaned deep in his throat and tried to take control of the kiss, but she wouldn't let him. She held his head in her hands and kissed him again, as if her life depended on it. His arms lifted, dropped, and then wrapped around her drawing her body up against his long, lean strength. One of his hands stroked up and down the line of her spine and came to rest on the curve of her bottom. He pressed her to him, and she felt his hard, aroused body straining against her. Her palms framed his jaw. She pushed herself tight against him, loving the friction of his hardness against her softness, kissing him with everything she had in her. When her knees started to wobble beneath her, she realized that she was about to reach the point of no return. She hung on to her self-possession with all the resolution at her command, broke the kiss, and pushed herself out of his embrace. They stood facing each other, breathing fast as if they'd been in a race. The laughing devils had gone from his eyes, and he stared at her in a stunned fashion that Prudence found deeply satisfying. She'd expected to be shaken by the kiss. She always was after kissing Lord Caradice. But this time, she was not the only shaken one. He looked positively stupefied. She felt a spurt of deeply feminine triumph. Ha! Perhaps she was not so dull and dreary after all. He reached for her, and she stepped back, smoothing her dress with her hands that were not quite steady. No. No more. It was simply meant to demonstrate that I am not the innocent you seem to think me. 
the dazed look disappeared, and a narrow look took its place as Lord Caradice retorted. If you think that so-called demonstration convinced me that you are in any way fit to be part of Theresa Crowther's circle, you are mistaken. Those kisses prove nothing, nothing except your innocence. Oh, you are impossible, she stamped her foot in frustration. She knew she'd botched the first kiss, but the second and third ones had nearly knocked her on end. She'd put everything she knew into them, and he still thought her a know-nothing miss in need of protection. He smiled wolfishly, seeming to read her thoughts, and prowled closer. There is no need to look chagrined. I found your kisses more than delightful, but if you truly wish to increase your experience, you are very welcome to practice on me. We are betrothed, after all. She skipped out of his way, and once there were a few feet of space between them, faced him with hands on hips. It is a sham betrothal, if you recall, and an excellent thing too, for a blind beggar could see we two should not suit, the way we quarrel. The smile lines deepened, and he took a few steps toward her. I would not necessarily call it quarrelling, and even if you do, quarrelling is not necessarily a sign of incompatibility. It can be a sign of passion. Prudence sniffed and moved even farther away. My parents never exchanged a cross word, and neither do Philip and I. He raised a sardonic brow. From what I can gather, you don't exchange words with otter boots at all. Must be terribly dull for you. But then he seems a dull sort of fellow. And you say he can't even muster a decent quarrel. He was right, Prudence realized suddenly. She could not even imagine having such an exhilarating exchange of temper with Philip. And her argument with Lord Caradice did feel very... passionate. And as for that kiss she'd initiated, her confidence drained. She would never have jumped on Philip like that. Whatever had made her behave in such a manner? Her wretched temper? How could she let him provoke her so easily? He had this way of getting under her skin. He didn't even try to breach her defences. He simply slipped under them and turned them to his own advantage. It was... it was unacceptable. She would never have allowed it with any other man. The only time Philip had breached her defences, he'd used his masculine strength. Lord Caradice never used physical force. It was something more insidious, inciting her animal instincts. She was having doubts, thought Gideon, watching her intently, about Otterbury, he hoped, rather than about himself. But if they were about himself, there was only one way of dissolving them that he could think of. Kiss them away. He moved subtly closer, and before she had time to avoid him, he held her in his arms again and kissed her thoroughly. She gave one indignant squeak. He could feel her trying not to soften against him. She was losing the battle. He kissed her just long enough for her to realize it. See, he said softly as he released her. If this is a quarrel, you have to admit it's a lot of fun. I will admit nothing of the sort she said loftily, trying to not let him see how rattled she was. Nor will I discuss Philip with you. And as you so kindly pointed out, I shall in future be more careful of the company I keep. She gave him a waspish little smile. She was not referring to Mrs. Crowther and her ilk. She pulled on her gloves, like gauntlets. Now, I must return to my sister. And before he could react, she sailed out of the room like a cross little hawk with adorably ruffled feathers. Gideon did not rejoin the party for some time. He sat down and considered what had just happened. In one sense, it was a scenario he was more than familiar with. A few stolen kisses, a few illicit caresses in a secluded room during a party or ball. On the other hand, Lord, who could believe that a man of his experience could be knocked all on end by a couple of clumsy heartfelt kisses, delivered in anger, or so she claimed. One had even almost missed his mouth. But he had been utterly bowled over by them, because those sweet, clumsy kisses had brought with them a revelation that had shocked him to his back teeth. He didn't want it to be a false betrothal. He really wanted prudence, as his lover, but not as his mistress. There was only one solution he could see to that conundrum. After some time he stood and left the room. He wandered through the crowded ballroom like a man in a daze. 
he was reeling. His whole life plan had been turned upside down. He left the ball and walked out into the dark streets. Eventually he found himself staring at the knocker on his cousin's door and realized he had no memory of walking home. He would have been easy meat for mohawks and footpads. What did that matter, when the fundamental premise of his whole life had been suddenly overturned? He broached the matter in oblique fashion to his cousin the next evening. Found any likely prospects yet, Edward? The Duke started. He'd been in a brown study, staring off into middle distance. Likely prospects? Gideon looked at his cousin. In your search for a suitable bride? He frowned. Suitable being the operative word. It must be damn difficult. I mean, our parents charted their courses to marriage in all innocence, and look how that ended up. Edward smiled ruefully. I know, but now I've decided we have no choice except to do what they did, marry and take a chance. Gideon sat up. What? You don't mean... Yes, Gideon. I found my suitable bride. Edward looked a little sheepish. Excellent. He topped up his cousin's glass. Who's the girl? Anyone I know? Edward hesitated. If you don't mind, I won't mention her name until I've addressed the question to her and received an answer. Gideon frowned. You needn't fear I'll blab it about town. Damn it, cuz. You know me better than that. Oh, of course. I know I'd trust you with my life. It's not that. It's just... Tempting fate, I suppose you'd call it. Oh, well. If you're steeped in superstition, Edward, that's your affair. It's not as if you're likely to be turned down, but tell me. Do I know her? His cousin considered the question. Yes. You've met her several times. And she's everything you said you wanted. Plain, quiet, dull, uh, docile. Not the sort to stir up unpleasant emotions. That's not exactly how I'd describe her. But she is the bride for me. Excellent. So she's nice and plain. Edward's mouth quirked. You were not struck by her beauty, at any rate. Definitely plain, Gideon decided, for he was quite a connoisseur of feminine beauty. It was natural that Edward would not wish to dwell on the girl's lack of looks. He was going to marry her after all. Gideon swelled the port in his glass, eyeing the candle flame through the ruby liquid, and cast his mind over the many plain girls he recalled from this year's crop of debutantes. There were too many to recall any particular plain Jane who'd been singled out by his quiet cousin. In fact, it was an especially dull batch, he decided. There was only one beauty who sprang to mind, Miss Prudence Meridue. And Edward had not paid her any particular attention, he was sure. What are your plans for the morrow, Edward? Going to speak to the girl's father? No, I have an engagement to escort the Mrs. Meridue to Astley's Amphitheatre in the afternoon, and I'm promised a fanshawe for dinner. Gideon looked up. Astley's amphitheatre. Whatever you're going there for? The Duke shrugged. It came up in conversation last week, and the young ladies expressed great interest in it. They haven't seen many of the city's delights as yet, and Miss Faith and Miss Hope in particular were very eager to observe the lady equestriennes, so I offered to escort them. Is, uh... Miss Prudence, going to be one of the party, Gideon said in a casual tone. I think so. Certainly she seemed as eager as her sisters when informed of the prospect by Miss Charity. Gideon picked up an ornament and toyed with it. Sounds like rather a lot for you to handle, Edward. One lone gentleman escorting so many young and excitable females. Would you like a hand with them, by any chance? His cousin smiled. Why, Gideon? How very kind of you to offer. But there's no need to worry about me. I can manage. They're not all that excitable, you know. No, no, dear boy. You stick to your own plans. Oh, there's nothing that cannot be put off, Gideon said decisively. I wouldn't dream of leaving you to cope with a gaggle of young girls all alone. I'll come. The Duke observed him in silence a moment, and then said in a voice that had the tiniest quaver in it, I'm touched by your thoughtfulness, cousin. Such noble self-sacrifice. Gideon's eyes dropped ruefully before the gentle irony in his cousin's. 
He sat down his class and dragged his hands through his hair in exasperation. Hang it all, Edward. I haven't the faintest notion of what to do. I'm in desperate straits here. You've no idea. Oh, I think I do understand, said the Duke gently. You're not alone in those straits, you know. Gideon looked up, startled. You mean your plain and sensible choice? Is not the slightest bit plain. In fact, she's a diamond of the first water, probably the most beautiful girl in the ton, Edward told him glumly. And the worst thing is, I'm head over heels in love with her. It is exactly what I feared would happen, and there is absolutely nothing I can do about it. Good God! Gideon reached for the decanter and refilled both their glasses. I know, and we both swore never to let it happen. How did it happen, Gideon? How? After all these years, and all this careful avoidance, did it happen? Because one minute, I was sailing along perfectly happily, my nice safe course chartered, and the next minute, I was knocked all the beam and in well over my head. Gideon shook his head gloomily. Yes, that's it exactly. Drowning in her eyes, and happy to do so. After one look, one glance, and despite all my plans. Gideon sighed. That's all it took with me, too. One look. Oh, I fought it for a time, but now. Besotted. Edward sighed. I shall seek an appointment with her great uncle the day after tomorrow. Gideon sat for a moment pondering their confessions, and slowly his cousin's words filtered through to his brain. A beauty with a great uncle. He exploded suddenly from his chair. Speak to her great uncle, you said. Damn it, Edward. You can't be in love with Prudence too, blast you, because if you are... Edward waved his anxieties aside. No, no. Calm yourself, cousin. It's not Prudence. It's almost worse than that. It's charity. Gideon sank back in his chair. The relief was overwhelming. It was a few moments before the appalling significance of Edward's words struck him. Charity? You cannot mean it. Not... her sister? Edward nodded. Yes, the gossips will have a field day, history repeating itself all over again. We shan't have a moment's peace once word gets out. He heaved a gloomy sigh. You know how I hate a fuss. Chapter 11 Let us not love in words or speech, but in deed and in truth. John Chapter 3 Verse 18 That, Hope announced as the carriage pulled up in front of Great Uncle Oswald's house, was the most exciting thing I have ever seen. The music, the spectacle, the lady riders, and the way that man rode on the horse's back standing upright. How I would like to try that. And he wasn't even holding onto the reins, her twin agreed. He was quite handsome too, in a barbaric sort of way, didn't you think? The carriage door opened. Gideon stepped out and proceeded to hand down the ladies. The twins alighted first, followed immediately by Prudence. She accepted his hand but refused to meet his eyes. Gideon suspected she couldn't. He had an idea that his little hawk was flustered beyond anything by her forwardness in kissing him at the ball. If he was any judge of feminine behaviour, she was mortified as much by her obvious response to him as with her out-of-character actions. And so she was pretending it hadn't happened. Ever since the kiss, she had treated him with reserve and a great deal of formality. She was, in fact, thought Gideon, with an inner chuckle, doing her very best to pretend that they'd never even met. But if she thought severe formality would force him to keep his distance, she was in for disappointment. She was adorable as a formidable little dowager. If she treated him with much more of her disdain, he'd have to kiss her again. Gideon held her hand a moment or two longer than strictly necessary, and she stood there waiting for him to release her, refusing to look at him. Finally, she lifted her gaze and glared up at him, tugging her hand in vain. He lifted her gloved hand to his lips, turned it over, peeled back her glove, and kissed the naked flesh revealed, all the while quizzing her wickedly with his eyes. A fiery blush lit her cheeks, and she snatched her hand back and stepped briskly away from him. 
A moment later, a maidservant darted up the side steps onto the wet pavement and thrust a piece of paper into her hand. Gideon turned to help the next girl down, but his cousin was there before him. Miss Charity, Edward murmured reverently. Charity laid a gloved hand in Edward's and stepped down. Did you enjoy the show? The Duke inquired gravely, still holding on to her hand, even though she had alighted safely. Gideon smiled to himself. The flags of the pavement were slightly uneven, after all. Charity's face glowed with pleasure. I thought the horses were the cleverest, knowing exactly what to do without anyone telling them. If anyone had told me that horses could perform a dance with perfect timing and execution, well, I wouldn't have believed them. To think I have seen an equestrian ballet. Thank you, Your Grace, for taking us. It has been a truly wonderful experience. She smiled, and suddenly Gideon could see her resemblance to Prudence. It was obvious to him now why his cousin thought Charity a diamond of the first water. Her smile was the same as Prudence's. The pleasure was all mine, the Duke declared, flushing. Gideon observed his cousin compassionately, seeing the glazed look, the distinctly cod-like helplessness and devotion. Yes, they were both well and truly hooked. Gideon turned to assist Grace, but she had scrambled down unaided. She hooked her arm through his in a friendly manner. I like the battle scenes best, all that smoke and the cannons and the soldiers so brave and smart in their uniforms, she declared. But Gideon's attention was suddenly caught as he realized Prudence had frozen stock still. She was as pale as the crumpled piece of paper clutched in her hand. As he watched, she swayed slightly, as if suddenly faint. Gideon sprang forward and wrapped his arm around her waist. What is it, Prue? Bad news? Are you ill? It spoke volumes for Prudence's state of mind that she did not seem to notice his intimate hold, let alone his use of her name. She held up the paper, and in a somber voice said to her sisters, It's from Mrs. Burton. It was as if a small flock of happy chicks had suddenly spotted a snake above them, he thought. The carefree excitement of a moment before was extinguished by a sudden tense silence. The twins moved closer, their hands linked in unconscious solidarity, their eyes fixed on Prudence. Grace turned as white as her sister. Prudence stepped away from Gideon and gathered the little girl to her protectively. Charity stood biting her lip, then suddenly stepped away from the Duke and went to stand on the other side of Grace, so that Prudence and the child were enclosed. Gideon exchanged glances with Edward and with one accord they stepped closer to the huddle of girls, in time to hear Prudence explaining. Mrs. Burton doesn't know how he found out. She thinks the new boot boy let something slip, but when she wrote this, she checked the letter again. The day before yesterday, he'd ordered the coach to be made ready for a long trip. He's coming to London to look for us. She sent this note with one of the stable boys, who rode on the mail. He cannot be far behind. The girls looked wildly around as if he, whoever he was, might be anywhere. Prudence swallowed, and continued in a calm voice. It is all right. We shall be safe, I promise you. You will have to flee, won't we, Prue? Charity said quietly. Prudence hesitated, then nodded. I can see no other alternative. Won't Great Uncle Oswald help us? Grace asked. Prudence looked troubled. He would try. I'm sure, darling, but he is entirely dependent on Grandpapa financially, and he has been so kind to us, I don't think we should ask him to risk his very livelihood. And he is not so strong or as vicious as Grandpapa, Hope stated bluntly. Grandpapa would just knock him down and start on us. He might not even believe us, added Faith. Nobody ever did before, not until Dr. Gibson saw Grace with his own eyes. Besides... Charity added practically. Great Uncle Oswald is away for the day, and Grandpapa could arrive at any minute. What is going on, Prudence? Gideon scanned her face worriedly. She looked so frightened, damn it. They all did. He wanted to snatch her back in his embrace, but she was surrounded by sisters. He clenched his fists. What the devil was happening? And why did they seem to think that flight was their only alternative? He glanced at Edward, who returned his look with a worried shrug. We have to leave. Now.
Prudence said in a flat voice. Thanks to Mrs. Burton, we are forewarned, and by the time Grandpapa comes, we shall be gone. What do you mean? Gideon tried to catch Prudence's eye, but her eyes were only for her sisters. Like a little mother hen, she swept them all up the front steps and into the entry hall. Quick, girls, upstairs, and pack a portmanteau as fast as you can. Pack for me, too, if you can. Hope, will you fetch down my special box, please? I will make other arrangements, and I'll leave a note for Great Uncle Oswald explaining everything. Now hurry, hurry. If he catches us, all will be lost. Before Gideon or the Duke could say a word, Charity, Hope, and Faith raced up the stairs and disappeared. Grace, my love, all will be well if you just hurry, Prudence urged. Grace's arms folded defensively, hunched into herself. Oh, Prue, what if? The little girl looked to Gideon's eyes, suddenly a great deal smaller and younger, pale and pinched and defenseless. He found his fists clenching harder. Prudence gathered the child into her arms and hugged her tightly. He shan't find us, Graciela. I promise you, I will... I will kill him myself before I let him take us back. I will soon be one and twenty, and he cannot touch us then. Now run along and pack. We will leave as soon as I can find a carriage to take us out of London. She gave her little sister a gentle push toward the stairs, and Grace hurried off. Gideon grabbed Prudence and swung her around to face him. What the devil is the matter? I gather your grandfather is coming to town, but why do you fear him so? Prudence shrugged him off. I'm sorry. I don't have time to explain. We must get away from here. I have to get some money, and find a carriage, and write a letter. But I want to know why. She flung off his hand, clearly distracted. We have to get away. Please, just leave. I thank you for your concern, Lord Caradice, and your kindness too, Your Grace, but we must. Hang my concern. I'm not going anywhere, snapped Gideon. Do you imagine for one minute that I could leave you in such obvious distress? Whatever it is, I am at your service. Now what do you need me to do? Prudence could hardly believe her ears. She stared up at Lord Caradice, a long, painful moment. Do... do, do you mean it? She stammered. You, you will help us? His face softened, and he gently smoothed back a lock of hair from her face. Foolish imp. You don't imagine I could see you so obviously facing trouble and just stroll out of here, do you? Prudence shrugged. Not since she was eleven had anyone seemed to care about her distress, and certainly nobody had simply offered to help. She bit her lip and stared at him dumbly, her eyelids prickling. Come, my love, don't cry now. Plenty of time for that later, if you want. I'm with you all the way. In whatever you want. His smile was a touch rueful. Will I help you? Try to stop me. I too wish to offer my assistance, added the Duke. Prudence's face crumpled, but she managed to master herself. She fiercely blinked back tears, forcing herself to become businesslike. Thank you. I would be extremely grateful if you could find us a carriage. We need to get away from here on the instant, and Great Uncle Oswald has taken his to visit friends in Richmond. What sort of carriage? asked Gideon. Prudence looked at him blankly. Where are you planning to go? She shook her head. I don't know. I hadn't thought that far ahead. Out of London. It depends. It depended on how much money she had. She'd meant to sell some of her mother's jewellery before this, but she'd put the moment off hoping it would not be necessary after all, and now see where her procrastination had got her. Gideon glanced at the Duke. What about your mother's old travelling carriage? It's a bit antiquated, but it's solid enough and should fit five young ladies in their possessions, and if you order my phaeton, that should cover all eventualities. An excellent notion, agreed the Duke. I shall nip home immediately and see to it. Oh, and Edward, tell your man and mine to throw a few things into a valise for us, and a roll or two of soft. It doesn't hurt to be prepared. Good idea. The Duke hurried out the door. Gideon turned back to Prudence, explaining. You see, Edward customarily drives a curricle, and the Landau is too. He broke off. She looked quite distracted, 
frowning with fierce concentration, completely unaware of his presence. Her hair had fallen out of its customary knot, and loose tendrils were spiralling outward. The half-dozen freckles across the bridge of her nose stood out against her pallor, like breadcrumbs scattered over snow. She looked small, and worried, and bedraggled, and beautiful, and the forlorn expression in her eyes squeezed his heart in his chest. It's all right. Tell me what needs to be done, he said in a bracing tone. I am yours to command. We need to be gone from this place as soon as possible. While the girls pack and your cousin finds us a carriage, I'll write the letter for Great Uncle Oswald, and you can... She frowned. Actually, there's nothing you can do at the moment, unless you want to help with the packing. He sighed. I'm not much use at packing feminine apparel, unless you don't mind it all crushed, but I will fetch and carry bags. He added with a glimmer of wry humour. I was hoping for a little more scope with my chivalrous instincts. Porter was not exactly the role I had in mind. Are you sure you don't need any dragons slain? He said it as a joke, but her face dimmed, as if a shadow had passed across her eyes. He couldn't bear it. In two quick paces he had her wrapped in his arms. She clung to him briefly with ragged vehemence, then stepped back, as if to isolate herself from him. Gideon stroked her cheek lightly with the back of one finger. Tell me about the dragon, Prue, he said softly. Your grandfather. Why has he got you all in a pother? I didn't think you were afraid of anything. She shook her head, not meeting his eyes, saying nothing. Grace seems terrified, he said. I always thought her a little Viking, afraid of nothing. She didn't want to tell him, he could see. She was determined to deal with it on her own. Gideon was just as determined to find out what caused a happy flock of garrulous girls to become pinched and fearful and silent. What makes a child like Grace so frightened? He persisted softly. What would make my courageous little Miss Imprudence flee in such anxiety? The backs of his fingers caressed her skin with tender insistence. Prudence shivered. She closed her eyes, a brief, almost defeated look. Then she swallowed and said simply, Grandpapa is very harsh. He beats us all, Hope said from the doorway. Violently, often, and for no good reason. He beats Faith just for singing, and me if I use my left hand. But he thrashes Prudence and lately he has started on Grace in the same way. I hate him. Prue, here's the box, and Faith wants to know if we can take our new cashmere shawls. There was a moment of silence in the room. The very matter-of-fact way in which Hope had referred to the beatings chilled Gideon's blood. He thrashes Prudence. For a moment he could not think. Prudence stirred, pulled away from Gideon's touch, became almost brisk again as she took a battered wooden box from Hope. Thank you. Yes, take the shawls if you want. They are warm as well as fine, and you might need them in the carriage, but take only what you can fit in one portmanteau. We cannot carry any more. Now hurry! Hope ran off. Prudence sat down at the writing desk, picked up the pen, and began to write. She didn't look at Lord Caradice, but she could see him from the corner of her eye. He was very still. Hope's words had shocked him, she could tell. But she didn't have time to reassure him, and besides, there was nothing to say. What's done is done, and no use repining. It was now that counted, not the unhappy past. And right now, she had to get this letter written to Great Uncle Oswald. Poor Great Uncle Oswald. This morning he'd left a house full of girlish laughter. He would return to find it empty. He would read the tale of their lies and deception, and then he would have to face an enraged elder brother. It was poor thanks for the kindness and generosity he had shown them. Prudence vowed to make it up to him one day. She continued to write. Behind her, and slightly to the left, Lord Caradice stood as if frozen. He remained still and silent for several long moments. Then she felt him moving toward her, felt his hands enclose her shoulders, and gently turn her to face him. He thrashes you. His voice was deep and soft, but it contained a note she had never heard in him before. She'd thought him only capable of pleasant nonsense and laughter. She was wrong. 
Why does he thrash you? He asked again, in that soft, implacable voice. And why has nobody stopped him? His anger was a little frightening, to tell the truth. Frightening, and yet comforting at the same time. Because although she didn't understand such silent, cold rage, and had never experienced such a thing, she knew it was entirely on her behalf. She'd never experienced that either. A rage that protected instead of attacked. She had no idea how to deal with the feelings his response had engendered. Had no idea how to respond. She could not look him in the eyes. She shrugged awkwardly and tried to bend over her letter. It is nothing, just some stupid prejudice he has about my hair. She mumbled. What about it? He thinks the colour is a sign of the devil in me. A sign that I am wanton and wicked and evil. She stared blindly at the letter she was writing. There was some truth in Grandpapa's accusations. He had cause for his condemnation of her. Oh, not about her hair, but about other things. She heard the quick, shocked intake of his breath and felt his palm curl around her nape, tenderly, possessively, comfortingly. His long, strong fingers slipped through her tumbled curls, loosening the final remnants of the knot, stroking and caressing as he murmured. Your hair is beautiful, Prudence. It's glorious. Like a sunset over an autumn forest. Like tendrils of molten copper, fresh from the forge. I've never seen more beautiful hair in my life. The writing in front of Prudence shimmered and blurred. Of course, he was only saying it to comfort her, but still. He must admire it a little at least, else how would he think of such beautiful things to say? Tendrils of molten copper, fresh from the forge. A sunset over an autumn forest. She treasured up his words in a small secret corner of her heart. He pressed a warm kiss on the nape of her neck, and she shivered with fleeting pleasure, awash with weakness in the wake of his tenderness. Oh, where was the flippant rake when you needed him? She could resist him, just. But this Lord Caradice, with poetry and tenderness on his lips and protective rage in his heart. She couldn't bring herself to look at him. She didn't know why she felt so ashamed that he knew part of her shabby little secret, but that was how she felt. She wanted nobody to know how viciously her grandfather beat her. She felt besmirched. She knew she should not. That Grandpapa had no moral right to continue beating her, and yet... And yet, she was not an innocent, not like Grace and her sisters. Four and a half years before, Prudence had, by her own actions, broken rules she knew Grandpapa had held sacred. Her actions had pushed him over the edge from habitual harshness to extreme and deliberate cruelty. Her physical punishment was, in some peculiar way, an expiation. That was what had made her most ashamed of all as if there was some sort of vile complicity between them. But then he'd started on Grace, and that she could not bear. That was when she'd started to fight back. Lord Caradice moved around to stand beside her, and waited for her to look up at him. Prudence bent over the letter, trying to disguise the fact that her eyes were full of unshed tears. Prudence, my Prudence, he said softly. She closed her eyes a moment, forcing the tears back. He lowered himself, slowly, with fluid deliberation, until he was kneeling before her. He took her hands in both of his, warm, strong, filling her with his strength. His face was on a level with hers. She could tell by the faint stirring of his breath against her skin. She took a deep, shaky breath and opened her eyes, and found herself drowning in his dark, fathomless gaze. There was no lurking twinkle, no glimmer of mockery. No one shall ever again harm so much as a hair on your head, my prudence, nor that of your sisters, not while there is breath in my body to prevent it. It was a vow. Prudence felt like a medieval queen, with the knight of her heart declaring himself her vassal. She stared into the liquid heat of his gaze, and saw there a refuge, and a haven, and love. 
and the tears finally spilled from her eyes, for she was not entitled to his refuge or his love. She belonged to Philip, was bound to him by a promise she had made in the churchyard, and by a later promise even more sacred. His ring rested hard and heavy against her breast, reminding her of the weight of her oaths even now. Oh dear, look what you've made me do, she wailed, searching in vain for a handkerchief and dashing tears from her cheeks with embarrassment. I almost never cry, and have no time to do so now, in any case. I need to be strong for my sister's sake, as well as my own. He pulled out a pristine white handkerchief and gently mopped up her tears while she tried to scrub them away with her hands. I know, he said quietly, and you are strong. But I don't care who you think you are betrothed to. At this moment you are mine to protect, and for the rest of my life, if you wish it. She shook her head distressfully, and he tipped up her chin and smiled ruefully. Don't fret, love. I haven't forgotten otter shanks. I don't mean to press you at this inopportune time. Just know that you are no longer alone in this, or any other difficulty. And he lifted her hand and kissed it with the same formality, almost with reverence, renewing and reaffirming his vow. Prudence snuffled into his handkerchief, unbearably moved. Now, he stood up and said in a very different voice, You mustn't disdain the protection of a frippery shag bag and a medium sized duke with tendency to stoutness. We can be formidable fellows when we try, you know. He rubbed her back lightly and added in a soft voice, Dry your eyes, Miss Imprudence. We have letters to finish, bags to pack, dragons to rout. Prudence gave him a tremulous smile. Having a friend who was young, and strong and independent of Grandpapa's influence and willing to stand up for her was a new experience. I gather Sir Oswald does not know the situation. Prudence shook her head and explained a little shamefacedly. No. We deceived him when we came here. I... I forged a letter in Grandpapa's hand. Great Uncle Oswald welcomed us with open arms and showed us more kindness than my sisters have ever seen in their lives since Mamma and Papa died, that is. She stopped a moment, unable to speak for the lump in her throat. Grandpapa is our legal guardian, at least until I come of age, which is the week after next. Once I turn one and twenty by my father's will, I am entitled to become my sister's guardian. She did not mention the need to support them as well. Then why not ask for Sir Oswald's support until then? I could not ask it of him. My sisters are right. Grandpapa would not hesitate to lay violent hands on Great Uncle Oswald. He nearly killed a groom once, for some mistake with a horse. But, and though Grandpapa is the elder brother, he is stronger and fitter, for he hunts regularly. Great Uncle Oswald lives a sedentary existence. I would not allow him to harm your uncle. She smiled mistily and shook her head. Thank you, but... That is not all. As a younger son, Great Uncle Oswald is entirely dependent on Grandpapa's goodwill for his income, you see. I could not bear it if you were thrust into poverty as a result of trying to help us. Lord Caradice did not look convinced, so she continued. Great Uncle Oswald probably would defy Grandpapa, but with no income of his own, he could not support us, and though I shall have money from the sale of some jewels, I couldn't possibly support Great Uncle Oswald in the style he currently enjoys. He is rather extravagant, you know. She shook her head decisively. No. Far better that we simply take ourselves out of Grandpapa's reach until I turn one and twenty. And if Charity and... She broke off. Edward had not yet asked Charity to wed him. It could still come to naught. Your cousin said he would help us. A duke is quite powerful in some ways, is he not? Yes, said Lord Caradice, and so are the cousins of dukes. That brought a glimmer of a smile to her lips. Gideon continued. So, we are to embark on a journey, and what is our destination to be? I haven't thought that far ahead, she admitted. I just want to get away before he gets here. Oh, and I will need to sell some jewellery. I will not have sufficient. You need not sell your trinkets, 
he began. I shall advance a sum. I'm sorry, but I could not possibly accept money from you. Prudence interrupted him firmly. She added in a softer voice, Your help is most welcome, Lord Caradice, and I will gladly borrow your cousin's carriage, but you know it would be most unseemly for me to borrow money from you. Bah! Propriety be hanged! I have jewellery set aside for just this purpose, Prudence insisted, and I would appreciate it if you would assist me in the selling of it, for I must confess I do not know where to start. She looked at him, her eyes troubled. It's not that I don't appreciate, Gideon scowled, then sighed and smiled at her ruefully. I know, and you are quite right. I'm sorry. I should not pinch at you for your scruples. I shall help you sell your baubles, though it goes against the grain. Finish your letter, my dear, and don't give it another thought. I think I can hear my cousin's voice in the hall, which will mean your carriage awaits you. He left the room to check arrangements with his cousin. It didn't take long for Prudence to finish the letter to Great Uncle Oswald. She left it propped up on the mantel in the drawing room, sealed with wax, his name on the front. She hurried upstairs to see to the packing of her things, but there was nothing left for her to do. Her maidservant Lily had done it all for her. The bedchamber had been swept clean of her possessions. The portmanteaus were packed and strapped onto the Duke of Dinstable's somewhat antiquated but undeniably large travelling coach also in the street, being walked up and down by Lord Caradice's groom, was a dashing phaeton drawn by two magnificent greys. "'Miss Meridew and I have a small commission to perform in the city,' announced Lord Caradice. "'We shall travel in the phaeton and catch up with the rest of you.' "'I hope there's room for me, Miss Prue,' declared a loud voice behind them. Lily stood in the hallway clutching a bundle to her chest. I'd rather be skinned alive with a blunt knife and me innards eaten by rats than left behind to face old Lord Derham. It's all right. We wouldn't do that to you, Prudence assured her. Of course you shall come with us. Lily glanced from the carriage with the crest on the panel to the dashing phaeton and hesitated. Which carriage are you riding in, miss? Lord Caradice said softly, Lily, it would be best if you travelled in the main coach with the Duke, Miss Prudence and I are using the Phaeton. Prudence opened her mouth to suggest that she needed Lily as chaperone, but he caught her attention and gave her a significant look that encompassed the battered old box. She subsided. He was right. She didn't want a witness to the shame of having to sell her mother's jewellery. It was bad enough he knew what straits she was reduced to, but Lily, good soul that she was, would gossip. And besides, she told herself, it would be an hour or so in an open carriage, with a groom in attendance. No chaperone was necessary. Lily's face fell. But don't you and Miss Prudence need me here, my lord? We do, of course, but I think my cousin the Duke would be sincerely grateful for your assistance. One mere man with so many young ladies. He's relying on you, Lily. He smiled winningly. Ah, well, if the Duke needs me said Lily with the air of one accustomed to the helplessness of dukes. She handed her bundle to a groom and took her place in the carriage, swelling visibly with pride as the duke helped her to mount the steps. James, their loyal footman, stood in the evening shadows, watching the whole proceedings, doing his best to look nonchalant. Prudence saw the longing in his eyes and realised he was too proud to ask to come with them. James, we wouldn't dream of leaving you behind, she said softly. Please come with us, if you want to, that is. Oh, thank you, miss. Of course I want to. James bowed with alacrity and raced up the servant's stairs to fetch his belongings. Is there a chimney sweep you'd like to invite too? Lord Caradice murmured, and Prudence turned defensively. But his gaze upon her was warm and lit with approval and understanding, so she explained. James has been one of our only friends. She looked up at him until now. There was a lump in her throat, making it difficult to speak. Back in Norfolk, many people knew of their situation, but had turned a blind eye, leaving five young girls at the mercy of a harsh and twisted man. She cleared her throat and continued. James risked his position many times in order to protect us, Grace in particular. We could not possibly leave him behind to face Grandpapa's wrath. No, of course not 
he said softly. Loyalty is your middle name, is it not, Miss Imp? James came clattering down the stairs with a bundle under his arm. He tossed it up to the roof and climbed up beside the coach driver. Good, thought Prudence. The Duke was a welcome escort, but he was not very athletic-looking, and charity was his priority. If James was with them, there would be a strong masculine arm for Grace and the twins as well. Her sisters peered out of the coach, looking a great deal less anxious now that the excitement of travel was upon them. The butler watched the whole thing with a dour expression. He tweaked Lord Caradice's sleeve and muttered something under his breath. Prudence raised her brows in inquiry. Lord Caradice explained, Niblet here is concerned that my cousin and I are kidnapping you and your sisters, not to mention half the staff. I hope you will reassure him. Of course nobody is being kidnapped, Niblet, Prudence assured him. We've been called away on an urgent family matter. I've left a letter for my great uncle in the drawing room. Please make certain he gets it on his return. I shall write again when we arrive at our destination. And where would that destination be, miss? inquired Niblet. Oh, it's all in the letter, she said vaguely. Even had she decided on a destination, she wouldn't tell Niblet. He was the sort of butler who loved gossip, and who would tell her grandfather everything at the drop of a guinea, or perhaps five. Oh, you can tell Niblet, my dear? Prudence tried frantically to catch his eye, but Lord Caradice seemed oblivious. My cousin and I have planned the journey in detail. We are going initially to my lodgings, for there is something I must drop off. Then we're off to my house, he added helpfully, to my house in Derbyshire, and thence north to my cousin's Dinstable seat in the far reaches of Scotland. Prudence groaned. Oh, Niblet won't betray us, my girl, Lord Caradice assured her. Will you, Niblet? He slipped a folded banknote in the butler's direction. Niblet bowed in majestic, creaky assent, and pocketed the banknote without a flicker of awareness. Prudence was aghast. I wish you had not done that, she said as he assisted her into the phaeton. Niblet is not to be trusted with any secret. The moment anyone offers him even the paltriest sum of money, he will tell all. I'm sure we can rely on Niblet to do exactly what we wish. Gideon took Prudence's hand in a firm, soothing grip. Trust me, Miss Imprudence. I am an excellent judge of character. Prudence looked unconvinced. Lord Caradice put on his driving gloves and picked up the ribbons of the phaeton. He nodded at his cousin, who signalled back, and the large coach rumbled away over the cobblestones, everybody waving madly. Lord Caradice signalled his groom, who released the horses' heads and leaped up behind as the phaeton moved off down Providence Court. Behind them, Niblet smirked as he closed the front door. Chapter 12 The very instant I saw you, did my heart fly to your service. William Shakespeare As the carriage wheels rattled over the cobbles, Prudence's hand stole to her breast, where Philip's betrothal ring hung hard and heavy against her heart. It ought to be Philip who was helping her now not Lord Caradice. And it ought to be Philip who dominated her dreams at night and her thoughts by day, not Lord Caradice. Gaslights illuminated his profile in momentary flashes as the phaeton twisted and turned through the maze of streets. She held herself rigid and apart from him, but could not prevent herself from bumping lightly against his shoulder and thigh each time the high-slung carriage swayed and rocked. She tried to ignore the unsettling sensations each moment of contact caused her, tried to keep her back ramrod straight, but it was difficult. What she really wanted was to cling to his arm and feel his strength supporting her. Once off the main thoroughfares, the streets were eerily quiet. Though they were by no means the only ones abroad at this hour, they were the only open carriage. She shivered, though the night was not at all chilly. She leaned back a little to get a clearer view of Lord Caradice's profile, and observed him obliquely, disturbed by the tenor of her thoughts. Over the past few weeks she'd done her level best to dismiss him from her mind and heart, telling herself sternly that he was frivolous and unreliable, and that she was foolish and faithless and wanton at heart, as Grandpapa said. She'd been warned by Lady Jersey and others that Lord Caradice had merely been entertaining himself with her until something better came up. 
Bored persons of the Tom did that, they'd explained. Take up a person for a time and make much of them, then drop them for no reason, cutting them dead the next time they met. It was the way of the sophisticated world. And yet tonight, she'd entrusted herself and her sister's safety to them without a moment's hesitation. A notorious rake, and his supposedly misanthropic cousin. And now she was alone in the darkness with the rake, and far from fearing for her reputation, she took great comfort from his presence and his words of reassurance. Who could have known the frivolous rake would turn out to be such a source of strength and comfort? It had been hard enough to withstand his blandishments before. Now it was going to be even harder. Is it far? she asked. He glanced at her sideways. The jewel broker, you mean? No, not far. In fact, just around the corner. His graze slowed and turned into a narrow street where the buildings were crowded together. It was the sort of neighbourhood where no gas lights burned. Were it not for Lord Caradice's carriage lights, the darkness would have been total, for none of the houses showed even a single light burning. Prudence clutched the battered box tight against her. I never imagined it would be possible to sell jewellery at this hour of the evening. Are you sure it can be done? He smiled and eased his horses to a walk in front of a tall, narrow building. I'm sure. I have done business with this fellow many a time. He will not mind being disturbed. Prudence nodded. The sharp edges of the box bit into her chest. It was foolish, she told herself firmly. She'd known for weeks, months, that she would need to sell her mother's jewellery, and yet now that the moment had arrived, she wanted to cling to it, to the last physical mementos of Mamma and Papa. Lord Caradice jumped nimbly down, secured his horses, and held up a hand to Prudence. She took a deep breath, and laid hers in his outstretched hand, but to her surprise, he shook his head, kissed her hand lightly, and returned it to her lap. It will be better if I see Sitch alone, he said. Just hand me the box, and I'll see to it. You need not spare me, she began. No, it isn't that. Sitch is a canny devil. If he sees there's a lady involved at this hour of the evening, he will surmise that the situation is urgent and use the knowledge to drive the price down. However, if I strolled in, apparently on my way to a gaming hell, and needing to convert a few assets into cash, well... He is used to such scenarios from clients. Lord Caradice held out his hand for the box. Prudence bit her lip. She opened the lid for the last time, took out the pile of handkerchiefs, and fiddled with a hidden catch. There is a false base, she explained. Despite the dark, she could almost see Lord Caradice's brows rise. It was necessary, she said defensively. Grandpapa searched our belongings. He took Mama's diamonds when I was eleven said Mamma was wicked and evil, and her baubles an abomination of Jezebel. She glanced at him briefly, fiddling in the dark with a hidden catch. Only she wasn't. She was good and kind and beautiful. And he was the evil one. She took a deep breath and continued. I made a stocking purse and hid it under my skirts, with the rest of Mamma's precious things in it. They belonged to my sisters and me, not him. But it was too difficult to carry them all the time. They are quite heavy, you know. So I got the stable boy to make a false bottom for this shabby old box. She darted him a faintly mischievous look. I kept it open, in full sight on my dressing table holding handkerchiefs, and Grandpapa never suspected a thing, though he was certain there must be more jewels hidden away. Mamma's papa was wealthy, though not well born, and Mamma took her jewels when she and Papa ran away. Aha! A runaway match. A love match, she corrected him. A very great love match. Mamma's papa didn't want her marrying into the dissolute aristocracy, and grandpapa didn't want his son to marry a sit, so they ran away to Italy. The catch finally shifted, and Prudence removed the false base of the box. She dipped her fingers into the small trove of family treasure. She knew each piece by heart. He was the sapphire necklace and earrings. Such an intense, vivid blue, the exact colour of Mamma's and Charity's eyes. She'd always imagined Charity wearing them for her wedding, as Mamma had at hers. And here was the heavy smoothness of the pearl choker that Mamma loved so much. She closed her eyes a moment, and remembered Papa fastening it around Mamma's long and elegant neck, 
for the class was always stiff and difficult. It was always an event of laughter and teasing, but each time Papa would kiss Mama on the nape after he had fastened it, a slow lingering caress, and the laughter would fade, and an odd exciting tension would fill the room. Prudence had not understood it as a child, but now suddenly, years later, sitting in a phaeton in a dark London street, she realised what the tension was that had hummed so tangibly between her parents. Desire. She glanced at Lord Caradice, standing silently watching her as their eyes caught, a sudden silence hummed between them. The moment stretched. His hand reached toward her, and she wanted more than anything to take it. Even as her hand lifted to reach out to him, one of the greys snorted and stamped restively, and the carriage jerked. Prudence grabbed the side to steady herself, and Lord Caradice went to the horse's head to assist his groom. It were a rat, my lord, a big un, she heard Boyle say. Ram right under his hooves, it did. Prudence shivered. She watched Lord Caradice murmuring soothing sounds to his horse, calming it with his hands while his groom calmed the other one. The moment was gone. Prudence knew she needed to ensure it never returned. She took one last long look at the contents of the box, blinking away the tears that stung her eyelids. Prudence and her sisters were her mother's true legacy. What were cold jewels and metal compared with the happiness of Mama's daughters? And memories. Her memories were in her head, not this dear shabby old box. There is nothing you want to keep. Her fingers lingered on the locket. It was broken, though the catch could be mended, no doubt. It was quite large and made of gold, so it would fetch a neat sum, but to her the most precious part of it was inside. She opened it. One last look at the faces painted inside, a silent renewal of her promise to Mama as she died that she would take care of her sisters. No, there is nothing she tried to say, but the words choked in her throat. She shook her head and, with shaking fingers, closed the locket and made to replace it in the box. They were not good likenesses anyway, she told herself. His hand stopped her, closed around her fingers in closing the locket. Keep it. His voice was oddly harsh. If you need to sell it later, you can. But for now, keep it. Her fingers tightened thankfully about the old gold trinket. She shut the lid of the box carefully and handed it to him. Make sure you get a good price, she whispered. Be damned to a good price, Gideon thought. Did she think he was the sort of man who would haggle over the price of a woman's bits and pieces? He almost snatched the box from her, so uncertain was his temper. It was unbearable to see her so vulnerable, yet so determined not to accept his help. He yanked on the doorbell, sending it jangling noisily in the nether reaches of the house. After a few moments, an upstairs window opened. Old Sitch peered out, a nightcap on his head. Who is it? He quavered. Caradice! Gideon barked. Grumbling under his breath, the old man disappeared, and a few minutes later, he unbolted the door. Tis an unusual hour for you to come calling on me, my lord. No trouble, I hope. Gideon thrust the box into the man's hand. Have these cleaned, reset, and restrung, whatever is needed to bring them up to scratch again. Cleaned and reset? Old Sitch stared at the collection of jewels, then scratched his head, bemused. You came at this hour to ask me to clean some jewels? And reset any that need it, yes, Gideon said brusquely. I'm leaving town this night, immediately, and need the job done by the time I return. You're never fleeing the country, my lord. Fleeing the country? Good God, no! Gideon stared, then realised he needed some sort of rational explanation. I, uh, was called away urgently, but recalled I'd promised to get these fixed. No time to delay, you know. They'll be needed pretty urgently when I return. Very good, my lord. I have them sparkling and perfect again for the little lady. Sid shuffled to the door and opened it. There is no little lady, Gideon said meaningfully. Sitch peered out into the street. 
Prudence sat bolt upright in the phaeton, looking anxious, fretful, and to Gideon's eye, wholly adorable. Quite right, my lord. Trick of the light. I never saw no little lady. Good man. Gideon took his leave. Prudence looked so relieved to see him, it took all of his self-restraint not to snatch her into his arms and kiss the jitters out of her. Instead, he climbed aboard the phaeton, concentrating on sang froid. Here you are, he said in a terse voice. I hope it is sufficient for your needs. He pulled a thick roll of notes from the pocket of his greatcoat and handed it to her. The thickness of the roll made Prudence's eyes widen. London prices must be much higher than elsewhere. You've done better than I expected. Thank you. He shrugged, a trifle embarrassed by her misplaced gratitude. Sitch has done business with me for years. I knew he would not let us down. Now, we best make speed to catch up with Edward and your sisters. He lifted the reins. Are you going to hold that money in your hand all the way, or do you have somewhere to put it? She started. Oh, yes, of course. She carefully peeled off half a dozen notes and placed them in the Egyptian reticule. Gideon waited with interest to see what she would do with the rest. Turn your back, please, she said briskly, looking a little self-conscious. Gideon quizzed her with a look, then shrugged. Boyle, turn your back, he called to his groom. Then he also turned his back, or as much of it as the seat of the phaeton would allow. There was not a lot of room for manoeuvring. A shame he was bred a gentleman. He was dying to know where she planned to hide the rest of the money. He felt her wriggling beside him. A sharp little elbow nudged him high on the shoulder. Sorry, she gasped. Stay where you are. I I'm not finished yet. From the angle of that elbow, her bodice was the fuller by several hundred pounds, he surmised. He chuckled to himself. He couldn't imagine how she thought her bosom would hide that much money. Her curves might be delightful, but they were not so full as to be able to disguise a thick wad of banknotes. Not yet, she hissed. He heard the slither of fabric and a surge of velvet cloak and muslin gown frothed across his lap. Gideon grinned. Unless he missed his guess, Miss Imprudence Meridew had just exposed her legs to a London street. A silent and empty street, to be sure, but a public thoroughfare just the same. He grinned. Calling your limbs, Miss Imp? he murmured. A gasp and a flurry of fabric being hastily tugged down was his reward. I asked you not to look. If you were a gentleman, rest easy, Miss Imp. I didn't cheat. Then how did... I turn my back as you asked, but I'm not deaf, and when this falls across my knees, he gestured to the folds of her dress and cloak, I put two and two together. Oh, she said. Well, it is true. I did pull my skirt up a little, but there is nobody here to see, and I keep my stocking purse under my petticoat for safety. Very sensible. Now may I turn around so we can resume our journey? She made a small sound, which he took for assent. So he turned back to face the front again. He whistled to his groom, and as the horses moved on, Gideon glanced at her and smiled. So how much is your bodice worth? I'm guessing... He glanced again. Fifty pounds? Prudence blinked, then clapped her hand to her bodice with a small shriek. You did watch, you... you rogue? She thumped him on the shoulder furiously, and he laughed, denying it. Not at all. You must equip me of everything except excellence in surmise. You bumped me with your elbow, and it was in such a position that I worked out the rest. She narrowed her eyes at him. Perhaps. But how could you possibly know there was fifty pounds in my bodice? He gave her a slow, knowing look, as if to say, Work it out, my dear. She blinked. He must have... To have noticed the change in the size of her bodice, he must have looked at her, intimately. Prudence blushed. He was indeed no gentleman. Exactly. He seemed to have read her thoughts. Any change in your bodice, and I would notice. That's... that's... you are quite outrageous. I know. The tone was apologetic, but Prudence wasn't fooled for a minute. I told you before of the trouble I have with my eyes, he continued. The poor things are anxious, you see, too anxious for their own good. 
She was silent for a minute, frowning, while she debated whether to maintain an aloof dignity or satisfy her curiosity. It was fully three blocks at a smart pace before curiosity won. What do you mean, anxious? Your eyes don't look anxious to me at all. As far as I can see, they are bold and perfectly wicked. He edged the greys to a walk while they negotiated a jumble of handcarts and barrows, nearing a market. Ah, but that is their tragedy. All that bold wickedness is just a brave front, you see. Underneath, they are sadly anxious, particularly about your bodice. He paused a moment, then added, I mean, what if something should fall out? It's very worrying, I can tell you. She gasped, casting him a darkling look. She drew her cloak together, and beneath its shelter folded her arms across her bosom. You are quite incorrigible. But Gideon could see the dimple lurking in the corner of her mouth, even as she glared down her masterful little nose at him. I should turn it off without a character, if I were you, he said in a conversational tone. It betrays you every time. There was a long pause as she turned the comment over in her mind. Turn what off without a character? What are you talking about? I don't think I could ever turn anyone off without a character reference. You really should, you know. It betrays you time and time again. She turned to him, puzzled, and not a little suspicious. What does? That dimple. She flounced her shoulder away from him and observed the road in silence for the next moment or two. See? There it goes again, he said softly. Every time you try to be cross and schoolmistressy and put me in my place, out it pops, betraying you. The dimple disappeared for a moment, then returned as she struggled for propriety. I find it adorable, he murmured, and put an arm around her to steady her as they turned a corner at a smart trot. Muffled in the voluminous folds of her cloak, she was unable to fend him off as he could see she would prefer to do. I would hate you to fall off, he murmured and tightened his hold. So undignified, not to mention dangerous. She made a half-hearted effort to wriggle away from him, then sighed and allowed herself to be held firmly against his side. A stern look gave him to understand she would tolerate no further encroachment, but after a few moments of stiff resistance, the warm curves of her body relaxed into him, swaying with the movement of the carriage in perfect synchronization with his. Gideon smiled to himself. It was the closest he'd got to her in ages. They turned onto the turnpike road, and Gideon set the greys to a steady clip, driving one-handed, unable to bring himself to release her. She would be cross with him again when she discovered he hadn't sold a thing. But he was damned if he'd let her sell her precious bits and pieces, only for some nonsensical notion of propriety. He'd had every intention of selling them for her, hadn't thought twice about it initially. What were jewels, after all, but hard pieces of metal and glittering stone? a decorative form of business transaction. Men and women traded jewels all the time in his experience. A diamond necklace for favours granted, sapphire ear bobs for an apology, an emerald bracelet as a silent farewell. A woman had always spouted stuff about symbols of love, but he'd always thought it a lot of nonsense, a polite lie to disguise basic avarice. Until now. He recalled the soft look in her eyes as she'd gazed into the box, the tender wistfulness with which she'd handled each piece, as if saying a silent farewell to it. The women he knew would have been most reluctant to give up the diamond and sapphire sets. They were clearly the most decorative and valuable pieces, yet the piece Prudence had handed over with most reluctance had been a scratched and worn old locket with two amateurish portraits inside. There had been tears in her eyes as she'd handed them over, he was sure of it, even in the dark. Something about the husky tone of her voice and the way she wouldn't look at him directly. Tears over a scratched old locket with two bad portraits. He hadn't been able to get a clear look at both pictures, but one of them was of a man's face. Her parents. Or was the man in the locket, Otterbury? If she hadn't been battling to hide her tears, he might have asked her about it. But now was not the moment. The lights of London soon dropped away behind them. They passed through several sleepy villages at a fast clip. The only light, that of the moon and the carriage lanterns. The sound of the horses' hooves rang in the night, 
disturbing a few dogs here and there, leaving them barking in the distance. To Prudence, it felt like they were the only people awake in the world. She had done little travelling as an adult, and found the pace of his lordship's phaeton a little alarming, to tell the truth, particularly on the turnpike road. It was very disconcerting to be driving pell-mell into the night, not knowing quite where they were headed, so she was very grateful for the occasional light of the moon when it came out from behind the clouds. The moon, recently risen, the heavy creamy globe shone from behind directly along the road they were travelling. Lord Caradice, we are driving away from the moon, Prudence exclaimed. So we are, she tugged at his sleeve. But the moon rises in the east. So it does, and very romantic it is too, don't you think? But Derbyshire is to the north. Correct again, Miss Merridew, Lord Caradice congratulated her. I can see you're a whiz at geography. Shall we play at geographical question and answer to while away the miles, then? I do so enjoy discussing geography, don't you? He tucked her hand into the crook of his arm and continued in a chatty tone. Did you know that there is a place called Goatfell in Scotland, for instance? One can only surmise that a noble goat gave its life for... Prudence snatched her hand back and said in exasperation, But you told Niblet we were going to your seat in Derbyshire. So why are we travelling west instead of north? Because if we want any supper, we must hurry along. Are you hungry? I must say I am. Oh, for heaven's sake, what are you talking about? You mean you're not hungry? Yes, of course I am, but... Well then, we'd better make haste. It doesn't do to keep a lady hungry. He urged the horses to even greater speed, and Prudence was forced to grip his sleeve again, this time for security. It really was a frightful pace, but she managed to say in a firm enough voice, Lord Caradice, I insist you explain why we are travelling west. He turned his head and his smile glinted wickedly in the moonlight. My cousin has sent a man ahead to bespeak rooms and a late supper for us all at the Blue Pelican in Maidenhead. Granted, it is not very far out of London, but you cannot wish to travel through the night like the mail does. Prudence relaxed a little, relieved to hear that her sisters and the Duke were also apparently heading for Maidenhead, though the choice of destination seemed a bizarre one. Whether or not we travel through the night is immaterial to me, as long as my sisters are safe, but that is not the point. Why Maidenhead? It is nowhere near Derbyshire. Neither it is, agreed Lord Caradice, apparently much struck by the notion. But you told Niblet we were going to Derbyshire, and you paid him handsomely not to tell. I did say you could trust my judgment of his character, but no, you wouldn't heed me. He attempted to look downcast by her lack of faith in him, but a tiny curl of his lips gave him away. Prudence's jaw dropped. You mean you bribed Niblet not to tell, but told him a lie, knowing he could not be trusted anyway? Lord Caradice looked affronted. Of course I trusted him. Trusted him to pass on the information instantly. How did you know he would not honour the bribe? Lord Caradice tapped the side of his nose and looked wise. Prudence wasn't fooled. You have tried to bribe him before. You have a very suspicious mind, Miss Imp. Lord Caradice looked as if butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. Prudence nodded, satisfied. I thought so. It is very wrong to bribe servants, you know. But in this case, you did the right thing. Let us hope Niblet will not suddenly turn over a new leaf. It would be most unfortunate if he decided not to tell. No chance of that, murmured Lord Caradice, adjusting the reins in his grip. I only gave him five guineas. Five guineas? Prudence exclaimed in horror. But that is far too much. She knew exactly how much five guineas would buy, and it seemed foolishly improvident to squander it on bribing a devious and untrustworthy butler. Nonsense. It is sufficient to make him realise the information was worth something, but believe me, Miss Imp, Niblet holds himself a great deal more expensive than five guineas. He will be insulted by the paltry nature of the sum, and will hasten to inform your grandfather of our supposed destination. And thus, if your grandfather pursues us, he will head directly for my seat in Derbyshire, and my people there will have received the message to send him on to Scotland. Alternatively, he may decide it is too far and give up. Prudence shivered. He will pursue us, she said in a low voice. There is no doubt of that. 
Lord Caradice frowned at her sober certainty and laid one hand over hers. He may pursue you, he assured her firmly, but he shall not find you. She gave him a look of the bleakest misgiving. In my experience, Grandpapa does not give up easily, and he is very good at intimidating others. Your people might be too in awe of him to deceive him. I doubt that, he began, and then, seeing that she could not be convinced of that, added, And if by some mischance he does find you, he shall not lay so much as a finger on you. That I promise you. You are safe with me, my imp, and so are your sisters. His voice was deep and sure and steady, and Prudence was comforted despite herself. She ought to have removed her hands from his grasp, but she could not bring herself to do so. It seemed as if strength and calmness flowed into her from him. She had an overwhelming impulse to lay her cheek against his shoulder, as if she could, just for a while, lay all her burdens on that broad, strong resting place, but she couldn't. It was just a momentary weakness on her part. He thought his assistance, his gallantry, and his wonderful generosity in helping her would make a difference, and it did, but only to her feelings. He thought it was only a matter of time before she broke her vow to Philip, but then Lord Caradice was used to ladies who thought nothing of breaking vows, even marriage vows. To prudence, such vows were sacred. And even if her feelings had changed, even if what she once felt for Philip was a pale shadow of what she feared she now felt for Lord Caradice, she could not betray Philip's years of loyalty. She and Philip were joined. Even if not in the eyes of society and the law, a ring had been given and accepted and promises made in the churchyard under the eyes of God. And the bond had been sealed by blood. If she was ever to come to Lord Caradice, and deep in her heart she acknowledged that she wanted to, she would come to him free and clear and wholeheartedly, not as an oath-breaker. Love was too precious to be tainted. She buried her hands in the folds of her cloak. She had managed on her own before. She would manage again. Even if Grandpapa did find them and use the law to get Prudence and her sisters once more under his control, she was determined to defy him. She would turn one and twenty soon. And if Charity and the Duke wed, and she hoped they would, perhaps the Duke would help her to force Grandpapa to sign over the money. Lord Caradice might try. But a duke, especially if he were a relation by law, would have more power, if the duke and charity married. In the meantime, Prudence could protect her sisters, surely. Assuming Grandpapa was not so enraged, he beat her insensible again. She swallowed. She must not dwell on her fears. Fears sapped your strength. If she stayed strong, Grandpapa could not get the better of her. That other time she had been ill, feeling lost and abandoned, and he'd caught her at her most vulnerable. She would not allow that again.